This is Audible. Infinite Jest. Written by David Foster Wallace. Two, and maybe also three. But combine the natural entrepreneurial instinct to satisfy all sufficiently high consumer demand, on the one hand, with what appears to be an almost equally natural distortion in the way persons tend to see themselves, and it becomes possible to account historically for the speed with which the whole high-def, videophonic mask thing spiraled totally out of control. Not only is it weirdly hard to evaluate what you yourself look like, like whether you're good-looking or not. For example, try looking in the mirror and determining where you stand in the attractiveness hierarchy with anything like the objective ease you can determine whether just about anyone else you know is good-looking or not. But it turned out that consumers' instinctively skewed self-perception plus vanity-related stress meant that they began preferring and then outright demanding video phone masks that were really quite a lot better looking than they themselves were in person. High-def mask entrepreneurs, ready and willing, to supply not just verisimilitude but aesthetic enhancement, stronger chins, smaller eye bags, airbrushed scars and wrinkles, soon pushed the original mimetic mask entrepreneurs right out of the market. In a gradually unsubtilizing progression, within a couple more sales quarters, most consumers were now using masks so undeniably better looking on video phones than their real faces were in person, transmitting to one another such horrendously skewed and enhanced masked images of themselves, that enormous psychosocial stress began to result. Large numbers of phone users suddenly reluctant to leave home and interface personally with people who, they feared, were now habituated to seeing their far better-looking masked selves on the phone and would, on seeing them in person, suffer, so went the caller's phobia, the same illusion-shattering aesthetic disappointment that, for example, certain women who always wear makeup give people the first time they ever see them without makeup. The social anxieties surrounding the phenomenon psych consultants termed optimistically misrepresentational masking, or OMM, intensified steadily as the tiny, crude, first-generation videophone camera's technology improved to where the aperture wasn't as narrow. And now... The higher-end tiny cameras could countenance and transmit more or less full-body images. Certain psychologically unscrupulous entrepreneurs began marketing full-body polybutylene and urethane 2D cutouts. Sort of like the headless muscle man and bathing beauty cutouts you could stand behind and position your chin on the cardboard neck stump of for cheap photos at the beach. Only these full-body video phone masks were vastly more high-tech and convincing-looking. Once you added variable 2D wardrobe, hair and eye color options, various aesthetic enlargements and reductions, etc., costs started to press the envelope of mass market affordability. Even though there was, at the same time, horrific social pressure to be able to afford the very best possible masked 2D body image to keep from feeling comparatively hideous looking on the phone. How long, then, could one expect it to have been before the relentless entrepreneurial drive toward an ever better mousetrap conceived of the transmittable tableau, also known as TT, which in retrospect was probably the really sharp business end of the videophonic coffin nail? With TTs, facial and bodily masking could now be dispensed with altogether and replaced with the video-transmitted image of what was essentially a heavily doctored still photograph, one of an incredibly fit and attractive and well-turned-out human being, someone who actually resembled you, the caller, only in such limited respects as, like, race and limb number. The photo's face focused attentively in the direction of the videophonic camera from amid the sumptuous but not ostentatious appointments of the sort of room that best reflected the image of yourself you wanted to transmit, etc. The tableaus were simply high-quality transmission-ready photographs, 
scaled down to diorama-like proportions, and fitted with a plastic holder over the video phone camera, not unlike a lens cap. Extremely good-looking but not terrifically successful entertainment celebrities, the same sort who in decades past would have swelled the cast lists of infomercials, found themselves in demand as models for various high-end video phone tableaus. Because they involved simple transmission-ready photography, instead of computer imaging and enhancement, the tableaus could be mass-produced and commensurately priced, and for a brief time they helped ease the tension between the high cost of enhanced body masking and the monstrous aesthetic pressures videophony exerted on callers, not to mention also providing employment for set designers, photographers, airbrushers, and infomercial-level celebrities hard-pressed by the declining fortunes of broadcast television advertising. 3. But there's some sort of revealing lesson here in the beyond short-term viability curve of advances in consumer technology. The career of videophony conforms neatly to this curve's classically annular shape. First, there's some sort of terrific sci-fi-like advance in consumer tech, like from oral to videophoning, which advance always, however, has certain unforeseen disadvantages for the consumer, And then, but the market niches created by those disadvantages, like people's stressfully vain repulsion at their own videophonic appearance, are ingeniously filled via sheer entrepreneurial verve. And yet, the very advantages of these ingenious disadvantage compensations seem all too often to undercut the original high-tech advance, resulting in consumer recidivism and curve closure and massive shirt loss for precipitant investors. In the present case, the stress and vanity compensation's own evolution saw video callers rejecting first their own faces and then even their own heavily masked and enhanced physical likenesses and finally covering the video cameras altogether and transmitting attractively stylized static tableaus to one another's TPs. And behind these lens cap dioramas and transmitted tableaus, Callers, of course, found that they were once again stresslessly invisible, unvainly make-up and toupee-less and baggy-eyed behind their celebrity dioramas, once again free, since once again unseen, to doodle, blemish-scan, manicure, crease-check, while on their screen the attractive, intensely attentive face of the well-appointed celebrity on the other end's tableau reassured them that they were the objects of a concentrated attention they themselves didn't have to exert. And of course, but these advantages were nothing other than the once lost and now appreciated advantages of good old Bell-era blind aural-only telephoning with its six and six to the second power pinholes. The only difference was that now these expensive, silly, unreal, stylized tableaus were being transmitted between TPs on high-priced video fiber lines. How much time, after this realization sank in and spread among consumers, mostly via phone, interestingly, would any micro-econometrist expect to need to pass before high-tech visual videophony was mostly abandoned? A return to good old telephoning not only dictated by common consumer sense but actually after a while culturally approved as a kind of chic integrity. Not Ludditeism, but a kind of retrograde transcendence of sci-fi-ish high-tech for its own sake, a transcendence of the vanity and the slavery to high-tech fashion that people view as so unattractive in one another. In other words, a return to aural-only telephony became, at the closed curve's end, a kind of status symbol of anti-vanity, such that only callers utterly lacking in self-awareness continue to use videophony and tableaus, to say nothing of masks, and these tacky, facsimile-using people became ironic cultural symbols of tacky, vain slavery to corporate PR and high-tech novelty, became the subsidized era's tacky equivalents of people with leisure suits, black velvet paintings, Sweater vests for their poodles, 
electric zirconium jewelry, no-coat lingua scrapers, and C. Most communications consumers put their tableaus, dioramas, at the back of a knick-knack shelf and covered their cameras with standard black lens caps, and now used their phone console's little mask hooks to hang these new little plasticine address and phone diaries, specially made with a little receptacle at the top of the binding for convenient hanging from former mask hooks. Even then, of course, the bulk of U.S. consumers remained verifiably reluctant to leave home and teleputer and to interface personally. Though this phenomenon's endurance can't be attributed to the telephony fad per se, and anyway, the new panagoraphobia served to open huge new entrepreneurial, teleputerized markets for home shopping and delivery, and didn't cause much industry concern. Four times per annum, in these chemically troubled times, the Organization of North American Nations Tennis Association's Juniors Division sends a young toxicologist with corn silk hair and a smooth, wide button of a nose and a blue ONANTA blazer to collect urine samples from any student at any accredited tennis academy ranked higher than number 64 continentally in his or her age division. Competitive junior tennis is meant to be good, clean fun. It's October, in the year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. An impressive percentage of the kids at ETA are in their division's top 64. On urine sample day, the juniors form two long lines that trail out of the locker rooms and up the stairs and then run Agnet and Coed across the ETA Comad Building lobby with its royal blue shag and hardwood paneling and great glass cases of trophies and plaques. It takes about an hour to get from the middle of the line to your sex's locker room stall area, where either the blonde young toxicologist or, on the girl's side, a nurse whose severe widow's peak tops her square face with a sort of bisected forehead, dispenses a plastic cup with a pale green lid and a strip of white medical tape with a name and a monthly ranking and 10, 15, YDAU and ETA, neatly printed in a six-point font. Probably about a fourth of the ranking players over, say, 15 at the Enfield Tennis Academy cannot pass a standard North American GCMS urine scan. 52. These, 17-year-old Michael Pemulus's nighttime customers, now become also, four times yearly, is daytime customers. Clean urine is ten adjusted dollars a cc. Get your urine here! Pamulus and Trevor Axford become quarterly urine vendors. They wear those papery oval caps ballpark vendors wear. They spend three months collecting and stashing the urine of sub-ten-year-old players, warm, pale, innocent, childish urine, that's produced in needly little streams, and the only GM scan it couldn't pass would be like an Ovaltine scan or something. Then, every third month, Pemulus and Axford work the agnet unsupervised line that snakes across the blue lobby shag, selling little visine bottles of urine out of an antique vendor's tub for ballpark wieners, snagged for a song from a Fenway Park wiener man fallen on hard off-season times. A big old box of dull, dimpled tin with a strap in socks colors that goes around the back of the neck and keeps the vendor's hands free to make change. Urine! Clinically sterile urine! Piping hot! Urine you'd be proud to take home and introduce to the folks! Trevor Axford handles cash flow. Pamulus dispenses little conical-tipped visine bottles of juvenile urine. Bottles easily rendered discreet in underarm, sock, or panty. You're in trouble? <laughs> You're in luck. Quarterly sales breakdowns indicate slightly more male customers than female customers for urine. Tomorrow morning, ETA custodial workers, Kenkel and Brandt, or Dave fall down very hard, 
the well-loved old janitor laid off from Boston College for contracting narcolepsy, or thick-ankled Irishwomen from the semi-tenements down the hill across Commonwealth Avenue, or else sullen and shifty-eyed residents from Ennett House, the halfway facility at the bottom of the hill's other side in the old VA hospital complex, hard-looking and generally sullen types who come and do nine months of menial work for the 32 hours a week their treatment contract requires, will empty scores of little empty plastic visine bottles from subdorm wastebaskets into the dumpster nest behind the ETA employee parking lot, from which dumpsters Pemulus will then get Mario in Condensa and some of the naiver of the original ephebic urine donators themselves to remove, sterilize, and rebox the bottles under the guise of a rousing game of who can find, boil, and box the most empty visine bottles in a three-hour period without any kind of authority figure knowing what you're up to, a game which Mario found thumpingly weird when Pemulus introduced it to him three years ago but which Mario's really come to look forward to, since he's found he has a real sort of mystical, intuitive knack for finding visine bottles and the sedimentary layers of packed dumpsters, and always seems to win hands down. And if you're poor old Mario in Condensa, you take your competitive strokes where you can find them. T. Axford then stashes and recycles the bottles, and packaging overhead is nil. He and Pemulus keep the Wiener tub stashed under a discarded Yarmouth sail in the back of the used tow truck they'd chipped in on with Hal and Jim Struck and another guy who's since graduated ETA and now plays for Pepperdine, and paid to have reconditioned and the rusty chain and hook that hung from the tow truck's back-tilted derrick replaced with a gleamingly new chain and thick hook, which get used really only twice a year, spring and late fall, for brief intervals of short-distance hauling during the all-weather lungs dismantling and direction, plus occasionally pulling a paralyzed rear-wheel drive student or employee vehicle either back onto or all the way up the ETA hillside's long 70-foot driveway during bad snowstorms. And the whole thing de-rusted and painted in ETA's proud red and gray school colors, with a complex O-N-A-N heraldic ensign, a snarling full-front eagle with a broom, and a can of disinfectant in one claw, and a maple leaf in the other, and wearing a sombrero, and appearing to have about half-eaten a swatch of star-studded cloth, rather ironically silkscreened under the driver's side door, and the good old pre-Tavis ETA traditional motto, Teo Cidere Possunt, Te Edere Non Possunt, Ne Fossust, unironically emblazoned on the passenger door, and which they all share use of, though Pemulus and Axford get slight priority, because the truck's registration and basic liability insurance get paid for out of quarterly urine revenues. Hal's older brother Mario, who, by dean of students' fiat, gets to bunk in a double with Hal in subdorm A on the third floor of ComAd, even though he's too physically challenged even to play low-level recreational tennis, but who's keenly interested in video and film cartridge production and pulls his weight as part of the ETA community, recording assigned sections of matches and drills and processional stroke filming sessions for later playback and analysis by Stitt and his staff, is filming the congregated line and social interactions and vending operation of the urine day lobby. Using his strap-attached head-mounted camera and thoracic police lock and foot treadle, apparently getting footage for one of the short, strange, himself-influenced, conceptual cartridges the administration lets him occupy his time making and futzing around with, down in the late founder's editing and FX facilities off the main sub ed tunnel. And Pemulus and Axford do not object to the filming, nor do they even do that hand-to-temple face-obscuring thing when he aims the head-mounted Bolex their way since they know nobody will end up seeing the footage except Mario himself, and that at their request he'll modulate and scramble the vendors and customers' faces into undulating systems of flesh-colored squares, by means of his late father's reconfiguring map panel in the editing room, since facial scrambling will heighten whatever weird conceptual effect Mario's usually after anyway, though also because Mario's notoriously fond of undulating flesh-colored squares and will jump at any opportunity 
to edit them in over people's faces. They do brisk business. Michael Pemulus, wiry, pointy-featured, phenomenally talented at net, but about two steps too slow to get up there effectively against high-level pace, so in compensation also a great offensive lobman, is a scholarship student from right nearby in Alston, Massachusetts. A grim section of tract housing and vacant lots, low-rise Greek and Irish housing projects, gravel and haphazard sewage, and indifferent municipal upkeep, a lot of depressed petrochemical light industry all along the spur, an outlying district zoned for sprawl. An old joke in Enfield Brighton goes, Kiss me where it smells, she said, so I took her to Alston, where he discovered a knack playing boys club tennis in cut-off shorts and no shirt, and a store-strung stick on scuzzy courts with black top that discolored your yellow balls, and Nets made a spare Feeney Park fencing that sent net cord shots spronging all the way out into traffic. An inner-city development program tennis prodigy at ten, recruited up the hill at eleven, with parents who wanted to know how much ETA'd pay up front for rights to all future possible income. Cavalier about practice, but a bundle of strangled nerves in tournaments, the rap on Pemulus is that he's way lower rank than he could be with a little hard work, since he's not only ETA's finest eschatonic marksman off the lob, but Stitt says is the one youth here now who knows truly what it is to punch the volley. 53. Pemulus, whose pre-ETA home life was apparently hackle-raising, also sells small-time drugs of distinguished potency at reasonable retail prices to a large pie slice of the total junior tournament circuit market. Mario Incondenza is one of those people who wouldn't see the point of trying recreational chemicals, even if he knew how to go about it. He just wouldn't get it. His smile, below the Bolex camera strapped to his large but sort of withered-looking head, is constant and broad as he films the line serpentine movement against glass shelves full of prizes. M. M. Pemulus, whose middle name is Matthew, has the highest Stanford Binet of any kid on academic probation ever at the Academy. Hal Incondenza's most valiant efforts barely get Pemulus through Mrs. I's triad of required grammars. 54. And Soma R.L.O. Chawaf's heady literature of discipline. Because Pemulus, who claims he sees every third word upside down, actually just has a born tech science weenie's congenital impatience with the referential murkiness and inelegance of verbal systems. His early tennis promise, quick peeking, and it's turned out to be a bit dilettantish. Pemulus's real enduring gift is for math and hard science, and his scholarship is the coveted James O. Incondenza Geometrical Optics Scholarship, of which there is only one, and which each term Pemulus manages to avoid losing by just one dentodermal layer of overall GPA, and which gives him sanctioned access to all the late director's lenses and equipment some of which turn out to be useful to unrelated enterprises. Mario's the only other person sharing the optic and editing labs off the main tunnel, and the two have the kind of transpersonal bond that shared interests and mutual advantage can inspire. If Mario's not helping Pemulus fabricate the products of independent optical study work, MP isn't really much into doing. You should see the boy with a convex lens. Avril likes to say within Mario's hearing, he's like a fish in brine. Then Pemulus is giving Mario, who's a film nut but no great tech mind, serious help with cinema optical praxis, the physics of focal length and reflective compounds. You should see Pemulus with an emulsion curve, yawning blasély under his bill-reversed yachting hat and scratching an armpit, juggling differentials like a boy born to wear a pocket protector and high-water corduroys, and electrician's tape on his horn rims temples, asking Mario if he knows what you call three Canadians copulating on a snowmobile. Mario and his brother Hal both consider Pemulus a good friend, though friendship at ETA is non-negotiable currency. Hal in Condenza for a long time identified himself 
as a lexical prodigy, who, though Avril had taken pains to let all three of her children know that her non-judgmental love and pride depended in no way on achievement or performance or potential talent, had made his mother proud, plus a really good tennis player. Helen Condenza is now being encouraged to identify himself as a late-blooming prodigy and possible genius at tennis, who is on the verge of making every authority figure in his world and beyond very proud indeed. He's never looked better on court or on monthly O-N-A-N-T-A paper. He is irrumpent. He has made what Stitt termed a leap of exponents at a post-pubescent age when radical, plateaus hopping near J. Wayne and show caliber improvement is extraordinarily rare in tennis. He gets his sterile urine gratis, though he could well afford to pay. Pamulus depends on him for verbal academic support and dislikes owing favors, even to friends. Hal is, at 17, as of 10 YDAU, judged ex cathedra the fourth best tennis player under age 18 in the United States of America and the sixth best on the continent by those athletic organizing bodies duly charged with the task of ranking. Hal's head, closely monitored by DeLint and staff, is judged still level and focused and unswollen slash bludgeoned by the sudden eclat and rise in general expectations. When asked how he's doing with it all, Hal says, fine, and thanks you for asking. If Hal fulfills this newly emergent level of promise and makes it all the way up to the show, Mario will be the only one of the Incondenza children not wildly successful as a professional athlete. No one who knows Mario could imagine that this fact would ever even occur to him. Oren, Mario, and Hal's late father was revered as a genius in his original profession without anybody ever realizing what he really turned out to be a genius at, even he himself, at least not while he was alive, which is perhaps bona fidely tragic, but also, as far as Mario is concerned, ultimately all right, if that's the way things unfolded. Certain people find people like Mario and Condenza irritating, or even think they're outright bats, dead inside in some essential way. Michael Pemulus' basic posture with people is that Mrs. Pemulus raised no dewy-eyed fools. He wears painter's caps on court and sometimes a yachting cap turned around 180 degrees. And, since he's not ranked high enough to get any free corporate clothing offers, plays in T-shirts with things like Alston H.S. Wolf Spiders and Choosy Mothers and The Fiends in Human Shape Y-D-A-U tour, or, like an ancient, can you believe it, the Supreme Court just desecrated our flag on them. His face is the sort of spiky-featured, brow-dominated, Fenian face you see all over Irish Alston and Brighton, its chin and nose sharp, and skin the natal brown color of the shell of a quality nut. Michael Pemulus is nobody's fool and he fears the dealer's Brutus, the potential eater of cheese, the rat, the wiretap, the pubescent-looking finest sent to make him look foolish. So when somebody calls his room's phone, even on video, and wants to buy some sort of substance, they have to right off the bat utter the words, Please commit a crime. And Michael Pemulus will reply, Gracious, me and mine, a crime, you say? and the customer has to insist right over the phone and say he'll pay Michael Pemulus money to commit a crime, or like that he'll harm Michael Pemulus in some way if he refuses to commit a crime. And Michael Pemulus will, in a clear and ideable voice, make an appointment to see the caller in person to plead for my honor and personal safety, so that if anybody eats cheese later, or the phone's frequency is covertly accessed somehow, Pemulus will have been entrapped. 55. Secreting a small visine bottle of urine in an armpit in line also brings it up to plausible temperature. At the entrance to the male stall area, the aphibic-looking O-N-A-N-T-A toxicologist rarely even looks up from his clipboard, 
But the square-faced nurse can be a problem over on the female side because every so often she'll want the stall door open during production. With Jim Struck handling published source plagiarism and compressed iteration and xerography, Pemulus also offers, at reasonable cost, a small Vedi Mikamish pamphlet detailing several methods for dealing with this contingency. Winter, B.S. 1960, Tucson, Arizona. Jim! Not that way, Jim. That's no way to treat a garage door, bending stiffly down at the waist and yanking at the handle so the door jerks up and out, jerky and hard, and you crack your shins and my ruined knees, son. Let's see you bend at the healthy knees. Let's see you hook a soft hand lightly over the handle, feeling its subtle grain, and pull just as exactly gently as will make it come to you. Experiment, Jim. See just how much force you need to start the door easy. Let it roll up, out open, on its hidden greasy rollers and pulleys in the ceiling set of spiderweb beams. Think of all garage doors as the well-oiled open outdoor of a broiler with hot meat in, heat roiling out hot. Needless and dangerous ever to yank, pull, shove, thrust. Your mother is a shover and a thruster, son. She treats bodies outside herself without respect or due care. She's never learned that treating things in the gentlest, most relaxed way is also treating them and your own body in the most efficient way. It's Marlon Brando's fault, Jim. Your mother back in California before you were born, before she became a devoted mother and long-suffering wife and breadwinner son, your mother had a bit part in a Marlon Brando movie. Her big moment. I had to stand there in saddle shoes and bobby socks and ponytail and put her hands over her ears as really loud motorbikes roared by. A major thespian moment, believe you me. <laughs> she was in love from afar with this fellow Marlon Brando, son. Who? Who? Jim. Marlon Brando was the archetypal new type actor who ruined... It looks like two whole generations' relations with their own bodies and everyday objects and bodies around them. No? Well, it was because of Brando you were opening that garage door like that, Jimbo. The disrespect gets learned and passed on, passed down. You'll know Brando when you watch him, and you'll have learned to fear him. Brando, Jim. Jesus. B-R-A-N-D-O. Brando, the new archetypal tough guy rebel and slob type, leaning back on his chair's rear legs, coming crooked through doorways, slouching against everything in sight, trying to dominate objects, showing no artful respect or care, yanking things toward him like a moody child, and using them up and tossing them crudely aside so they miss the wastebasket and just lie there, ill-used with the over-clumsy, impetuous movements and postures of a moody infant. Your mother is one of that new generation that moves against life's grain, across its warp and baffles. She may have loved Marlon Brando, Jim, but she didn't understand him. Is what's ruined her for everyday arts like broilers and garage doors and even low-level public park knock-around tennis. Ever see your mother with a broiler door? It's carnage, Jim. It's to cringe to see it. And the poor dumb thing thinks it's tribute to this slouching slob type she loved as he roared by. Jim. She never intuited the gentle and cunning economy behind this man's, quote, harsh, sloppy, unstudied approach to objects. The way he'd, oh, so clearly practiced a chair's back leg tilt over and over the way he studied objects with a welder's eye for those strongest centered seams, which, when pressured by the swinishest slouch, still support. She never, never sees that Marlon Brando felt himself as body so keenly he'd no need for manner. She never sees that in his, quote, careless way, he actually really touched whatever he touched as if it were part of him, of his own body. 
The world he only seemed to manhandle was, for him, sentient, feeling, and no one, and she never understood that. Sour, sodding grapes indeed. You can't envy someone who can be that way. Respect, maybe. Maybe wistful respect at the very outside. She never saw that Brando was playing the equivalent of high-level quality tennis across sound stages all over both coasts, Jim. Is what he was really doing. Jim, he moved like a careless fingerling, one big muscle, muscularly naive, but always notice, a fingerling at the center of a clear current. That kind of animal grace, the bastard wasted no motion, is what made it art, this brutish no care. His was a tennis player's dictum. Touch things with consideration, and they will be yours. You will own them. They will move or stay still, or move for you. They will lie back and part their legs and yield up their innermost seams to you. Teach you all their tricks. He knew what the beats know, and what the great tennis player knows, son. Learn to do nothing with your whole head and body, and everything will be done by what's around you. I know you don't understand, yet. I know that goggle-eyed stare. I know what it means all too well, son. It's no matter. <laughs> you will. Jim, I know what I know. I'm predicting it right here, young Sir Jim. You are going to be a great tennis player. I was near great. You will be truly great. You will be the real thing. I know I haven't taught you to play yet. I know this is your first time, Jim. Jesus, relax, I know. It doesn't affect my predictive sense. You will overshadow and obliterate me. Today, you are starting, and within a very few years, I know all too well you will be able to beat me out there, and on the day you first beat me, I may well weep. It'll be out of a sort of selfless pride, an obliterated father's terrible joy. I feel it, Jim, even here, standing on hot gravel and looking. In your eyes, I see the appreciation of angle, the prescience ray spin, the way you already adjust your over-large and apparently clumsy child's body in the chair so it's at the line of best force against dish, spoon, Lens-grinding appliance, a big book's stiff bend. You do it unconsciously. You have no idea, but I watch very closely. Don't ever think I don't, son. You will be poetry in motion, Jim, size and posture and all. Don't let the posture problem fool you about your true potential out there. Take it from me for a change. The trick will be transcending that overlarge head, son. Learning to move just the way you already sit still, living in your body. This is the communal garage, son. And this is our door in the garage. I know you know. I know you've looked at it before many times. Now, now see it, Jim. See it as body. The dull-colored handle, the clockwise latch, the bits of bug trapped when the paint was wet and now still protruding. The cracks from this merciless sunlight out here. Original color. Anyone's guess, boyo. The concave inlaid squares. How many? Beveled at how many levels at the borders that pass for decoration? Count the squares, maybe. Let's see you treat this door like a lady, son. Twisting the latch clockwise with one hand. That's right. And uh, I guess you'll have to pull harder, Jim. Maybe even harder than that. Now, uh, let me. Yep, that's the way she wants doing, Jim. Have a look. Jim, this is where we keep this 1956 Mercury Montclair you know so well. This Montclair weighs 3,900 pounds, give or take. It has eight cylinders and a canted windshield and aerodynamic fins, Jim. It has a maximum flat-out road speed of 95 mph per... I described the shade of the paint job of this Montclair to the dealer when I first saw it as, 
bit lip red. Jim, it's a machine. It will do what it's made for and do it perfectly, but only when stimulated by someone who's made it his business to know its tricks and seams as a body. The stimulator of this car must know the car, Jim. Feel it. Be inside much more than just the... the compartment. It's an object, Jim. A body. But don't let it fool you. Sitting here, mute. It will respond, if given its due, with artful care. It's a body, and will respond with a well-oiled purr, once I get some decent oil in her, and all... Mercury-ish add up to 95 big ones per for just that driver who treats its body like his own. Who feels the big steel body he's inside. Who quietly and unnoticed feels the nubbly plastic of the grip of the shift up next to the wheel when he shifts. Just as he feels the skin and flesh, the muscle and sinew and bone wrapped in gray spiderwebs of nerves in the blood-fed hand, just as he feels the plastic and metal and flange and teeth, the pistons and rubber and rods of the amber-fueled Montclair when he shifts, the bodily red of a well-bit lip parping along at a silky eighty-plus purr. Jim, a toast to our knowledge of bodies. To high-level tennis and the road of life. <sighs> Son, you're ten, and this is hard news for somebody ten, even if you're almost five eleven, a possible pituitary freak. Son, you're a body, son. That quick little scientific prodigy's mind she's so proud of and won't quit twittering about. Son, it's just neural spasms. Those thoughts in your mind are just the sound of your head revving. And head is still just body, Jim. Commit this to memory. Head is body. Jim, brace yourself against my shoulders here for this hard news at ten. You're a machine. A body. An object, Jim. No less than this... Ruddlant Montclair. This coil of hose here, or that rake there for the front yard's gravel. Or sweet Jesus, this nasty fat spider flexing in its web over there up next to the rake handle. See it? Uh, see it? Latrodectus mactans, Jim. Widow. Grab this racket and move gracefully and feelingly over there and kill that widow for me, young Sir Jim. Go on. Make it say K. Take no names. There's a lad. Here's to a spiderless section of communal garage. Ugh. Bodies, bodies everywhere. A tennis ball is the ultimate body, kid. We're coming to the crux of what I have to try to impart to you before we get out there and start actuating this fearsome potential of yours. Jim, a tennis ball is the ultimate body, perfectly round, even distribution of mass, but empty inside, utterly a vacuum, susceptible to whim, spin, to force, used well or poorly. It will reflect your own character, characterless itself, pure potential. Have a look at a ball. Get a ball from the cheap green plastic laundry basket of old used balls I keep there by the propane torches and use to practice the occasional serve, Jimbo. Atta boy. Now, look at the ball. Heft it. Feel the weight. Here, I'll, uh, tear the ball open. <sighs> See? Nothing in there but evacuated air that smells like... A kind of rubber hell. Empty. Pure potential. Notice I tore it open along the seam. It's a body. You'll learn to treat it with consideration, son. Some might say a kind of love, and it will open for you. Do your bidding, be it your beck and soft lover's call. 
The thing truly great players with hale bodies who overshadow all others have is a way with the ball that's called, and keep in mind the garage door and broiler, touch. Touch the ball. Now that's, that's the touch of a player right there. And as with the ball, so with that big, thin, slumped, over-tall body, Sir Jimbo, I'm predicting it right now. I see the way you'll apply the lessons of today to yourself as a physical body. No more carrying your head at the level of your chest under round, slumped shoulders. No more tripping up. No more overshot reaches, shattered plates, tilted lampshades, slumped shoulders, and caved-in chest. The simplest objects twisting and resistant in your big, thin hands, boy. <laughs> Imagine what it feels like to be this ball, Jim. Total physicality. No revving head. Complete presence. Absolute potential sitting there potentially absolute in your big, pale, slender, girlish hand, so young its thumbs unwrinkled at the joint. My thumb's wrinkled at the joint, Jim. Some might say gnarled. Have a look at this thumb right here. But I still treat it as my own. I give it its due. You want a drink of this, son? I think you're ready for a drink of this. No? Nine? Today, lesson one out there, you become, for better or worse, Jim, a man, a player. A body in commerce with bodies. A helmsman at your own vessel's tiller. A machine in the ghost, to quote a phrase. Uh. <coughs> a ten-year-old, freakishly tall, bow-tied and thick-bespeckled citizen of the... I drink this sometimes when I'm not actively working to help me accept the same painful things it's now time for me to tell you, son. Jim, are you ready? I'm telling you this now because you have to know what I'm about to tell you if you're going to be the more than near-great top-level tennis player I know you're going to be eventually very soon. Brace yourself. Son, get ready. It's gl gloriously painful. Have just maybe a taste here. This flask is silver. Treat it with due care. Feel its shape. The near soft feel of the warm silver and the calfskin sheath that covers only half its flat rounded silver length. An object that rewards a considered touch. Feel the slippery heat. That's the oil from my fingers. My oil, Jim. From my body. Not my hand, son. Feel the flask. Heft it. Get to know it. It's an object. A vessel. It's a two-pint flask full of amber liquid. Actually, more like half full, it seems. So it seems. This flask has been treated with due care. It's never been dropped or jostled or crammed. It's never had an errant drop. Not drop one spilled out of it. I treat it as if it can feel... I give it its due as a body. Unscrew the cap. Hold the calfskin sheath in your right hand and use your good left hand to feel the cap's shape and ease it around on the threads. Son, son, you'll have to put that, um, what is that, that Columbia Guide to Refractive Indices Second Edition down, son. Looks heavy anyway. A tendon strainer. Fuck up your pronator, Terry's and surrounding tendons before you even start. You're going to have to put down the book for once, young Sir Jimbo. You never try to handle two objects at the same time without just eons of diligent practice and care. A Brando-like dis... Uh, and, well, no, you, you don't just drop the book, son. You don't just... Just don't drop the big old guide to indices on the dusty garage floor so it raises a square bloom of dust and gets our nice white athletic socks all gray... Before we even hit the court, boy. Jesus, I took five minutes explaining how the key to being even a potential player is to treat the things with just exactly the... Here, let me have this. That books aren't just dropped 
with a crash like bottles in the trash can. They're placed, guided with senses on full, feeling the edges, the pressure on the little floor, both hands, fingers, as you bend at the knees with the book, the slight gassy shove as the air on the dusty floor... As the floor's air gets displaced in a soft square that raises no dust, like so. Not like so. Got me? Got it? Well, now, don't be that way. Son, don't be that way now. Don't get all oversensitive on me, son, when all I'm trying to do is help you. Son, Jim, I hate this when you do this, your chin just disappears into that bow tie when your big old overhung lower lip quivers like that. You look chinless, son, and big-lipped. And that cape of mucus that's coming down in your upper lip, the way it shines, it, uh, don't. Just don't. Ugh. It's revolting, son. You know, you don't want to revolt people. You have to learn to control this sort of oversensitivity to hard truths, this sort of thing. Take and exert some goddamn control is the whole point of what I'm taking this whole entire morning off rehearsal with not one but two vitally urgent auditions looming down my neck so I can show you, planning to let you move the seat back and touch the shift and maybe even maybe even drive the Montclair. God knows your feet will reach, right, Jimbo? <laughs> Jim, hey, why not drive the Montclair? Why not you drive us over starting today? Pull up by the court, swear today you'll... Here, look. See how I unscrew it? The cap. With the soft, very outermost tips of my gnarled fingers, which I wish they were steadier. But I'm exerting control to control my anger at that chin and lip and the cape of snot and the way your eyes slant and goggle like some sort of mongoloid child's when you're threatening to cry, but just the very tips of the fingers. Here, the most sensitive parts, the parts bathed in warm oil. The whirled pads, I feel them singing, and blood, I let them extend further than the warm silver hip flask's cap's very top, down its broadening cone to where, to where the threads around the upraised little circular mouth lie hidden, while with the other warm singing hand, I gently grip the leather holster so I can feel the way the whole flask feels as I guide, guide the cap around on its silver threads. Hear that? Stop that and listen. You hear that? The sounds of threads moving through well-machined grooves with great care. A smooth barbershop spiral. My whole hand right through the pads of my fingertips, less, less unscrewing here than guiding, persuading, reminding the silver cap's body what it's built to do, machined to do. The silver cap knows, Jim. I know. You know, we've been through this before. L leave the book alone, boy. It's not going anywhere. So, silver cap leaves the flask's mouth's warm, grooved lips with just a snick. Hear that? That faintest snick. Not a rasp or a grinding sound or harsh, not, not a harsh, brutal, Brando-esque rasp of attempted domination, but a snick. A nuance. There. <laughs> <sighs> like the, once you've heard it, never mistakable punk of a true hit ball, Jim? Well, pick it up, then, if you're afraid of a little dust, Jim. Pick the book up if it's going to make you all goggle-eyed and chinless. Honestly, Jesus, why do I try? I try and try. Just wanted to introduce you to the broiler's garage and let you drive, maybe, feeling the Montclair's body taking my time to let you pull up to the courts with the Montclair shift in a neutral glide and the eight cylinders thrumming and snicking like a healthy heart and the wheels all perfectly flush with the curb and bring out my good old trusty laundry, laundry basket of balls and rackets and towels and flask and my son, my flesh of my flesh. White slump flesh of my flesh who wanted to embark on what I predict right now will be a tennis career that'll put his busted up, used up old dad back square in his little place. Who wanted to maybe for once, 
be a real boy and learn how to play in a fun and frolic and play around in the unrelieved sunshine this city is so fuck all famous for. To enjoy it while he can because did your mother tell you we're moving? That we're moving back to California finally this spring? We're moving, son. I'm harking one last attempted time to that celluloid siren's call. I'm giving it the one last total shot a man's obligation to his last waning talent deserves, Jim. We're headed for the big time again, at last, for the first time since she announced she was having you, Jim. Hitting the road, celluloid bound. So say adios to that school and that fluttery little moth of a physics teacher and those slumped, chinless, slide-ruled, wheeling friends of... No, no, wait, I... I didn't mean it. I meant... I wanted to tell you now, ahead of time, your mother and I, to give you plenty of notice so you could adjust this time because, oh, you made it so unmisinterpretably clear how this last move to this trailer park upset you so, didn't you? To a mobile home with chemical toilet and bolts to hold it in place and widow webs every place you look and grit settling on everything like dust out here Instead of the club staff quarters, I got us removed from. Or well, the house, it was clearly my fault. We couldn't afford any more. It was my fault. I mean, who else's fault would it be? <laughs> Am I right? That we move your big soft body with allegedly not enough notice and that east side school you cried over, and that Negro research resource library in there with the hair out to here, that that lady with the upturned nose on tiptoe all the time, I have to tell you, she seemed so consummate east side Tucsonian, all self-consciously not of this earth's grit, urging us to, quote, nurture your optical knack with physics, with a nose upturned so you could see up in there and on her toes like something skilled overhead had sunk a hook between her big splayed fingerlings' nostrils and were reeling skyward up toward the ether little by little. I bet those heelless pumps are off the floor altogether by now, son. What do you say? <laughs> son, what do you think? No, go on. Cry. Don't inhibit yourself. I won't say a word, except it's getting to me less all the time when you do it. I'll just warn you. I think you're overworking the tears, and the, it's getting less of, uh, effective with me each time you use it. Though we know, we both know, don't we, just between you and me, we know it'll always work on your mother, won't it? Never fail. She'll every time take and bend your big head down to her shoulder so it looks obscene. <laughs> you could see it. Pat patting on your back like she's burping some sort of slumping, oversized, obscene, bow-tied infant with a book straining his pronator terries, crying. Will you do this when you're grown? Hmm? Will there be episodes like this when you're a man at your own tiller? A citizen of a world that won't go pat pat there there? Will your face crumple and bulge like this when you're six and a half grotesque feet tall? Six six plus like your grandfather? May rotten hell's rubber vacuum when he finally kicks on the tenth tee. And with your flat face and no chin just like him on that poor, dumb, patient woman's fragile, wet, snotty, long-suffering shoulder, did I tell you what he did? Did I tell you what he did? I was your age, Jim. Here, take the flask. No, give it here. Oh... Uh, I was 13, and I'd started to play, well, seriously. I was 12 or 13 and playing for years already, and he'd never been to watch. He'd never come once to where I was playing to watch or even changed his big, flat expression even once when I brought home a trophy I won. Trophies or a notice in the paper, Tucson native qualifies for national junior championships. He never acknowledged I even existed as I was. Not as I do you, Jim. Not as I take care to bend over backwards, way, way out of my way, to let you know I see you, recognize you, am aware of you as a body, care about what might go on behind that big, flat, 
face bent over a homemade prism. He plays golf. Your grandfather. Your grandpappy. Golf. A golf man. Is my tone communicating the contempt? Billiards on a big table, Jim. A bodiless game of spasmodic flailing and flying sod. A quote, unquote, sport. Huh. Anal rage and checkered berets. This is almost empty. This is just about it, son. Let's say we rain check this. Let's say I put the last of this out of its amber misery and we go in and tell her you're not feeling up to snuff enough again and we're rain checking your first introduction to the game till this weekend and we'll uh, head over this weekend and do two straight days, both days, and give you a really extensive, intensive intro to, um, by all appearances, limitless future. Intensive gentleness and bodily care equals great tennis, Jim. We'll go both days and let you plunge right in and get wet all over. It's only five dollars. <laughs> the court fee. Uh, for one lousy hour each day. Five dollars each day. Don't give it a thought. Ten total dollars for an intensive weekend when we live in a glorified trailer and have to share a garage with two DeSotos and what looks like a Model A on blocks, and my Montclair can't afford the kind of oil she deserves. Don't look like that. What's money? Well, my rehearsals for the celluloid auditions we're moving 700 miles for, auditions that may well comprise your old dad's last shot at a life with any meaning at all, compared to my son. Right? Am I right? Come here, kid. Come here, come here. Come here, come here. Yeah, that's the boy. That's my J-O-I of a guy, of a joy of boy. That's my kid in his body. <laughs> he never came once, Jim. Not once, to watch. Mother never missed a competitive match, of course. Mother came to so many it ceased to mean anything that she came. She became part of the environment. Mothers are like that, huh? as I'm sure you're aware all too well. <laughs> Am I right? Right? Never came once, kiddo. Never lumbered over all slumped and soft and cast his big, grotesque, long, even at midday shadow at any court I performed on. Till one day, he came. Once. Suddenly, once, without precedent or warning, he came. <sighs> oh. I heard him coming long before he hove into view. He cast a long shadow, Jim. It was some minor local event. It was some early round local thing of very little consequence in the larger scheme. I was playing some local dandy, the kind with fine equipment, increased white clothing, and country club lessons that still can't truly play even, regardless of all the support. You'll find you often have to endure this type of opponent in the first couple rounds. This gleaming, hapless locks of a kid was some client of my father's son. Uh, um, son of one of his clients. <laughs> so he came for the client to put on some sham show of fatherly concern. He wore hat and coat and tie at 95 degrees plus. The client, I uh, can't recall the name. There was something canine about his face, I remember, that his kid across the net had inherited. My father wasn't even sweating. I grew up with the man in this town and never once saw him sweat, Jim. I remember he wore a boater and the sort of gregariously plaid uniform professional men had to wear on the weekends then. They sat in the indecisive shade of a scraggly palm, the sort of palm that's just crawling with black widows in the fronds that come down without warning, that hide lying in wait in the heat of midday. They sat on the blanket my mother always brought, 
my mother, who's dead, and, and the client. My father stood apart, sometimes in the waving shade, sometimes not, smoking a long filter. Long filters are coming to fashion. He never sat on the ground. Not in the American Southwest, he didn't. <laughs> there was a man with a healthy respect for spiders. <laughs> and never on the ground under a palm. He knew he was too grotesquely tall and ungainly to stand up in a hurry or roll screaming out of the way in a hurry in case of falling spiders. They've been known to be willing to drop right out of the trees they hide in, in the daytime, you know. Drop right on you if you're sitting on the ground in the shade. He was no fool, the bastard. A golfer. They all watched. I was right there on the first court. This park no longer exists, Jim. Cars are now parked on what used to be these rough green asphalt courts shimmering in the heat. They were right there, watching, their heads going back and forth in that windshield wiper way of people watching quality tennis. And was I nervous, young Sir J.O.I., with the one and only himself there in all his wooden glory there, watching, half in and out of the light, expressionless? I was not. I was in my body. My body and I were one. My Wood Wilson from my stack of Wood Wilsons and their trapezoid presses was a sentient expression of my arm, and I felt it singing, and my hand, and they were alive. My well-armed hand was the secretary of my mind, lithe and responsive and sensei rory, because I knew myself as a body and was fully inside my little child's body out there, Jim. I was in my big right arm and scarless legs, safely ensconced, running here and there, my head pounding like a heart, sweat pearls on every limb, running like a velt creature, leaping, frolicking, striking with maximum economy and minimum effort, my eyes on the ball and the corners both. I was two, three, a couple shots ahead of both me and the hapless canine client's kid. Handing the dandy his pampered ass. It was carnage. It was a scene out of nature in its rawest state, Jim. <laughs> he should have been there. Kate kept bending over to get his breath. The smoothly economical frolicking I was doing contrasted starkly compared to the heavily jerky way he was being forced to stomp around and lunge. His white-knit shirt and name-brand shorts were soaked through so you could see the straps of his jock biting into the soft ass I was handing him. <laughs> he wore a flitty little white visor such as 52-year-old women at country clubs and posh southwestern resorts wear. I was, in a word, deft, considered, prescient. I made him stomp and stagger and lunge. I wanted to humiliate him. The client's long, sharp face was sagging. My father had no face. It was sharply shadowed and then illuminated in the wagging fronds shadow he half stood in, but was wreathed in smoke from the long filters he fancied, long plastic filtered holders, yellowed at the stem, in imitation of the president, as courtiers once spluttered with the king veiled in shade, and then lit smoke. The client didn't know enough to keep quiet. He thought he was at a ball game or something. The client's voice carried. Our first court was right near the tree they sat under. The client's legs were out in front of them and protruded from the sharp star of frond shade. His slacks were lattice shadowed from the pattern of the fence his son and I played just behind. He was drinking the lemonade my mother had brought for me. She made it fresh. He said I was good. My father's client did. In that emphasized way that made his voice carry. You know, son? Good Godfrey and Candezza, old trout, but that lad of yours is good! Unquote. I heard him say it as I ran and whacked and frolicked. 
and I heard the tall son of a bitch's reply after a long pause, during which the world's whole air hung there as if lifted and left to swing. Standing at the baseline, or walking back to the baseline to either serve or receive one of the two, I heard the client, his voice carried, and then, later, I heard my father's reply, may he rot in a green and empty hill. I heard what... What he said in reply, Sunbo, but not until after I'd fallen. I insist on this point, Jim. Not until after I'd started to fall. Jim, I'd been in the middle of trying to run down a ball way out of mortal reach, a rare, blind, lucky dribbler of a drop shot from the overgroomed locks across the net, a point I could have more than afforded to concede. But that's not the way I... That's not the way a real player plays. With respect and due effort and care for every point. You want to be great? Near great? You give every ball everything, and then some. You concede nothing. Even against loxes. You play right up to your limit and then pass your limit and look back at your former limit and wave a hanky at it, embarking. You enter a trance. You feel the seams and edges of everything. The court becomes a, uh, an extremely unique place to be. It will do everything for you. It will let nothing escape your body. Objects move as they're made to, at the lightest, easiest touch. You slip into the clear current of back and forth, making delicate X's and L's across the harsh, rough, bright green asphalt surface. Your sweat, the same temperature as your skin, playing with such ease and total mindless effortless effort and, <laughs> and, and entranced concentration. You, you don't even stop to consider whether to run down every ball. You're barely aware you're doing it. Your body's doing it for you. And the court and games doing it for your body. You're barely involved. It's magic, boy. Nothing touches it. When it's right, I predict it. Facts and figures and curved glass and those elbow-straining books of yours, lightless pages are going to seem flat by comparison. Static. Dead and white and flat. They don't begin to... It's like a dance, Jim. The point is, I was too bodily respectful to slip up and fall on my own out there. And the other point is, I started to fall forward even before I started to hear him reply, standing there. Yes, but he'll never be great. What he said in no way made me fall forward. The unlovely opponent had dribbled one just barely over the too-low public park net. A freak accident. A mishit drop shot. And another man on another court and another early round laugher would have let it dribble. Conceded the affordable. Not trying to wave a hanky from the vessel of his limit. Not race on all eight healthy scarless cylinders desperately forward toward the net to try to catch the goddamn thing on the first bounce. Jim... That any man can slip. I don't know what I slipped on, son. There were spiders well known to infest the palms, fronds all along the court's fences. They come down at night on threads, bulbous, flexing. I'm thinking it could have been a bulbous, goo-filled widow I stepped and slipped on, Jim. A spider. A mad rogue spider come down on its thread into the shade flabby and crawling, or that leapt suicidally right from an overhanging frond under the court, probably making a slight, flabby, hideous sound when it landed, crawling around on its claws, blinking grotesquely in the hot light it hated, that I stepped on, rushing forward and killed and slipped on the mess the big loathsome spider made. See these scars? All knotted and ragged? like something had torn at my own body's knees the way a slouching Brando would just rip a letter open with his teeth and let the envelope fall on the floor all wet and rent and torn. All the palms along the fence were sick, 
They had palm rot. It was the A.D. year 1933 of the great Bisbee palm rot epidemic. All through the state, and they were losing their fronds, and the fronds were blighted in the color of really old olives and those old slim jars at the very back of the refrigerator, and exuded a sick sort of pus-like slippery discharge and sometimes abruptly fell from trees curving back and forth through the air like celluloid pirate's paper swords. God, I hate Franz, Jim. I think it could have been either a daytime latrodectus or some pus from a frond. The wind blew cruddy pus from the web fronds under the court, maybe, up near the net. Either way, something poisonous, or infected at any rate, unexpected and slick. All it takes is a second, you're thinking, Jim. The body betrays you, and down you go, on your knees sliding on sandpaper court. Not so, son. I used to have another flask like this. Smaller, a rather more cunning silver flask in the glove compartment of my Montclair. Your devoted mother did something to it. The subject has never been mentioned between us. Not so. It was a foreign body or a substance, not my body. And if anybody did any betraying that day, I'm telling you, sonny kid, boy, it was something I did, Jimmer. I may well have betrayed that fine, young, lithe, tan, unslumped body. I may very well have gotten rigid, overconscious, careless of it, listening for what my father, who I respected. I respected that man, Jim, is what's sick. I knew he was there. I was conscious of his flat face and filter's long shadow. I knew him, Jim. Things were different when I was growing up, Jim. I hate it. Jesus. I hate saying something like this. This things were different when I was a lad type cliche shit, the sort of cliche fathers back then spouted, assuming he said anything at all. But it was different. Our kids, my generation's kids, they... Now you, this post-Brando crowd, you new kids... Can't like us or dislike us or respect us or not as human beings, Jim. Your parents... No, wait, you don't have to pretend you disagree. No, you don't have to say it, Jim, because I know it. I could have predicted it, watching Brando and Dean and the rest. And I know it, so don't splutter. I blame no one your age, boyo. You see, parents as kind or unkind or happy or miserable or drunk or sober or great or near great or failed the way you see a table square or a Montclair lip red. Kids today, you kids today somehow don't know how to feel, much less love, to say nothing of respect. We're just bodies to you. We're just bodies and shoulders and scarred knees and big bellies and empty wallets and flasks to you. I'm not saying something cliché like you take us for granted so much as I'm saying you cannot imagine our absence. We're so present, it ceased to mean we're <laughs> environmental, furniture of the world. Jim, I could imagine that man's absence. Jim, I'm telling you, you, you cannot imagine my absence. It's my fault, Jim. Home so much, limping around, ruined knees, overweight, under the influence, burping, non-slim, sweat soaked in that broiler of a trailer, burping, farting, frustrated, miserable, knocking lamps over, overshooting my reach. <laughs> Afraid to give my last talent the one shot it demanded. Talent is its own expectation, Jim. You either live up to it, or it waves a hanky, receding forever. Use it or lose it, he'd say over the newspaper. I'm, I'm just afraid of having a tombstone that says, Here lies a promising old man. It's, 
Potential may be worse than none, Jim. There's no talent to fritter in the first place. Lying around guzzling because I haven't the balls to... <laughs> God, I'm... <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jim. You don't deserve to see me like this. And... <laughs> I'm so scared, Jim. I'm so scared of dying without ever being really seen. <laughs> Can you understand? Are you enough of a big, thin, prematurely stooped, young, bespectacled man, even with your whole life still ahead of you, to understand? Can you see I was giving it all I had, that I was in there, out there in the heat, listening, webbed with nerves? <laughs> A self that touches all edges, I remember, she said. I felt it in a way I fear you and your generation never could, son. It was less like falling than being shot out of something, is the way I recall it. It did not, did not happen in slow motion. One minute I was at a dead and beautiful forward run for the ball... The next minute there were hands at my back and nothing underfoot like a push down a stairway. A rude whiplashing shove square in the back and my promising body with all its webs of nerves pulsing and firing was in full airborne flight and came down on my knees. This flask is empty. Right down on my knees. With all my weight and inertia on that scabrous hot sandpaper surface forced into what was an exact parody of an imitation of contemplative prayer, sliding forward. The flesh and the tissue and bone left twin tracks of brown, red, gray, white, like tire tracks of bodily gore extending from the service line to the net. I slid on my flaming knees, rushed past the dribbling ball and toward the net that ended my slide. Our slide. <laughs> my racket had gone pinwheeling off Jim and my racketless arms out before me, sliding Jim in the attitude of a mortified monk in total prayer. It was given me to hear my father pronounce my bodily existence as not even potentially great. At the moment, I ruined my knees forever, Jim. So that even years later at USC, I never got to wave my hanky at anything beyond the near and almost great and would have been great if... And later could never even hope to audition for the swim trunk and brill cream beach movies... That snake Avalon is making his mint on. I do not insist that the judgment and punishing fall are, were connected, Jim. Any man can slip out there. All it takes is a second of misplaced respect. Son, it was more than a father's voice carrying. My mother cried out. It was a religious moment. I learned what it means to be a body, Jim, just meat, wrapped in a sort of flimsy nylon stocking, son. As I fell, kneeling, and slid toward the stretched net, myself seen by me, frame by frame, torn open. I may have to burp. Belch, son. Son. <laughs> Telling you what I learned, son. My, my love. Too late. As I left my knees meet behind me, slid, ended in a posture of supplication on my knees, disclosed bones, with my fingers racketless hooked through the mesh of the net, across which the net, the sopped dandy had dropped his pricey gut-strung Davis racket and was running toward me with his visor askew and his hands to his cheeks. My father and the client he was there to perform for dragged me upright to the palm's infected shade where she knelt on the plaid beach blanket with her knuckles between her teeth, Jim. And I felt the religion of the physical that day. And not much more in your age, Jim. <laughs> Shoes filling with blood. 
held under the arms by two bodies big as yours and dragged off a public court with two extra lines. It's a pivotal, it's a seminal religious day <laughs> when you get to both hear and feel your destiny at the same moment, Jim. I got to notice what I'm sure you've noticed long ago. I know, and I know you've seen me brought home on occasions. Drags in the door under what's called the influence, son. Helped in by cabbies at night. I, I've seen your long shadow grotesquely backlit at the top of the house's stairs. I helped pay for it, boy. How the drunk and the maimed both are dragged forward out of the arena like a boneless Christ. One man under each arm. Feet dragging, eyes on the ether. The 4th of November, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment From Cambridge's Latinate Inman Square, Michael Pemulus, nobody's fool at all, rides one necessary bus to Central Square and then an unnecessary bus to Davis Square, and a train back to Central. This is to throw off the slightest possible chance of pursuit. At Central, he catches the red line to Park Street Station, where he's parked the tow truck in an underground lot he can more than afford. The day is autumnal and mild, the east breeze smelling of urban commerce and the vague suede smell of new fallen leaves. The sky is pilot light blue, Sunlight reflects complexly off the smoked glass sides of tall centers of commerce all around Park Street downtown. Pamulus wears button-fly chinos and an ETA shirt beneath a snazzy blue Brioni sport coat, plus the bright white yachting cap that Mario Incandenza calls his Mr. Howell hat. The hat looks rakish even when turned around, and it has a detachable lining. Inside the lining can be kept portable quantities of just about anything. Having indulged in 150 milligrams of very mild dreams post-transaction. Wearing also gray and blue saddle oxfords without socks. It's such a mild autumn day. The streets literally bustle. Vendors with carts instead of tubs sell hot pretzels and tonics and those underboiled franks. Emulus likes to have them put the works on. You can see the State House and Common and Courthouse and Public Gardens, and beyond all that, the cool, smooth facades of Back Bay Brownstones. The echoes in the underground Park Place Garage, Park, gar, 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 are pleasantly complex. Traffic westward on Commonwealth Avenue is light, meaning things can move, all the way through Kenmore Square and past Boston U and up the long, slow hill into Alston and Enfield. When Tavis and Stitt and the players and ground crew and Test Star and ATH SCME teams inflate the all-weather lung for the winter over courts 16 through 32, the domed lung's nacelle is visible against the horizon all the way down by the Brighton Avenue-Commonwealth Avenue split in Lower Alston. The incredibly potent DMZ is apparently classed as a paramethoxylated amphetamine, but really it looks to Pemulus, from his slow and tortured survey of the Medcom's monographs, more like, more similar to the anticholinergic deliriant class. Way more powerful than mescaline, or MDA, or DMA, or TMA, or MDMA, or DOM, or STP, or the IV ingestible DMT, or Ololuki, or Detura's scopolamine, or fluethane, or bufotenine, a.k.a. Jackie O., or ebene, or psilocybin, or silert. 56. DMZ resembling chemically some miscegenation of a lysergic with a mycinoloid, but significantly different from LSD-25 in that its effects are less visual and spatially cerebral and more like temporally cerebral and almost ontological, with some sort of manipulated phenylchylamine-like speediness whereby the ingester perceives his relation to the ordinary flow of time as radically 
and euphorically, is where the mesimal affective resemblance shows its head, altered. 57. The incredibly potent DMZ is synthesized from a derivative of Fitviav, an obscure mold that grows only on other molds, by the same ambivalently lucky chemist at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, who had first stumbled on LSD as a relatively ephebic and clueless organic chemist while futzing around with ergotic fungi on rye. DMZ's discovery was the tail end of the BS 1960s, just about the same time Dr. Alan Watts was considering T. Leary's invitation to become writer in resonance at Leary's utopian LSD-25 colony in Millbrook, New York, on what is now Canadian soil. A substance even just the accidental synthesis of which sent the Sandoz chemist into early retirement and serious, unblinking wall-watching. The incredibly potent DMZ has a popular lay chemical underground reputation as the single grimmest thing ever conceived in a tube. It is also now the hardest recreational compound to acquire in North America after raw Vietnamese opium, which, forget it. DMZ is sometimes also referred to in some Metro Boston chemical circles as Madame Psychosis, after a popular very early morning cult radio personality on MIT's student-run radio station WYYY-109, largest whole prime on the FM band which Mario Incandenza and ETA Stats Weenie and Eschaton Game Master Otis P. Lord listened to almost religiously. The day shift and it house kid at the booth who raises the portcullis to let him onto the grounds had a couple times in October approached Pemulus about a potential transaction. Pemulus has a rigid policy about not transacting with ETA employees who come up the hill from the halfway house since he knows some of them are at the place on court order, and knows for a fact they pull unscheduled urines all over the place down there. And types like the Ennett House types are just the sorts of people Pemulus's talents let him get away from, in terms of, like, social milieu and mixing and transacting. And his basic attitude with these low-rent employees is one of unfoolish discretion, and like, why tempt fate? The East Courts are empty and ball-strewn when Pemulus pulls in. Most of them are still at lunch. Pemulus, Trolch, and Schacht's triple room is in Subdorm B in the back north part of the second floor of West House, and so superjacent to the dining hall, from which, through the floor, Pemulus can hear voices and silverware and can smell exactly what they're having. The first thing he does is boot up the phone console and try Ink and Mario's room over in Comad, where Hal is sitting in window light with a riverside hamlet he told Mario he'd read and help with a conceptual film-type project based on part of his uncushioned captain's chair partly under an old print of a detail from the minor and softcore Alexandrian mosaic consummation of the leverets, eating an Amino Pal energy bar and waiting very casually the phone with its antenna already out, lying ready on the arm of the chair, and two folio-sized Baron's SAT prep guides and a spine-shot copy of the BS 1937, Tilden on spin, and his keys on their neck chain lying on the Lindestone carpet by his shoe, waiting in a very casual posture. Hal deliberately waits till the audio console's third ring, like a girl at home on Saturday night. Yellow? The turd emergeth, Pemulus' clear and digitally condensed voice on the line. Repeat, the turd emergeth. Please commit a crime, is how Incondenza's immediate reply. Gracious me, Pemulus says into the phone tucked under his jaw, carefully de-velcroing the lining of his Mr. Howell hat. Tennis and the Feral Prodigy, narrated by Hal Incandenza, an 11.5-minute digital entertainment cartridge, directed, recorded, edited, and, according to the entry form, written by Mario Incandenza, in receipt of new New England Regional Honorable Mention 
and interlace Tell Entertainment's annual New Eyes, New Voices Young Filmmakers Contest. April, in the year of the You Ship You 2007, Mimetic Resolution Cartridge View Motherboard, easy to install upgrade for Infernatron Interlace TP Systems for Home, Office, or Mobile. Almost exactly three years after Dr. James O. Incandenza passed from this life. Here is how to put on a big red tent of a shirt that has ETA across the chest in gray. Please ease carefully into your supporter and adjust the elastic straps so the straps do not bite into your butt and make bulged ridges in your butt that everyone can see once you've sweated through your shorts. Here is how to wrap your torn ankle so tightly in its flesh-toned ace bandages your left leg feels like a log. Here is how to win later. This is a yellow iron mesh ball hopper full of dirty green dead old balls. Take them to the east courts while the dawn is still chalky and no one's around except the morning doves that infest the pines at sunrise and the air is so soft you can see your summer breath. It serves to no one. Make a mess of balls along the base of the opposite fence as the sun hauls itself up over the harbor, and the thin sweat breaks and the surf start to boom. Stop thinking and let it flow and go boom, boom. The shiver off the ball against the opposite fence. Hit about a thousand serves to no one while himself sits and advises with his flask. Older men's legs are white and hairless from decades in pants. Here is a set of keys a stride's length before you in the court as you serve dead balls to no one. After each serve, you must almost fall forward into the court and in one smooth motion bend and scoop up the keys with your left hand. This is how to train yourself to follow through into the court after the serve. You still, years after the man's death, cannot keep your keys anywhere but on the floor. This is how to hold the stick. Learn to call the racket a stick. Everyone does here. It's a tradition. The stick. Something so much an extension of you deserves a sobriquet. Please look. You'll be shown exactly once how to hold it. This is how to hold it. Just like this. Forget all the Near Eastern slice backhand grip baffle gab. Just say hello is all. To shake hands with the calfskin grip of the stick. This is how to hold it. The stick is your friend. You will become very close. Grasp your friend firmly at all times. A firm grip is essential for both control and power. Here is how to carry a tennis ball around in your stick hand, squeezing it over and over for long stretches of time. In class, on the phone, in lab, in front of the TP, a wet ball for the shower, ideally squeezing it at all times except during meals. See the academy dining hall, where tennis balls sit beside every plate. Squeeze the tennis ball rhythmically month after year until you feel it no more than your heart squeezing blood and your right forearm is three times the size of your left and your arm looks from across a court like a gorilla's arm or a stevedore's arm pasted on the body of a child. Here is how to do extra individual drills before the academy's AM drills before breakfast, so that after the thousandth ball hit just out of reach by himself, with his mammoth wingspan and ghastly calves, urging you with nothing but smiles on to great and greater demonstrations of effort, so that after you've gotten your third and final wind and must vomit, there is little inside to vomit, and the spasms pass quickly, and an east breeze blows cooler past you, and you feel clean and can breathe. Here is how to don red and gray ETA sweats and squad jog a weekly 40-kilometer up and down urban Commonwealth Avenue, even though you would rather set your hair on fire than jog in a pack. Jogging is painful and pointless, but you are not in charge. Your brother gets to ride shotgun while a senile German blows BBs at your legs, both of them laughing and screaming, Schnell! Enfield is due east of the Marathon's Hills of Heartbreak which are just up Commonwealth, past the reservoir in Newton. Urban jogging in a sweaty pack is tedious. Have himself hunched down to put a long pale arm around your shoulders and tell you that his own father had told him that talent is sort of a dark gift, 
The talent is its own expectation. It is there from the start and either lived up to or lost. Have a father whose own father lost what was there. Have a father who lived up to his own promise and then found thing after thing to meet and surpass the expectations of his promise in, and didn't seem just a whole hell of a lot happier or tighter wrapped than his own failed father, leaving you yourself in a kind of feral and flux-ridden state with respect to talent. Here is how to avoid thinking about any of this by practicing and playing until everything runs on autopilot and talent's unconscious exercise becomes a way to escape yourself, a long waking dream of pure play. The irony is that this makes you very good, and you start to become regarded as having a prodigious talent to live up to. Here is how to handle being a feral prodigy. Here is how to handle being seated at tournaments, signifying that seating committees composed of old, big-armed men publicly expect you to reach a certain round. Reaching at least the round you're supposed to is known at tournaments as justifying your seed. By repeating this term over and over, perhaps in the same rhythm at which you squeeze a ball, you can reduce it to an empty series of phonemes, just formants and fricatives, trochaically stressed, signifying zip. Here is how to beat unseated, wide-eyed opponents from Iowa or Rhode Island in the early rounds of tournaments without expending much energy, but also without seeming contemptuous. This is how to play with personal integrity in a tournament's early rounds when there is no umpire. Any ball that lands on your side and is too close to call, call it fair. Here is how to be invulnerable to gamesmanship, to keep your attention's aperture tight. Here is how to teach yourself when an opponent maybe cheats on the line calls, to remind yourself that what goes around comes around, that a poor sports punishment is always self-inflicted. Try to learn to let what is unfair teach you. Here is how to spray yourself down exactly once with Lemon Pledge, the ultimate sunscreen, then discover that when you go out and sweat into it, it smells like close-order skunk. Here is how to take non-narcotic muscle relaxants for the back spasms that come from thousands of serves to no one. Here is how to weep in bed trying to remember when your torn blue ankle didn't hurt every minute. This is the whirlpool. A friend. Here is how to set up the electric ball machine at dawn on the days himself is away, living up to what will be his final talent. Here is how to tie a bow tie. Here is how to sit through small openings of your father's first art films, surrounded by surly foreign cigarette smoke and conversations so pretentious you literally cannot believe them. You're sure you have misheard them. Pretend you're engaged by the jagged angles and multiple exposures without pretending you have the slightest idea what's going on. Assume your brother's expression. Here is how to sweat. Here is how to hand a trophy to lateral Alice Moore to put in the ETA lobby's glass case under its system of spotlights and small signs. What is unfair can be a stern but invaluable teacher. Here is how to pack carbohydrates into your tissues for a four singles, two doubles match day in a Florida June. Please learn to sleep with perpetual sunburn. Expect some rough dreams. They come with the territory. Try to accept them. Let them teach you. Keep a flashlight by your bed. It helps with the dreams. Please make no extramural friends. Discourage advances from outside the circuit. Turn down dates. If you do exactly the rehabilitative exercises they assign you, no matter how silly and tedious, the ankle will mend more quickly. This type of stretch helps prevent the groin pull. Treat your knees and elbow with all reasonable care. You will have them with you for a long time. Here is how to turn down an extramural date so you won't be asked again. Say something like, I'm terribly sorry, I can't come out to see eight and a half revived on a wall size 
Cambridge Celluloid Festival viewer on Friday, Kimberly, or Daphne, but, you see, if I jump rope for two hours, then jog backwards through Newton till I puke, they'll let me watch match cartridges, and then my mother will read aloud to me from the OED until 2200 lights out, and see. So you can be sure that henceforth, Daphne, Kimberly, Jennifer will take her adolescent mating dance type ritual socialization business somewhere else. Be on guard. The road widens and many of the detours are seductive. Be constantly focused and on alert. Feral talent is its own set of expectations and can abandon you at any one of the detours of so-called normal American life at any time. So be on guard. Here is how to schnell. Here is how to go through your normal adolescent growth spurt and have every limb in your body ache like a migraine because selected groups of muscles have been worked until thick and intensile, and they resist as the sudden growth of bone tries to stretch them, and they ache all the time. There is medication for this condition. If you are an adolescent, here is the trick to being neither quite a nerd nor quite a jock. Be no one. It is easier than you think. Here is how to read the monthly ETA and USTA and ONANTA rankings the way himself read scholars' reviews of his multiple exposure melodramas. Learn to care and not to care. They mean the rankings to help you determine where you are, not who you are. Memorize your monthly rankings and forget them. Here is how. Never tell anyone where you are. This is also how not to fear sleep or dreams. Never tell anyone where you are. Please, learn the pragmatics of expressing fear. Sometimes words that seem to express really invoke. This can be tricky. Here is how to get free sticks and strings and clothes and gear from Dunlop Incorporated as long as you let them spray paint the distinctive Dunlop logo on your stick's strings and so logos on your shoulder and the left pocket of your shorts and use a Dunlop gear bag and you become a walking, lunging, sweating advertisement for Dunlop Incorporated. This is all as long as you keep justifying your seed and preserving your rank. The Dunlop Incorporated New New England Regional Athletic Rep will address you as Our Gray Swan. He wears designer slacks and choking cologne and about twice a year wants to help you dress and has to be slapped like a gnat. Be a student of the game. Like most cliches of sport, this is profound. You can be shaped or you can be broken. There is not much in between. Try to learn. Be coachable. Try to learn from everybody, especially those who fail. This is hard. Peers who fizzle or blow up or fall down, run away, disappear from the monthly rankings, drop off the circuit. ETA peers waiting for DeLint to knock quietly at their door and ask to chat. Opponents. It's all educational. How promising you are as a student of the game is a function of what you can pay attention to without running away. Nets and fences can be mirrors. And between the nets and fences, opponents are also mirrors. This is why the whole thing is scary. This is why all opponents are scary, and weaker opponents are especially scary. See yourself in your opponents. They will bring you to understand the game, to accept the fact that the game is about managed fear, that its object is to send from yourself what you hope will not return. This is your body. They want you to know. You will have it with you, always. On this issue, there is no counsel. You must make your best guess. For myself, I do not expect ever really to know. But in the interval, if it is an interval, here is Motrin for your joints, Noxema for your burn, Lemon Pledge if you prefer nausea to burn. Contracol for your back, benzoin for your hands, 
Epsom salts and anti-inflammatories for your ankle, and extracurriculars for your folks, who just wanted to make sure you didn't miss anything they got. Selected transcripts of the resident interface drop-in hours of Ms. Patricia Montesian, M.A., C.S.A.C., Executive Director, Ennett House Drug and Alcohol Recovery House, Enfield, Massachusetts, 1300 to 1500 hours, Wednesday, 4 November, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. 58. But there's this way he drums his fingers on the table. Not even like really drumming. More like in way between drumming and like the scratching, picking. The way you see somebody picking at dead skin. And without any kind of rhythm, see? Constant and never stopping, but with no kind of rhythm you could grab onto and follow and stand. Totally like whacked, insane. Like the kind of sounds you can imagine a girl hears in her head right before she kills her whole family. Because somebody took the last bit of peanut butter or something. You know what I'm saying? The sound of a fucking mind coming apart. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yes. Okay, the short answer is, when he wouldn't quit with the drumming at supper, I sort of poked him with my fork. Sort of. I could see how maybe somebody could have thought I sort of stabbed him. I offered to get the fork out, though. Let me just say I'm ready to make amends. I'd like... Any time. For my part in it. I'm owning my part in it, is what I'm saying. Can I ask, am I going to get restricted for this? Because I have this overnight tomorrow that Gene, he approved already in the overnight log. If you want to look. But I'm not trying to get out of owning my part of the, like, occurrence. If my higher power, who I choose to call God, works through you, saying I've got some kind of a punishment due, I won't try to get out of a punishment. If I've got one due, I just wanted to ask, D did I mention I'm grateful to be here? I am not denying anything. I'm simply asking you to define alcoholic. How can you ask me to attribute to myself a given term if you refuse to define the term's meaning? I've been a reasonably successful personal injury attorney for 16 years, and except for that one ridiculous so-called seizure at the Bar Association dinner this spring, and that clot of a judge banning me from his courtroom, and let me just say that I can support my contention that the man masturbates under his robe behind the bench with detailed corroboration from both colleagues and circuit court laundry personnel, with the exception of less than a handful of incidents, I've held my liquor and my head as high as many a taller advocate. Believe you me. How old are you, young lady? I'm not in denial, so to speak, about anything empirical and objective. Am I having pancreas problems? Yes. Do I have trouble recalling certain intervals in the Kemp and Limbaugh administrations? No contest. Is there a spot of domestic turbulence surrounding my intake? Why, yes, there is. Did I experience, yes, some formication and detox? I did. I have no problem forthrightly admitting things I can grasp. Formicate, with an M, yes. But what is this you demand I admit? Is it denial to delay signature until the vocabulary of the contract is clear to all parties so bound? Yes, yes, you don't follow what I mean here. Good, and... You're reluctant to proceed without clarification. I rest. I cannot deny what I don't understand. This is my position. So I'm sitting there waiting for my meatloaf to cool, and suddenly there's a simply sphincter-loosening shriek. And here's Nell in the air with a steak fork, positively aloft, leaping across the table, in flight, horizontal, I mean, Pat, the girl's body is literally parallel to the surface of the table, hurling herself at me with his upraised fork, shrieking something about the sound of peanut butter. I mean, my God! Gailey and Deal had to pull the fork out of my hand and the tabletop both, to give you an idea of the savagery. Don't even ask me about the pain. Let's don't even get into that, I assure you. 
They offered me Percocet at the emergency room is all I'll say about the levels of pain involved. 59. I told them I was in recovery and powerless over narcotics of any sort. Please don't even ask me how moved they were at my courage if you don't want me to get weepy. This whole experience has me right on the edge of a complete hysterical fit. So, but yes, guilty. I may very well have been tapping on the table. Excuse me for occupying space. And then she ever so magnanimously says she'll apologize if I will. Well, come again, I said. Come again? I mean, my God. I'm sitting there attached to the table by times. I know bashing, Pat. And this was unabashed bashing. At its most fascist. I respectfully ask that she be kicked out of here on her enormous rear end. Let her go back to whatever fork-wielding district she came from, with her hefty bag full of gauche clothes. Honestly, I know part of this process is learning to live in a community, the give and take, to let go of personality issues, turn them over, etc. But is it not also supposed to be, and here I quote the handbook, a safe and nurturing environment? I have seldom felt less nurtured than I did impaled on that table, I have to say. The pathetic harassments of Minty and McDade are bad enough. I can get bashed back at the Fenway. I did not come here to get bashed on some pretense of table tapping. I'm dangerously close to saying either that... that specimen goes, or I do. I'm awful sorry to bother. I can come back. I was wondering if maybe there was any special program prayer for when you want to hang yourself. I want understanding. I have no denial. I am drug addict. Me? I know I am addicted since the period of before Miami. I am no trouble to stand up in the meetings and say I am Alfonso. I am drug addict. Powerless. I am knowing powerlessness since the period of Castro. But I cannot stop even since I know. This I have fear. I fear I do not stop when I admit I am Alfonso. Powerless. How does to admit I am powerless make me stop what the thing is I am powerless to stop? My head, it is crazy from this fearing of no power. I am now hope for power, Mrs. Pat. I want to advise. Is hope of power the bad way for Alfonso? Astro got it? Sorry to barge there. PM division called again about the thing with the vermin. The word was ultimatum that they said. Sorry if I'm bothering you about something that isn't a straightforward treatment interface thing. Um, I'm up there trying to do my chore. I've got the men's upstairs bathroom. There's something... Pat, there's something in the toilet up there that won't flush. The thing, it, it won't go away. It keeps reappearing, flush after flush. I'm only here for instructions, possibly also protective equipment. Uh, I couldn't even describe the thing in the toilet. All I can say is, if it was produced by anything human, then I have to say I'm really worried. Don't even ask me to describe it. If you want to go up and have a look, I'm 100% confident it's still there. It's made it real clear it's not going anywhere. All I know is I put a Hunt's pudding cup in the resident fridge like I'm supposed to at 1300 and da-da-da, and at 1430 I come down all prime for pudding that I paid for myself, and it's not there. And McDade comes on all concerned and offers to help me look for it, and da-da, except if you look, I look, and here's the son of a whore got this big thing of pudding on his chin. Yeah, but except so how can I answer just yes or no to do I want to stop the coke? Do I think I want to? Absolutely I think I want to. I don't have a septum no more. My septum's been, like, fucking dissolved by coke, see? You see anything like a septum when I lift up like that? I've absolutely, with my whole heart, thought I wanted to stop and so forth, and... Ever since with the septum, so, but, so, since I've been wanting to stop this whole time, why couldn't I stop? 
You see what I'm saying? Isn't it all about wanting to and so on and, and so forth? <laughs> How can living here and going to meetings and all do anything except make me want to stop? But I think I already want to stop. How come I'd even be here if I didn't want to stop? Isn't being here proof I want to stop? But then, so, how come I can't stop if I want to stop, is the thing. This kid had a hair lip, where it goes like, you know, fifth. <laughs> but his went way up, further up. He sold bad speed, but good pot. He said he'd cover our part of the rent if we kept his snakes supplied with mice. We were smoking up all our cash, so what's to do? They ate mice. We had to go into pet stores and pretend to be really heavily into mice. Snakes. He kept snakes. Deucey. He smelled bad. He never cleaned the tanks. His lip covered his nose. The hair lip? I guess he couldn't smell what they smelled like, or something would have got done. He had a thing for Mildred. My girlfriend? I don't know. She probably has a problem, too. I don't know. He had a thing for her. He keeps saying shit like, with all these THs, he'd go, Fo, you want to fuck me, Mildred, or what? We don't have to eat each other or nothing. He'd say shit like this with me right there, dropping mice into these tanks, holding my breath. The mice had to be alive. All in this god-awful voice like somebody's holding their nose and can't say S. He didn't wash his hair for two years. We had like an end joke on how long he wouldn't wash his hair, and we'd make X's on the calendar every week. We had a lot of these in-type jokes to help us stand it. We were wasted, I'd say, 90% of the time. Nine O. Oh. But he never did the whole time we were there. Wash. When she said we had to leave or she was taken off and taken Harriet was when she said when I was at work, he started telling her how to have sex with a chicken. He said he had sex with the chickens. It was a trailer out past the dumpster dock in the spur, and he kept a couple chickens under it. No wonder they ran like hell when anybody came. He'd been, like, sexually abusing fowls. He kept talking to her about it, with all THs, like, you have to, like, screw them on. But when you come, they just sort of fly off of you. She said she drew the line. We left and went to Pine Street Shelter, and she stayed for a while to this guy with a hat, said he had a ranch in New Jersey. And off she goes. And with Harriet. Uh, Harriet's our daughter. She's going to be three. She says it's uh, three, though. <laughs> I doubt now the kid will ever say a single T-H her whole life. I don't even know where in New Jersey. Does New Jersey even have ranches? I've been in school with her since grade school. Mildred. We were like childhood sweethearts. And then this guy who got her old cot at the shelter, I got lice from. He moves into her cot, and then I start to get lice. I was still trying to deliver ice to machines at gas stations. They wouldn't have to get high just to stand it. So this purports to be a disease. Alcoholism? A disease like a cold or like cancer? I have to tell you, I have never heard of anyone being told to pray for relief from cancer. Outside maybe certain very rural parts of the American South, that is. So what is this? You're ordering me to pray? Because I allegedly have a disease? I dismantle my life and career and enter nine months of low-income treatment for a disease, and I'm prescribed prayer? Does the word retrograde signify? Am I in a socio-historical era I don't know about? What exactly is the story here? Fine, fine, uh, fine. Just completely fine. No problem at all. Happy to be here. <laughs> Feeling better. <laughs> Sleeping better. <laughs> Love the chow. In a word, couldn't be finer. The, 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 the grinding, the, the tooth grinding, a tick. <laughs> a jaw strengthener. <laughs> Expression of all-around fineness. <laughs> Likewise, the thing with the eyelid. But I did too try. I've been trying all month. I've been on four interviews. And then none of them start till 11. And I'm like, what's the point? Get up early, sit around here. I don't have to be down there till 11. I fill out applications every day. Where am I supposed to go? You can't kick me out just for the month. They don't call me back if I'm trying. It's not my fault. 
Go on and ask Tanette. Ask that trail girl and them if I ain't been trying. You can. This is just so fucked up. I said, where am I supposed to go to? I'm on a month's full house restriction for using freaking mouthwash. Newsflash, news bulletin. Mouthwash is for spitting out. It's like 2% proof. It's about somebody else's farting. Why I'm here. I'll gladly identify myself if you'll first simply explain what it is I'm identifying myself as. This is my position. You're requiring me to attest to facts I do not possess. The term for this is duress. So my offense is what? Misdemeanor gargling? I'll come back when you're free. It's back. For a second there, I hoped. I had hope. Then, there it was again. First, just let me say one thing. Late October, year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. Open me another one of those, boy, and I'll tell you the highlight of that season of my season tickets. Was I got to see that incredible son of a bitch set his first record in the flesh. It was your brother's Cub Scout swoop out, and you wouldn't join because I remember this. You were afraid you'd lose the online time in front of the TP. Remember? Well, I'll always remember this one day, boy. It was against Syracuse. What, eight seasons back? The little son of a bitch had a long of 73 that day, and an average of 60 friggin' nine. 73, for Christ's sake. Up on me another one, boy. Use the exercise. I recall the sky was cloudy. When he punted, you spent a real long time studying the sky. They really hung. He had a long hang time of 8.3 seconds that day. That's serious hanging, boy. Me? I never went five in my day. Christ. The whole troop said they never heard anything like the sound of the son of a bitch of 73. One Richardson. You remember Wani, the troop weeder whatever? Petroleum jelly salesman out of Brookline? Wani's a retired pilot from the service, from a bomber squadron. Wani, we's down at the pub that night. Wani says, he says, that 73 sounded just like fucking bombs sounded. That kind of quacking thwump when they hit to the boys in the squad when in the planes when they let them go. The radio show right before Madam Psychosis's midnight show on MIT's semi-underground WYYY is Those Were the Legends That Formerly Were, one of those cruel tech collegiate formats where any U.S. student who wants to can dart over from the Super Collider Lab or the Fourier Transform Study Group for 15 minutes, and read on air some parodic thing where he'd pretend to be his own dad, apotheosizing, some sort of thick-necked historic athletic figure the dad had admired, and had by implication compared with woeful distaste to the pencil-necked, big-headed, asthmatic little kid staring up through Coke bottle lenses from his digital keyboard. The show's only rule is that you have to read your thing in the voice of some really silly cartoon character. There are other rather more exotic, patricidal formats for Asian, Latin, Arab, and European students on select weekend evenings. The consensus is Asian cartoon characters have the silliest voices. Albeit literally sophomoric, those were the legends, is a useful drama therapy type catharsis op. MIT students tend to carry their own special psychic scars. Nerd, geek, dweeb, Wonk, fag, weenie, four eyes, spazola, limp dick, needle dick, dickless, dick nose, pencil neck. Getting your violin or laptop TP or entomologist's kill jar broken over your large head by thick necked kids on the playground. And the show pulls down solid FM ratings. Though a lot of that's due to reverse inertia, like Newton's second law, like backward shove from the rapidly popular Madam Psychosis Hour, Monday through Friday, from zero hundred hours to o one hundred hours, which it precedes. YDAU's WYYY Late Shift Student Engineer, 
unfond of any elevator that follows a serpentine or vascular path, eschews the MIT Student Union's elevator. He has an arrival routine, where he skips the front entrances and comes in through the south side's acoustic meatus and gets a millennial fizzy out of the vending machine in the cephanoid sinus, then descends creaky back wooden stairs from the Massa Intermedia's reading room down to about the infundibular recess, past the Tech Talk Daily CD-ROM student paper's production floor and the sick chemical smell of the read-only cartridge presses developer, down past the epiglottal Hillel Club's dark and star-doored HQ, past the heavier door to the tiled lattice of hallways to the squash and racquetball courts, and one volleyball court and the airy corpus callosum of twenty-four high-ceiling tennis courts and down by an MIT alum, and now so little used they don't even know now where the nets are, down three more levels to the ghostly clean and lithium-lit studios of FM 109 WYYYFM, broadcasting for the MIT community and selected points beyond. The studio's walls are pink and laryngeally fissured. His asthma's better down here, the air thin and keen, the tracheal air filters just below the flooring, and the ventilator's air the freshest in the union. The engineer, a work-study graduate student with bagged lungs and occluded pores, settles alone at his panel in the engineer's booth, adjusts a couple needles bob, and sound checks the only paid personality on the nightly docket, the darkly revered Madame Psychosis, whose cameo shadow is just visible outside the booth's thick glass. Her screen, half obscuring the on-air studio's bank of phones, checking queuing and transition for the Thursday edition. She is hidden from all view by a jointed triptych screen of cream chiffon that glows red and green in the lights of the phone bank and the queuing panel's dials and frames her silhouette. The silhouette is cleanly limbed against the screen, sitting cross-legged in its insectile microphonic headset, smoking. The engineer always has to tighten his own headset's cranial band down from the those were engineer's mammoth parietal breadth. He activates the intercom and offers to check Madame Psychosis's levels. He requests sound. Anything at all. He hasn't opened his can of pop. There is a long silence during which Madame Psychosis's silhouette doesn't look up from something. She looks like she's collating at her little desk. After a while, she makes some little sounds. Little plosives to check for roaring sounds and exhalations. A perennial problem in low-budget FM. She makes a long S sound. The student engineer takes a hit from his portable inhaler. She says, He liked that sort of dreamy, dreaming music that had the rhythm of long things swinging. The engineer's movements at the panel's dials resemble someone adjusting the heater and sound system while driving. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. She says, The engineer, age 23, has extremely bad skin. Attractive paraplegic female seeks same. Object? The windowless laryngeal studio is terribly bright. Nothing casts a shadow. Recessed lit fluorescence with a dual-spectrum lithiumized corona, developed two buildings over and awaiting ONAN patent the chilly shadowless light of surgical theaters, convenience stores at 0400. The pink wrinkled walls sometimes look more gynecological than anything else. Like most marriages, theirs was the evolved product of concordance and compromise. The engineer shivers in the bright chill and lights a gasper of his own and tells Madame Psychosis through the intercom that the whole range of levels is fine. Madame Psychosis is the only WYYY personality who brings in her own headset and jacks, plus a triptic screen. Over the screen's left section are four clocks set for different zones, plus a numberless disc someone hung for a joke, to designate the annularized Great Concavity's no time. 
the EST clock's trackable hand, carves off the last few seconds from the five minutes of dead air Madame Psychosis's contract stipulates gets to precede her show. You can see her silhouette putting out the cigarette very methodically. She cues tonight's synthesized bumper and theme music. The engineer flicks a lever and pumps the music up the coaxial medulla, and through the amps and boosters, packed into the crawl spaces above the high, false ceiling of the corpus callosum's idle tennis courts, and up and out, the aerial that protrudes from the gray and bulbous surface of the Union's roof. Institutional design has come a ways from I.M. Pay, MIT's near-new student union, off the corner of Ames and Memorial Drive, East Cambridge, is one enormous cerebral cortex of reinforced concrete and polymer compounds. Sixty. Madame Psychosis is smoking again, listening, head cocked. Her tall screen will leak smoke for her show's whole hour. The student engineer is counting down from five. On an outstretched hand, he can't see how she sees. And as Pinky meets Palm, she says what she said for three years of midnights, an opening bit that Mario Incandenza, the least cynical person in the history of Enfield, Massachusetts, across the river, listening faithfully, finds, for all its black cynicism, terribly compelling. Her silhouette leans and says, And lo, for the earth was empty of form, and void, and darkness was all over the face of the deep. And we said, Look at that fucker dance. A toneless male voice is then cued in to say it's sixty minutes, more or less, with Madame Psychosis on YYY-109, largest whole prime on the FM band. The different sounds are encoded and pumped by the student engineer, up to the building's corpus and out the roof's aerial. This aerial, low watt, has been rigged by the station's EM weenies to tilt and spin, not unlike a centrifugal theme park-type ride, spraying the signal in all directions. Since the BS 1966 Hunt Act, the low watt fringes of the FM band are the only part of the wireless spectrum still licensed for public broadcast. The deep water green of FM tuners all over the campus's labs and dorms and barnacle clots of grad apartments align themselves slowly toward the spatter's center, moving toward the dial's right, a little creepily, like plants toward light they can't even see. Ratings are minor league by the pre-interlaced broadcast standards of yore, but they are rock-solid consistent. Audience demand for Madame Psychosis has been, from the very start, inelastic. The aerial, inclined at about the angle of a three-kilometer cannon, spins in a blurred ellipse. Its rotary base is elliptical because that's the only shape the EM weenies could rig a mold for. Obstructed on all sides by the tall buildings of East Cambridge and Commercial Drive and Sirius downtown, though, only a couple thin pie slices of signal escape MIT proper. For example, through the P.E. department gap of barely used lacrosse and soccer fields between the philology and low-temp physics complexes on Memorial Drive, and then across the florid purple nighttime breadth of the historic Charles River, then through the heavy flow of traffic on Starrow Drive on the Chuck's other side, so that by the time the signal laps at Upper Brighton and Enfield, you need almost surveillance-grade antenation to filter it in, out of the E.M. miasma of cellular and interconsole phone transmissions, and TP's EM auras that crowd the FM fringes from every side. Unless, that is, your tuner is lucky enough to be located at the apex of a tall and more or less denuded hill in Enfield, in which case you find yourself right in YYY's centrifugal line of fire. Madame Psychosis eschews chatty openings and contextual filler. Her hour is compact and no-nonsense. After the music fades, her shadow holds collated sheets up and riffles them slightly, so the sound of paper is broadcast. Obesity, she says. Obesity with hypogonadism. Also morbid obesity. Nodular leprosy with leonine facies. The engineer can see her silhouette lift a cup as she pauses, 
which reminds him of the millennial fizzy in his book bag. She says, The acromegalic and hypokeratocystic, the enuretic, this year of all years, the spasmodically torticolic. The student engineer, a pre-doctoral transuranial metallurgist, working off massive GSL debt, locks the levels and fills out the left side of his timesheet and ascends with his book bag through a triage of interneural stairways with Semitic ideograms and developer smell and past snack bar and billiard hall and modem banks and extensive student counseling offices around the rostral lamina, all the little-used many-stared neuroform way up to the artery-red fire door of the union's rooftop, leaving Madame Psychosis, as is S.O.P., alone with her show and scream and the shadowless chill. She's mostly alone in there when she's on air. Every so often there's a guest, but the guest will usually get introduced and then not say anything. The monologues seem both free associative and intricately structured, not unlike nightmares. There's no telling what'll be up on a given night. If there's one even remotely consistent theme, it's maybe film and film cartridges. Early and mostly Italian, neorealist and mostly German, expressionist celluloid film. Never new wave. Thumbs up on Peterson Broughton and Dali Boonwell and down on Darren Hamid. Passionate about Antonioni's slower stuff and some Russian guy named Tarkovsky, sometimes Ozu and Bresson, odd affection for the hoary dramaturgy of one Sir Herbert Tree, bizarre Kalesque admiration for Gormeister's Peckinpah, De Palma, Tarantino, positively poisonous on the subject of Fellini's Eight and a Half, exceptionally conversant with regard to avant-garde celluloid and avant and Apregard digital cartridges, anti-confluential cinema, brutalism, found drama, etc. 61. Also highly literate on U.S. sports, football in particular, which fact the student engineer finds dissonant. Madam takes one phone call per show at random. Mostly she solos. The show kind of flies itself. She could do it in her sleep. Behind the screen. Sometimes she seems very sad. The engineer likes to monitor the broadcast from a height, the union's rooftop, summer sun and winter wind. The more correct term for an asthmatic's inhaler is nebulizer. The engineer's graduate research specialty is the carbonated, translithium particles created and destroyed billions of times a second in the core of a cold fusion ring. Most of the lithioids can't be smashed or studied and exist mostly to explain gaps and incongruities in annulation equations. Once last year, Madame Psychosis had the student engineer write out the home lab process for turning uranium oxide powder into good old fissionable U-235. Then she read it on the air between a Baraka poem and a critique of the Steeler Defense's double-slot secondary. It's something a bright high schooler could cook and took less than three minutes to read on air and didn't involve one classified procedure or one piece of hardware not gettable from any decent chemical supply outlet in Boston. But there was no small unpleasantness about it from the MIT administration, which, it's well known, MIT is in bed with defense. The hot fuel recipe was the one bit of verbal intercourse the engineers had with Madam Psychosis that didn't involve straight levels and cues. The Union's soft latex polymer roof is cerebrally domed and a cloudy piamater pink except in spots where it's eroded down to pasty gray and everywhere textured, the bulging rooftop, with sulci and bulbous convolutions. From the air it looks wrinkled. From the roof's fire door it's an almost nauseous system of Serpentine trenches, like water slides in hell. The union itself, the late A.Y. V.F. Rickey's Summum Opus, is a great hollow brain frame, 
an endowed memorial to the North American seat of very high tech, and is not as ghastly as out-of-towners suppose it must be. Though the vitreally inflated balloon eyes, deorbited and hung by twined blue cords from the second floor's optic chiasmi to flank the wheelchair-accessible front ramp, take a bit of getting used to. And some, like the engineer, never do get comfortable with them and use the less garish auditory side doors. And the abundant sulcus fissures and gyrus bulges of the slick latex roof make rain drainage complex and footing chancy at best. So there's not a whole lot of recreational strolling up here, although a kind of safety balcony of skull-colored polybutylene resin which curves around the midbrain from the inferior frontal sulcus to the parietal occipital sulcus, a halo-ish ring at the level of, like, eaves, demanded by the Cambridge Fire Department over the heated, chromometic protests of topological rickyites over in the architecture department, which the MIT administration, trying to placate rickyites and CFD fire marshal both, had had the pre-molded resin injected with dyes to render it the distinctively icky, brown-shot, off-white of living skull, so that the balcony resembles at once corporeal bone and numinous aura, which balcony means that even the worst latex slip-and-slide off the steeply curved cerebrum's edge would mean a fall of only a few meters to the broad butylene platform, from which a Venus-blue emergency ladder can be detached and lowered to extend down past the superior temporal gyrus and pons and abducent to hook up with the polyurethane basilar stem artery and allow a safe shimmy down to the good old oblongata, just outside the rubberized meatus at ground zero. Topside in the bitter river wind, wearing a khaki parka with a fake fur fringe, the student engineer makes his way and settles into the first intraparietal sulcus that catches his fancy, makes a kind of nest in the soft trench, the convoluted latex is filled with those little non-FHC styrofoam peanuts everything industrially soft is filled with, and the Piamata surface gives, rather like one of those old beanbag chairs of more innocent times, settles in, and back with his millennial fizzy, and inhaler, and cigarette, and pocket-sized Heathkit digital FM band receiver, under a high CO night sky that makes the star's points look extra sharp. The Boston PM is 10 degrees Celsius. The post-central sulcus he sits in is just outside the circumference of the YYY aerial's high-speed spin. So, five meters overhead, its tip's aircraft light describes a blurred oval, vascularly hued. His FM receiver is power cells, tested daily against the low-temp lab's mercuric resistors, are fresh. The wooferless tuners sound tinny and crisp so that Madam sounds like a faithful but radically miniaturized copy of her studio self. Those with saddle noses, those with atrophic limbs, and yes, chemists and pure math majors, also those with atrophic necks. Sclerodema adulterum, them that seep, the serodermatotic, come one, come all, this circular says the hydrocephalic, the tabescent, and chiquetic, and anorexic, the Bragg's diseased, and their heavy red rinds of flesh, the derminally wine-stained, or carbuncular, or steatocryptotic, or, God forbid, all three. Marin Amat syndrome, you say? Come on down. The psoriatic, the exomatically shunned, and the scrofulodermic, bell-shaped styodopigiacs in your special slacks, afflictees of pityriasis rosia. It says here, Come all ye hateful, blessed are the poor in body, for they... The pulsing aircraft alert light of the aerial is magenta, a sharp and much closer star now, with his fingers laced behind his head, reclined and gazing upward, listening, the centrifugal whirl's speed making its tips light trail color across the eyes. The light's oval a bloody halo over the very barest of all possible heads. Madame Psychosis has done 
UHID stuff before once or twice. He is listening to her read four levels below the oblongated recess that becomes the heating shaft's nubbin of spine. Ad lib style reading from one of the PR circulars of the union of the hideously and improbably deformed. An agnostic style 12 step support group deal for what it calls the aesthetically challenged. 62. She sometimes reads circulars and catalogs and PR type things, though not regularly. Some things take several successive shows to get through. Ratings, stay solid. Listeners hang in. The engineer's pretty sure he'd hang in even if he weren't paid to. He does like to settle into a sulcus and smoke slowly and exhale up past the blurred ready lips of the aerial, monitoring. Madam's themes are at once unpredictable and somehow rhythmic. More like probability waves for subhadronics than anything else. 63. The student engineer has never once seen Madam Psychosis enter or leave WYYY. She probably takes the elevator. It's 22 October in the ONANite year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. Like most marriages, Averill and the late James Incandenzas was an evolved product of concordance and compromise. And the scholastic curriculum at ETA is the product of negotiated compromises between Averill's academic hard assery and James's and Stitt's keen sense of athletic pragmatics. It is because of Averill, who quit MIT entirely and went down to half-time at Brandeis, and even turned down an extremely plummy-type stipended fellowship at Radcliffe's Bunting Institute that first year to design and assume the helm of ETA's curriculum, that the Enfield Tennis Academy is the only athletic-focused type school in North America that still adheres to the trivium and quadrivium of the hard-ass classical LAS tradition, and thus one of the very few extant sports academies that makes a real stab at being a genuine pre-college school and not just an iron curtainish jock factory. 64. But Stitt never let Incandenza forget what the place was supposed to be about, and so Averill's flinty Mensana pedagogy wasn't diluted so much as ad valorumized, pragmatically focused toward the Kopori potus type goals kids were coming up the hill to give their childhoods for. Some ETA twists Averill allowed into the classic LAS path are, for example, that the seven subjects of the T and Q are mixed and not divided into quadrivial upper class versus trivial aphibic. That ETA geometry classes pretty much ignore the study of closed figures, excepting rectangles, to concentrate, also except for Thorpe's trigonometry of cubes, which is elective and mostly aesthetic, for two increasingly brutal semesters on the involution and expansion of bare angles. That the quadrivial requirement of astronomy has, at ETA, become a two-term elementary optics survey, since vision issues are obviously more germane to the game, and since all the hardware required for everything from aphotic to apochromatic lens work were and are right there in the lab off the ComAd tunnel. Music's been pretty much bagged, plus the triviamoid fetish for classical oratory has by now at ETA been converted to a wide range of history and studio courses and various types of entertainment, mostly recorded film. Again, way too much of Incandenza's lavish equipment lying around not to exploit, plus the legally willed and endowed for perpetuity presence on the academic payroll of Mrs. Prickett, Mr. Ogilvy, Mr. Disney R. Leith, and Ms. Soma Richardson Levy O'Brien Chawaf the late founder-director's loyal sound engineer, best boy, production assistant, and third favorite actress, respectively. Plus, also, the six-term entertainment requirement because students hoping to prepare for careers as professional athletes are, by intention, training also to be entertainers, albeit of a deep and special sort, was in Condensa's line, one of the few philosophical points he had to pretty much ram down the throats of both Avril and Stitt. 
who was pushing hard for some mix of theology and the very grim ethics of Kant. Mario Incandenza has sat in on a back row stool for every session of an ETA entertainment department offering ever since he was finally, three years ago December, asked to disenroll from the Winter Hill Special School in Cambridgeport for cheerfully declining even to try to learn to really read, explaining he'd way rather listen and watch. And he is a fanatical listener-observer. He treats the lavish Tatsuoka fringe FM band tuner in the living room of the headmaster's house, like kids of three generations past, listening the way other kids watch TP, opting for mono, and sitting right up close to one of the speakers, with his head cocked, dog-like, listening, staring into that special pocket of near-middle distance, reserved for the serious listener. He really does have to sit right up close to listen to 60 minutes, more or less, when he's over at the headmaster's house, with C.T. and sometimes Hal, at his mother's late suppers, because Averill has some auditory thing about broadcast sound, and gets the howling phantods from any voice that does not exit a living corporeal head. 65. And though Averill's made it clear that Mario's free at any time to activate and align the Tatsuoka's ghostly green tuner to whatever he wishes, he keeps the volume so low that he has to be lowered onto a low coffee table and lean in and almost put his ear up against the wolfer's tremble and concentrate closely to hear YYY's signal over the conversation in the dining room, which tends to get sort of manically high-pitched toward the end of supper. Avril never actually asks Mario to keep it down. He does it out of unspoken consideration for her thing about sound. Another of her unspoken but stressful things involves issues of enclosure, and the headmaster's house has no interior doors between rooms, and not even much in the way of walls, and the living and dining rooms are separated only by a vast multi-leveled tangle of houseplants in pots, and on little stools of different heights, and arrayed under hanging UV lamps of an intensity that tends to give the diners strange little patterns of tan that differ according to where someone usually sits at the table. Al sometimes complains privately to Mario that he gets more than enough UV during the day, thank you very much. The plants are incredibly lush and hale and sometimes threaten to block off the whole easement from dining to living room, and the rope-handled Brazilian machete CT had mounted on the wall by the tremulous china case has stopped really being a joke. The moms calls the houseplants her green babies, and she has a rather spectacular thumb, plant-wise, for a Canadian. The leucodermatic, the xanthodantic, the maxillofacially swollen, those with distorted orbits of all kinds. Get out from under the sun's cove lighting, is what this says. Come in from the spectral rain. Madam Psychosis's broadcast accent is not Boston. There are R's, for one thing, and there is no cultured Cambridge stutter. It's the accent of someone who spent time either losing a southern lilt or cultivating one. It's not flat and twangy like Stice's, and it's not a drawl like the people at Gainesville's Academy. Her voice itself is sparely modulated and strangely empty as if she were speaking from inside a small box. It's not bored, or laconic, or ironic, or tongue-in-cheek. The basilisk-breathed, and pyreic. It's reflective, but not judgmental, somehow. Her voice seems low-depth familiar to Mario, the way certain childhood smells will strike you as familiar, and oddly sad. All ye peronic or teratoidal, the phrenologically malformed, the suppuratively lesioned, the endocrinologically malodorous of whatever ilk. Run, don't walk on down. The acerbulous nosed, the radically ectomied, the morbidly diaphoretic with a hanky in every pocket, the chronically granulomatous. The ones, it says here, the ones the cruel call two-baggers, one bag for your head, 
One bag for the observer's head in case your bag falls off. The hated and dateless and shunned who keep to the shadows. Those who undress only in front of their pets. The, quote, aesthetically challenged. Leave your lazarettes and oubliettes, I'm reading this right here, your closets and cellars and TP tableaus. Find nurturing and support and the inner resources to face your own unblinking sight, is what this goes on to say. A bit overheatedly, maybe. Is it our place to say? It says here, hugs, not uggs. It says, come don the veil of the type and token. Come learn to love what's hidden inside, to hold and cherish. The almost unbelievably thick-ankled, the kyphotic and lordotic, the irremediably cellulitic. It says, progress, not perfection. It says, never perfection. The fatally pulchritudinous welcome. The actionizing side by side with the medusoid. The papuled, the macular, the albinic. Medusas and odalisks both come find common ground. All meeting rooms windowless. That's in italics. All meeting rooms windowless. Plus, the music she's cued for this inflectionless reading is weirdly compelling. You can never predict what it will be, but over time some kind of pattern emerges, a trend or rhythm. Tonight's background fits somehow, as she reads. There's not any real forwardness to it. You don't sense it's straining to get anywhere. The thing it makes you see as she reads is something heavy, swinging slowly at the end of a long rope. It's minor key enough to be eerie against the empty lilt of the voice and the clinks of tines and china, as Mario's relations eat turkey salad and steamed croziers and drink lager and milk and vin blanc from Hull over behind the plants bathed in purple light. Mario can see the back of the mom's head high above the table, and then over to the left Hal's bigger right arm, and then Hal's profile when he lowers it to eat. There's a ball by his plate. The ETA players seem to need to eat six or seven times a day. Hal and Mario had walked over for 2100 supper at the headmaster's house, after Hal had read something for Mr. Leith's class, and then disappeared for about half an hour while Mario stood supported by his police lock and waited for him. Mario rubs his nose with the heel of his hand. Madame Psychosis has an unironic but generally gloomy outlook on the universe in general. One of the reasons Mario's obsessed with her show is that he's somehow sure Madame Psychosis cannot herself sense the compelling beauty and light she projects over the air somehow. He has visions of interfacing with her and telling her she'd feel a lot better if she'd listened to her own show, he bets. Madame Psychosis is one of only two people Mario would love to talk to, but would be scared to try. The word periodic pops into his head. Hey, Hal, he calls across the plants. Like for months in the spring semester of YDPAH, she referred to her own program as Madam's Downer Lit Hour and read depressing book after depressing book. Good Morning, Midnight, and Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, and Giovanni's Room, and Under the Volcano, plus a truly ghastly Brett Ellis period during Lent in a monotone, really slowly, night after night. Mario sits on the low little Vandero knock-off coffee table with bowed legs, with the table, with his head cocked right up next to the speaker and his claws in his lap. His toes tend to point inward when he sits. The background music is both predictable and, within that predictability, surprising. It's periodic. It suggests expansion without really expanding. It leads up to the exact kind of inevitability it denies. It is heavily digital, but with something of a choral bouquet. But unhuman. Mario thinks of the word haunting, like in a haunting echo of thus and such. 
Madame Psychosis's cued music, which the student engineer never chooses or even sees her bring in, is always terribly obscure. 66. But often, just as queerly powerful and compelling as her voice and show itself, the MIT community feels, it tends to give you the feeling there's an in-joke that you and she alone are in on. Very few devoted WYYY listeners sleep well Monday through Friday. Mario has horizontal breathing trouble sometimes, but other than that he sleeps like a babe. Avril and Condenza still sticks with the old Lillet region practice of taking just tea and nibbles at U.S. supper time and waiting to eat seriously until right before bed. Cultured Canadians tend to think vertical digestion makes the mind unkeen. Some of Oren and Mario and Hal's earliest memories are of nodding off at the dining room table and being gently carried by a very tall man to bed. This was in a different house. Madame Psychosis's cued musics stir very early memories of Mario's father. Averill is more than willing to take some good-natured guff about her inability to eat before, like, twenty-two thirty hours. Prandial music holds little charm or associations for Hal, who, like most of the kids on double daily drills, makes fists around his utensils and eats like a wild dog. Nor are excluded the utterly noseless, or the hideously wall and cross-eyed, nor either the ergotic of St. Anthony, the leprous, the very celliformally eruptive, or even the sarcomate of Kaposi. Hal and Mario proudly eat slash listen late over at the headmaster's house twice a week. Avril likes to see them outside the awkward formality of her position at ETA. CT's the same at home and office. Both Avril and Tavis's bedrooms are on the second floor, as a matter of fact, right next to each other. The only other room up there is Avril's personal study, with a big color Xerox of M. Hamilton as Oz's West Witch on the door, and custom fiber wiring for a trimodem TP console. A stairway runs from her study down the back side of the headmaster's house, north, down to a tributary tunnel leading to the main tunnel to Com Ad, so Avril can commute over to ETA below ground. The headmaster's house tunnel connects with the main at a point between the pump room and Com Ad, meaning Avril never, like, hunches idly past the pump room, which, fact, Hal obviously endorses. Late suppers at the headmaster's house for Hal are limited by Delenn to twice-a-week tops, because they get him excused from dawn drills, which also means late-night mischief possibilities. Sometimes they bring Canada's John, no relation, Wayne, over with them, whom Mrs. I likes and speaks to animatedly, even though he rarely says anything the whole time he's there, and also eats like a wild dog, sometimes neglecting utensils altogether. Avril also likes it when Axford comes. Axford has a hard time eating, and she likes to exhort him to eat. Very rarely anymore does Hal bring Pemulus or Jim Struck, to whom Avril is so faultlessly, brittlely polite that the dining room's tension raises hair. Whenever Avril parts ficus leaves to check, Mario's still hunched, pigeon-toed, and cocked in the same RCA Victorish posture, with a little horizontal forehead crease that means he's either listening or thinking hard. The Multiple Amputee the prosthetically malmatched, the snaggle-toothed, waddled, weak-chinned, and walrus-cheeked, the palate-clefted, the really large poured, the excessively but not necessarily lycanthropically hirsute, the pin-headed, the convulsively teretic, the parkinsonianly tremulous, the stunted and gnarled, the teratoid of overall visage, the twisted, and hunched, and humped, and halitotic, the in any way asymmetrical, the rodential, and saurian, and equine-looking. Hey, Hal, the trinostraled, the invaginate of mouth and eye, those with those dark loose bags under their eyes that 
hang halfway down their faces. Those with Cushing's disease. Those who look like they have Down syndrome, even though they don't have Down syndrome. You decide. You be the judge. It says, you are welcome regardless of severity. Severity is in the eye of the sufferer, it says. Pain is pain. Crow's feet. Birthmark. Rhinoplasty that didn't take. Mole. Overbite. A bad hair year. The WYYY student engineer in his sulcus contemplates the moon, which looks sort of like a full moon that somebody's bashed in a little bit with a hammer. Madame Psychosis asks rhetorically whether the circulars left anyone out. The engineer finishes his fizzy and makes ready to descend again for the hour's close, his skin turned toward the terrible cerebral chill off the Charles, which is windy and blue. Sometimes Madame Psychosis takes one random call to start, sixty minutes more or less. Tonight the one caller she ends by taking has a cultured stutter and invites M.P. and the YYY community to consider the fact that the moon, which of course, as any sot knows, revolves around the earth, does not itself revolve. Is this true? He says it is. That it just stays there, hidden, and disclosed by our round shadow's rhythms, but never revolving, that it never turns its face away. The little Heath kit can't receive signals inside the cerebrum's subdural stairwells during descent, but the student engineer can anticipate she'll make no direct reply. Her sign-off is more dead air. She almost reminds the engineer of certain types in high school whom everyone adored because you sensed it made no difference to them whether you adored them. It had sure made a difference to the engineer, though, who hadn't been invited to even one graduation party with his inhaler and skin. The dessert Avril serves when Hal's over is Mrs. Clark's infamous high-protein gelatin squares, available in bright red or bright green, sort of like jello on steroids. Mario's wild for them. C.T. clears the table and loads the dishwasher, since he didn't cook, and Hal gets into his coat at, like, Oh, one hundred and one hours. Mario is still listening to the WYYY nightly sign-off, which takes a while because they not only list the station's kilowattage specs, but go through proofs for the formulae by which the specs are derived. CT always drops at least one plate out in the kitchen and then bellows. Avril always brings some hell jello squares into Mario and adopts a mock dry tone and tells Hal it's been reasonably nice to see him outside, Le Batiment Sanctifié. The whole thing to Hal sometimes gets ritualistic and almost hallucinatory, the post-prandial farewell routine. Hal stands under the big framed poster of Metropolis, and whomps his gloves together casually, and tells Mario there's no reason for him to leave too. Hal's going to blast down the hill for a bit. Avril... And Mario always smile, and Avril asks casually what his plans are. Hal always whumps his gloves together and smiles up at her and says, Make trouble? And Avril always puts on a sort of mock stern expression and says, Do not, under any circumstances, have fun. Which Mario still always finds clutch your stomach funny, every time, week after week. Ennett House Drug and Alcohol Recovery House is the sixth of seven exterior units on the grounds of an Enfield Marine Public Health Hospital complex that, from the height of an ATH SCME 2100 Industrial Displacement Fan or Enfield Tennis Academy's hilltop, resembles seven moons orbiting a dead planet. The hospital building itself a VA facility of iron-colored brick and steep slate roofs, is closed and cordoned, bright pine boards nailed across every possible access and aperture, with really stern government signs about trespassing. Enfield Marine was built during either World War II or Korea, when there were ample casualties and much convalescence. About the only people who use the Enfield Marine complex in a VA-related way now seem to be wild-eyed old Vietnam veterans in fatigue jackets, de-sleeved to make vests, 
or else drastically old Korea vets who are now senile or terminally alcoholic or both. The hospital building itself, stripped of equipment and copper wire, defunct, and Field Marines stay solvent by maintaining several smaller buildings on the complex's grounds. Buildings the size of, like, prosperous homes, which are used to house VA doctors and support staff, and leasing them to different state-related health agencies and services. Each building has a unit number that increases with the unit's distance from the defunct hospital and with its proximity along a rutted Sunan roadlet that extends back from the hospital's parking lot to a steep ravine that overlooks a particularly unpleasant part of Brighton, Massachusetts, Commonwealth Avenue, and its Green Line train tracks. Unit number one, right by the lot in the hospital's afternoon shadow, is leased by some agency that seems to employ only guys who wear turtlenecks. The place counsels wild-eyed Vietnam vets for certain very delayed stress disorders and dispenses various pacifying medications. Unit number two, right next door, is a methadone clinic overseen by the same Massachusetts Division of Substance Abuse Services that licenses Ennett House. Customers for the services of units number one and number two arrive around sunup and form long lines. The customers for unit number one tend to congregate in like-minded groups of three or four and gesture a lot and look wild-eyed and generally pissed off in some broad geopolitical way. The customers for the methadone clinic tend to arrive looking even angrier, as a rule, and their early morning eyes tend to bulge and flutter like the eyes of the choked. But they do not congregate, rather stand or lean along number two's long walkways railing, arms crossed, alone, brooding, solo acts, standoffish. Fifty or sixty people all managing to form a line on a narrow walkway, waiting for the same small building to unlock its narrow front door, and yet still managing to appear alone and standoffish is a strange sight. And if Don Gately had ever once seen a ballet, he would, as an Ennett House resident, from his sunup smoking station on the fire escape outside the five-man bedroom upstairs, have seen the movements and postures necessary to maintain this isolation in union as balletic. The other big difference between units number one and number two is that the customers of number two leave the building deeply changed, their eyes not only back in their heads but peaceful, if a bit glazed, but anyway, in general, just way better put together than when they arrived, while number one's wild-eyed patrons tend to exit number one looking even more stressed and historically aggrieved than when they went in. When Don Gately was in the very early part of his Ennett House residency, he almost got discharged for teaming up with a bad news methadrine addict from New Bedford and sneaking out after curfew across the EMPHH complex in the middle of the night to attach a big sign on the narrow front door of Unit Number Two's methadone clinic. The sign said, Closed until further notice. By order, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The first staffer at the methadone clinic doesn't get there to open up until 0800 hours. And yet it's been mentioned how number two's customers always begin to show up with twisting hands and bulging eyes at, like, dawn to wait. And Gately and the speed freak from New Bedford had never seen anything like the psychic crises and near riot among these semi-ex-junkies. Pallid, blade-slender, chain-smoking homosexuals and bearded bruiser types and leather berets, women with mohawks and multiple sticks of gum in, upscale trust fund fritterers with shiny cars and computerized jewelry who derived, as they'd been doing like hyper-conditioned rats for years, many of them, arrived at sunup with their eyes protruding and with Kleenexes at their noses and scratching their arms and standing on first one foot and then the other, doing basically everything but truly congregating wild for chemical relief, ready to stand in the cold, exhaling steam for hours for that relief, who'd arrived with the sun and now seemed to be informed that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was suddenly going to withdraw the prospect of that relief until, and this is what really seemed to drive them right over the edge, out there in the lot, until further notice. 
ape shit has rarely enjoyed so literal a denotation. At the sound of the first window pane breaking, and the sight of a blown out old whore trying to hit a leather vested biker with an old pre metric grass grows by inches but it dies by feet sign from number two's clinic's pathetic front lawn, the methadrine addict began laughing so hard that she dropped the binoculars from the end of house upstairs fire escape where they were watching at like oh six thirty hours, and the binoculars fell and hit the roof of one of the end of house counselors' cars right below in the little roadlet, with a ringing clunk, just as he was pulling in. The counselor, his name was Calvin Thrust, and he was four years sober and a former NYC porn actor who'd gone through the house himself, and now took absolutely zero in terms of shit from any of the residents, and his pride and joy was his customized vet, and the binoculars made rather a nasty dent, and plus they were the house manager's amateur ornithology binoculars and had been borrowed out of the back office without explicit permission. And the long fall and impact didn't do them a bit of good, to say the least. And Gately and the methadrine addict got pinched and put on full house restriction and very nearly kicked out. The addict from New Bedford picked up the emanating needle a couple of weeks after that anyway, and was discovered by a night staffer simultaneously playing air guitar and polishing the lids of all the donated canned goods in the house pantry way after lights out, stark naked, and sheened with meth sweat. Then after the formality of a urine, she was given the old administrative boot. Over a quarter of incoming Ennett House residents get discharged for a dirty urine within their first thirty days, and it's the same at all other Boston halfway houses. And the girl ended up back in New Bedford, and then within like three hours of hitting the streets, got picked up by... New Bedford's finest, on an old default warrant, and sent to Framingham Women's for a one-to-two bit, and got found one morning in her bunk, with a kitchen-rigged shiv protruding from her privates, and another in her neck, and a thoroughly eliminated personal map. And Gately's individual counselor, Jean M., brought Gately the news and invited him to see the methadrine addict's demise as a clear case of there but for the grace of God goeth D.W. Gately. Unit number three, across the roadlet from number two, is unoccupied but getting reconditioned for lease. It's not boarded up, and the infield marine maintenance guys go in there a couple days a week with tools and power cords and make a god-awful racket. Pat Matasian hasn't yet been able to find out what sort of group misfortune number three will be devoted to servicing. Unit number four, more or less equidistant from both the hospital parking lot and the steep ravine, is a repository for Alzheimer's patients with VA pensions. Number four's residents wear jammies 24-7, the diapers underneath giving them a lumpy and toddlerish aspect. The patients are frequently visible at number four's windows in jammies, splayed and open-mouthed, sometimes shrieking, sometimes just mutely open-mouthed, splayed against the windows. They give everybody at Ennett House the howling fantods. One ancient retired Air Force nurse does nothing but scream, Help! for hours at a time from a second-story window. Since the Ennett House residents are drilled in a Boston AA recovery program that places great emphasis on asking for help, the retired shrieking Air Force nurse is the object of a certain grim amusement sometimes. Not six weeks ago, a huge stolen Help Wanted sign was found attached to number four siding right below the retired shrieking nurse's window. And number four's director was less than amused and demanded that Pat Montesian determine and punish the end of house residents responsible. And Pat had delegated the investigation to Don Gately. And though Gately had a pretty good idea who the perps were, he didn't have the heart to really press and kick ass over something so much like what he'd done himself when new and cynical, and so the whole thing pretty much blew over. Unit number five, Kitty Corner, across the little street from Ennett House, is for catatonics and various vegetable-ish, fetal-positioned, mental patients, subcontracted to a Commonwealth outreach agency by overcrowded LTIs. Unit number five is referred to, for reasons Gately's never been able to pinpoint, as the Shed. 67. It is understandably 
a pretty quiet place. But in nice weather, when its more portable inmates are carried out and placed in the front lawn to take the air, standing there, propped up and staring, they present a tableau it took Gately some time to get used to. A couple newer residents got discharged late in Gately's treatment, for tossing firecrackers into the crowd of catatonics on the lawn to see if they could get them to jump around or display affect. On warm nights, one long-limbed, bespectacled lady who seems more autistic than catatonic tends to wander out of the shed wrapped in a bedsheet and lay her hands on the thin, shiny bark of a silver maple in number five's lawn, stands there touching the tree until she's missed at bed check and retrieved. And since Gately graduated treatment and took the offer of a live-in staffer's job at Ennett House, he sometimes wakes up in his staff cellar bedroom down by the payphone and tonic machine, and looks out the sooty ground-level window by his bed and watches the catatonic, touching the tree in her sheet and glasses, illuminated by Commonwealth Avenue's neon, or the weird sodium light that spills down from the snooty tennis prep school overhead on its hill. He'll watch her, standing there, and feel an odd, chilled empathy he tries not to associate with watching his mother pass out on some piece of living room chintz. Unit number six, right up against the ravine on the end of the rutted road's east side, is Ennett House Drug and Alcohol Recovery House. Three stories of whitewashed New England brick, with the brick showing in patches through the whitewash, a mansard roof that sheds green shingles, a scabrous fire escape at each upper window, and a back door no resident is allowed to use, and a front office around on the south side with huge protruding bay windows that yield a view of ravine weeds and the unpleasant stretch of Commonwealth Avenue. The front office is the director's office, and its bay windows, the house's single attractive feature, are kept spotless by whatever residents get front office windows for their weekly chore. The mansard's lower slope encloses attics on both the male and female sides of the house. The attics are accessed from trap doors in the ceiling of the second floor, and are filled to the beams with trash bags and trunks, the unclaimed possessions of residents who've up and vanished sometime during their term. The shrubbery all around in it houses first story looks explosive, ballooning in certain unpruned parts, and there are candy wrappers and styrofoam cups trapped throughout the shrub's green levels, and gaudy homemade curtains billow from the second story's female side's bedroom windows which are open what seems like all year round. Unit number seven is on the west side of the street's end, sunk in hill shadow and teetering right on the edge of the eroding ravine that leads down to the avenue. Number seven is in bad shape, boarded up and unmaintained and deeply slumped at the red roof's middle, as if shrugging its shoulders at some pointless indignity. For an Ennett House resident, entering Unit Number 7, which can easily be entered through the detachable pine board over an old kitchen window, is cause for immediate administrative discharge, since Unit Number 7 is infamous for being the place where Ennett House residents who want to secretly relapse with substances sneak in and absorb substances and apply visine and chlorets and then try to get back across the street in time for... 23.30 curfew without getting pinched. Behind unit number seven begins far and away the biggest hill in Enfield, Massachusetts. The hillside is fenced, off limits, densely wooded and without sanctioned path. Because a legit route involves walking north all the way up the rutted road through the parking lot, past the hospital, down the steep curved driveway to Warren Street, and all the way back south down Warren to Commonwealth, Almost half of all Ennett House residents negotiate Number 7's back fence and climb the hillside each morning, shortcutting their way to minimum wage temp jobs at, like, the Provident Nursing Home or Shuko Mist Medical Pressure Systems, etc., over the hill up Commonwealth, or custodial and kitchen jobs at the rich tennis school for blonde, gleaming tennis kids on what used to be the hilltop. Don Gately's been told that the school's Maze of tennis courts lies now on what used to be the hill's hilltop before the academy's burly, cigar-chomping tennis court contractors shaved the curved top off 
and rolled the new top flat. The whole long, loud process, sending all sorts of damaging avalanche-type debris, rolling down and all over Enfield Marines Unit Number Seven, something over which you can sure bet the Enfield Marine VA administration litigated years back. And but Gately doesn't know that ETA's balding of the hill is why Number Seven can still stand empty and unrepaired. Enfield Tennis Academy still has to pay full rent every month on what it almost buried. The sixth of November, year of the depend adult undergarment. Sixteen ten hours, ETA weight room, freestyle circuits, the clank and click of various resistance systems. Lyle on the towel dispenser, conferring with an extremely moist Graham Raider. Shocked, doing sit-ups, the board almost vertical, his face purple and forehead pulsing. Trolch. By the squat rack, blowing his nose into a towel. Coyle doing military presses with a bare bar. Carol Spotic curling, intent on the mirror. Raider nodding as Lyle bends and leans in. Howl up on the spotter shelf and back of the incline bench in the shadow of the monster copper beach, through the west window, doing single leg toe raises for the ankle. Ingersoll at the shoulder pull, steadily upping the weight against Lyle's advice. Keith, the Viking freer, and the steroidic, fifteen-year-old Elliot Cornspan, spotting each other on massive barbell curls next to the water cooler's bench, taking turns, bellowing encouragement. Hal keeps pausing to lean down and spit into an old NASA glass on the floor by the little shelf. Sixty-eight. ETA trainer Barry Loach, walking around with a clipboard he doesn't write anything down on. But watching people intently and nodding a lot. Axford with one shoe off in the corner, doing something to his bare foot. Michael Pemulus seated cross-legged on the cooler's bench, just off Cornspan's left hip, doing facial isometrics, trying to eavesdrop on Lyle and Raider, wincing whenever Cornspan and Freer roar at each other. Three more! Get it up there! Whoa! Get that shit up there, man! Whoa! It raped your sister. It killed your fucking mother, man. <laughs> Do it! Pemulus makes his face very long for a while, and then very short and broad. Then, all sort of hollow and distended, like one of Bacon's popes. Well, suppose Pemulus can just make out Lyle. Suppose I were to give you a key ring with ten keys,、mm, with no, with a hundred keys, and I were to tell you that one of these keys will unlock it, this door we're imagining opening in onto all you want to be as a player. How many of the keys would you be willing to try? Trolch calls over to Pemulus. Do the delint jerking off face again. Pemulus, for a second, lets his mouth gape slackly, and his eyes roll way up and flutters his lids, moving his fist. Well, I'd try every darn one. Raider tells Lyle. <laughs> Motherfucker! Fucker! Pemulus's wince looks like a type of facial isometric. Do Bridget having a tantrum? Do shocked in a stall? Pemulus makes a shush finger. Lyle never whispers, but it's just about the same. Then you are willing to make mistakes, you see. You are saying you will accept ninety-nine percent error. The paralyzed perfectionist you say you are would stand there before that door, jingling the keys, afraid to try the first key. Pemulus pulls his lower lip down as far as it will go, and contracts his cheek muscles. Cords stand out on Freer's neck as he screams at Cornspan. There's a little hanging mist of spittle and sweat. Cornspan looks like he's about to have a stroke. There are ninety kilograms on the bar, which itself is twenty kilograms. One more, you fuck! Fuck it, take it! Fuck me! Fuck me! You fuck! Take the pain! 
Freer has one finger under the bar, barely helping. Cornspan's red face is leaping around on his skull. Carol Spodek's smaller bar goes silently up and down. Trolch comes over and sits down and saws at the back of his neck with a towel, looking up at Cornspan. I don't think all the curls I've ever done altogether add up to a hundred and ten, he said. Cornspan's making sounds that don't sound like they're coming from his throat. Yes! Yes! roars Freer. The bar crashes to the rubber floor, making Pemulus wince. Every vein on Cornspan stands out and pulses. His stomach looks pregnant. He puts his hands on his thighs and leans forward, a string of something hanging from his mouth. Way to fucking take it, baby, Freer says, going over to the box on the dispenser to get rosin for his hands, watching himself walk toward the mirror. Pamela starts very slowly to lean over toward Cornspan, looking around confidentially. He gets so his face is right up near the side of Cornspan's mesomorphic head and whispers, Hey, Elliot, hey. Cornspan, bent over, chest heaving, rolls his head a little his way. Pamulus whispers, Pussy. If, by the virtue of charity or the circumstance of desperation, you ever chance to spend a little time around a substance recovery halfway facility, like Enfield, Massachusetts, state-funded Ennett House, you will acquire many exotic new facts. You will find out that once Massachusetts Department of Social Services has taken a mother's children away for any period of time, they can always take them away again, DSS, like at will, empowered by nothing more than a certain signature stamped form, that is, once deemed unfit, no matter why or when or what's transpired in the meantime, there's nothing a mother can do. Or, for instance, the people addicted to a substance who abruptly stop ingesting the substance often suffer wicked papular acne, often for months afterward, as the accumulations of substance slowly leave the body. The staff will inform you that this is because the skin is actually the body's biggest excretory organ, or that chronic alcoholics' hearts are, for reasons no MD has been able to explain, swollen to nearly twice the size of civilians' human hearts, and they never again return to normal size. That there's a certain type of person who carries a picture of their therapist in their wallet. That, both a relief and kind of an odd letdown, Black penises tend to be the same general size as white penises on the whole. That not all U.S. males are circumcised. That you can cop a sort of thin, jittery, amphetaminic buzz if you rapidly consume three millennial fizzies and a whole package of Oreo cookies on an empty stomach. Keeping it down is required, however, for the buzz, which senior residents often neglect to tell newer residents that the chilling Hispanic term for whatever interior disorder drives the addict back again and again to the enslaving substance is Tecatogusano, which apparently connotes some kind of interior psychic worm that cannot be sated or killed. That black and Hispanic people can be as big or bigger racists than white people, and then can get even more hostile and unpleasant when this realization seems to surprise you. That it is possible, in sleep, for some roommates to secure a cigarette from their bedside pack, light it, smoke it down to the quick, and then extinguish it in their bedside ashtray, without once waking up and without setting anything on fire. You will be informed that this skill is usually acquired in penal institutions, which will lower your inclination to complain about the practice or that even flints, industrial-strength expandable foam earplugs, do not solve the problem of a snoring roommate if the roommate in question is so huge and so adnoidal that the snores in question also produce subsonic vibrations that arpeggio up and down your body and make your bunk jiggle like a motel bed you've put a quarter in. That females are capable of being just as vulgar about sexual and eliminatory functions as males that over 60% of all persons arrested for drug and alcohol-related offenses report being sexually abused as children, with two-thirds of the remaining 40% reporting that they cannot remember their childhoods in sufficient detail to report one way or the other on abuse. 
that you can weave hypnotic madam psychosis like harmonies around the minor D scream of a cheap vacuum cleaner, humming to yourself as you vacuum, if that's your chore. That some people really do look like rodents. That some drug addicted prostitutes have a harder time giving up prostitution than they have giving up drugs, with their explanation involving the two habits very different directions of currency flow. That there are just as many idioms for the female sex organ as there are for the male sex organ. That a little mentioned paradox of substance addiction is that once you are sufficiently enslaved by a substance to need to quit the substance in order to save your life, the enslaving substance has become so deeply important to you that you will all but lose your mind when it is taken away from you. Or that sometime after your substance of choice has been taken away from you in order to save your life, as you hunker down for required AM and PM prayers, you will find yourself beginning to pray to be allowed literally to lose your mind, to be able to wrap your mind in an old newspaper or something and leave it in an alley to shift for itself without you. That in Metro Boston, the idiom of choice for the male sex organ is unit, which is why Ennett House residents are wryly amused by EMPH hospitals' designations of its campus's buildings. That certain persons simply will not like you no matter what you do. Then, that most non-addicted adult civilians have already absorbed and accepted this fact, often rather early on. That no matter how smart you thought you were, you are actually way less smart than that. That AA and NA and CA's God does not apparently require that you believe in him, her, it, before he, she, it will help you. 69. That, pace macho bullshit, public male weeping is not only plenty masculine, but can actually feel good, reportedly. That sharing means talking, and taking somebody's inventory means criticizing that person, plus many additional pieces of recovery speak. That an important part of Halfway House human immunovirus prevention is not leaving a razor or toothbrush in communal bathrooms. That apparently a seasoned prostitute can, reportedly, apply a condom to a customer's unit so deftly he doesn't even know it's on until he's history, so to speak. That a double-layered steel portable strongbox with tri-tumblered lock for your razor and toothbrush can be had for under $35 U.S., or $38.50 O-N-A-N, via HomeNet hardware. And that Pat M., or the house manager, will let you use the back office's old TP to order one, if you put up a sustained enough squawk. That over 50% of persons with a substance addiction suffer from some other recognized form of psychiatric disorder, too. That some male prostitutes become so accustomed to enemas that they cannot have valid bowel movements without them. That a majority of Ennett House residents have at least one tattoo. That the significance of this datum is unanalyzable. That the Metro Boston street term for not having any money is sporting lint. That what elsewhere is known as informing or squealing or narking or ratting or ratting out is, on the streets of Metro Boston, known as eating cheese, presumably spun off from the associative nexus of rat. That nose, tongue, lip, and eyelid rings rarely require actual penetrative piercing. This is because of the wide variety of clip-on rings available. That nipple rings do require piercing, and that clitoris and glands rings are not things anyone thinks you really want to know the facts about. That sleeping can be a form of emotional escape, and can, with sustained effort, be abused. That female Chicanos are not called Chicanas. That it costs $225 U.S. to get a Massachusetts driver's license with your picture but not your name. That purposeful sleep deprivation can also be an abusable escape. That gambling can be an abusable escape, too. And work, shopping, and shoplifting. 
and sex, and abstention, and masturbation, and food, and exercise, and meditation slash prayer, and sitting so close to Enid House's old DEC TP cartridge viewer that the screen fills your whole vision, and the screen's static charge tickles your nose like a linty mitten. 70. That you do not have to like a person in order to learn from him, her, it. That loneliness is not a function of solitude. That it is possible to get so angry you really do see everything red. What a Texas catheter is. That some people really do steal, will steal things that are yours. That a lot of U.S. adults truly cannot read, not even a ROM hypertext phonics thing with help functions for every word. That clicky alliance and exclusion and gossip can be forms of escape. That logical validity is not a guarantee of truth. That evil people never believe they are evil, but rather that everyone else is evil. That it is possible to learn valuable things from a stupid person. That it takes effort to pay attention to any one stimulus for more than a few seconds. That you can, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, want to get high with your substance so bad that you think you will surely die if you don't, and but can just sit there with your hands writhing in your lap and face wet with craving, can want to get high but instead just sit there, wanting to but not, if that makes sense. And if you can gut it out and not hit the substance during the craving, the craving will eventually pass. It will go away, at least for a while. That it is statistically easier for low IQ people to kick an addiction than it is for high IQ people. That the Metro Boston street term for panhandling is stemming, and that it is regarded by some as a craft or art, and that professional stem artists actually have like little professional colloquia sometimes, little conventions in parks or public transport hubs at night where they get together and network and exchange feedback on trends and techniques and public relations, etc. That it is possible to abuse OTC cold and allergy remedies in an addictive manner. That NyQuil is over 50 proof. That boring activities become, perversely, much less boring if you concentrate intently on them. That if enough people in a silent room are drinking coffee, it is possible to make out the sound of steam coming off the coffee. That sometimes human beings have to just sit in one place and, like, hurt. That you will become way less concerned with what other people think of you when you realize how seldom they do. That there is such a thing as raw, unalloyed, agendaless kindness. That it is possible to fall asleep during an anxiety attack. That concentrating intently on anything is very hard work. That addiction is either a disease or a mental illness or a spiritual condition, as in poor of spirit, or an OCD-like disorder, or an affective or character disorder, and that over 75% of the veteran Boston AAs who want to convince you that it is a disease will make you sit down and watch them write disease on a piece of paper and then divide and hyphenate the word so that it becomes dis-ease. Then we'll stare at you as if expecting you to undergo some kind of blinding epiphanic realization, when really, as G. Day points tirelessly out to his counselors, Changing disease to dis-ease reduces a definition and explanation down to a simple description of a feeling, and rather a whiny, insipid one at that. That most substance-addicted people are also addicted to thinking, meaning they have a compulsive and unhealthy relationship with their own thinking. That the cute Boston AA term for addictive-type thinking is analysis paralysis. That cats will, in fact, get violent diarrhea if you feed them milk, contrary to the popular image of cats and milk. 
that it is simply more pleasant to be happy than to be pissed off. That 99% of compulsive thinkers' thinking is about themselves. That 99% of this self-directed thinking consists of imagining and then getting ready for things that are going to happen to them. And then, weirdly, that if they stop to think about it, that 100% of the things they spend 99% of their time and energy imagining and trying to prepare for all the contingencies and consequences of are never good. Then, that this connects, interestingly, with the early sobriety urge to pray for the literal loss of one's mind. In short, that 99% of the head's thinking activity consists of trying to scare the ever-living shit out of itself. That it is possible to make rather tasty poached eggs in a microwave oven. That the Metro Street term for really quite wonderful is pisser. That everybody's sneeze sounds different. That some people's moms never taught them to cover up or turn away when they sneeze. That no one who has been to prison is ever the same again. That you do not have to have sex with a person to get crabs from them. That a clean room feels better to be in than a dirty room. That the people to be most frightened of are the people who are the most frightened. That it takes great personal courage to let yourself appear weak. That you don't have to hit somebody even if you really, really want to. That no single individual moment is, in and of itself, unendurable. That nobody who's ever gotten sufficiently addictively enslaved by a substance to need to quit the substance, and has successfully quit it for a while and been straight, and but then has for whatever reason gone back and picked up the substance again, has ever reported being glad that they did it, used the substance again, and gotten re-enslaved. Not ever. That bit is a Metro Boston street term for a jail sentence, as in, Don G. was up in Billrick on a six-month bit. That it's impossible to kill fleas by hand. That it's possible to smoke so many cigarettes that you get little white ulcerations on your tongue. That the effects of too many cups of coffee are in no way pleasant or intoxicating. That pretty much everybody masturbates. Rather a lot, it turns out. That the cliché, I don't know who I am, unfortunately turns out to be more than a cliché. That it costs $330 U.S. to get a passport in a phony name. That other people can often see things about you that you yourself cannot see, even if those people are stupid. That you can obtain a major credit card with a phony name for $1,500 U.S., but that no one will give you a straight answer about whether this price includes a verifiable credit history and line of credit for when the cashier slides the phony card through the register's little verification modem with all sorts of burly security guards standing around. That having a lot of money does not immunize people from suffering or fear. That trying to dance sober is a whole different kettle of fish. That the term VIG is street argot for the bookmaker's commission on an illegal bet, usually 10%, that's either subtracted from your winnings or added to your debt. That certain sincerely devout and spiritually advanced people believe that the God of their understanding helps them find parking places and gives them advice on Massachusetts lottery numbers. That cockroaches can, up to a certain point, be lived with. That acceptance is usually more a matter of fatigue than anything else. That different people have radically different ideas of basic personal hygiene. That, perversely, it is often more fun to want something than to have it. That if you do something nice for somebody in secret, anonymously, without letting the person you did it for know it was you or anybody else, know what it was you did, or in any way or form trying to get credit for it, it's almost its own form of intoxicating buzz.
that anonymous generosity, too, can be abused. That having sex with someone you do not care for feels lonelier than not having sex in the first place afterward. That it is permissible to want. That everybody is identical in their secret unspoken belief that way deep down they are different from everyone else. That this isn't necessarily perverse. That there might not be angels, but there are people who might as well be angels. That God, unless you're Charlton Heston, or unhinged, or both, speaks and acts entirely through the vehicle of human beings, if there is a God. That God might regard the issue of whether you believe there's a God or not as fairly low in his, her, its list of things she, he, its interested in re you. That the smell of athlete's foot is sick sweet versus the smell of podiatric dry rot is sick sour. That a person, one with the disease or dis-ease, will do things under the influence of substances that he simply would not ever do sober, and that some consequences of these things cannot ever be erased or amended. 71. Felonies are an example of this, as are tattoos. Almost always gotten on impulse, tattoos are vividly, chillingly permanent. The shop-worn, act-in-haste, repented leisure, what seemed to have been almost custom-designed for the case of tattoos. For a while, the new resident, Tiny Ewell, got first keenly interested and then weirdly obsessed with people's tattoos, and he started going around to all the residents and outside people who hung around Ennett House to help keep straight, asking to check out their tattoos and wanting to hear about the circumstances surrounding each tattoo. These little spasms of obsession, like first with the exact definition of alcoholic, and then with Morris H.'s special Tollhouse cookies until the pancreatitis flare, then with the exact kinds of corners everybody made their bed up with. These were part of the way Tiny E. temporarily lost his mind when his enslaving substance was taken away. The tattoo thing started out with Tiny's white-collar amazement at just how many of the folks around Ennett House seemed to have tattoos. And the tattoos seemed like potent symbols of not only whatever they were pictures of, but also of the chilling irrevocability of intoxicated impulses. Because the whole thing about tattoos is that they're permanent, of course, irrevocable once gotten. Which, of course, the irrevocability of a tattoo is what jacks up the adrenaline of the intoxicated decision to sit down in the chair and actually get it, the tattoo. But the chilling thing about the intoxication is that it seems to make you consider only the adrenaline of the moment itself, not, in any depth, the irrevocability that produces the adrenaline. It's like the intoxication keeps your tattoo-type class person from being able to project his imagination past the adrenaline of the impulse and even consider the permanent consequences that are producing the buzz of excitement. Tiny Yule will put this same abstract but not very profound idea in a whole number of varied ways, over and over, obsessively almost, and still fail to get any of the tattooed residents interested, although Bruce Green will listen politely. And the clinically depressed Kate Gompert usually won't have the juice to get up and walk away when Tiny starts in, which makes Yule seek her out vis-a-vis -vis tattoos, though she hasn't got a tattoo. But they don't have any problem with showing Tiny their tats, the residents with tats don't, unless they're female, and the thing is in some sort of area where there's a boundary issue. As Tiny Yule comes to see it, people with tattoos fall under two broad headings. First, there are the younger, scrofulous, boneheaded, black t-shirt and spiked bracelet types, who do not have the sense to regret the impulsive permanency of their tats and will show them off to you with the same fake, quiet pride with which someone more of Ewell's own social stratum would show off their collection of dynastic crockery or fine Sauvignon. Then there are the more numerous and older second types, who'll show you their tattoos with a sort of stoic regret, 
albeit tinged with a bit of self-conscious pride about the stoicism, that a purple-hearted veteran displays toward his old wounds scars. Resident Wade McDade has complex nests of blue and red serpents running down the insides of both his arms, and is required to wear long-sleeved shirts every day to his menial job at Store 24, even though the store's heat always loses its mind in the early a.m., and it's always wicked motherfucking hot in there, because the store's Pakistani manager believes his customers will not wish to purchase Marlboro Lights and Massachusetts Gigabucks lottery tickets from someone with vascular-colored snakes writhing all over his arms. 72. McDade also has a flaming skull on his left shoulder blade. Duning Lin has the faint remnants of a black dotted line tattooed all the way around his neck at about Adam's apple height, with instruction manual-like directions for the removal of his head and maintenance of the disengaged head tattooed on his scalp from the days of his skinhead youth, which now the tattooed directions take patience and a comb and three of April Cortelieu's barrettes for Tiny even to see. Actually, a couple of weeks into the obsession, Ewell broadens his dermotaxonomy to include a third category, bikers, of whom there are presently none in Ennett House, but plenty around the area's AA meetings, in beards and leather vests and apparently having to meet some kind of weight requirement of at least 200 kilos. Bikers is the Metro Boston street term for them, though they seem to refer to themselves usually as Scooter puppies, a term which, you will find out the hard way, non-bikers are not invited to use. These guys are veritable one-man tattoo festivals, but when they show them to you, they're disconcerting because they'll bear their tats with the complete absence of affect of somebody just showing you like a limb or a thumb, not quite sure why you want to see or even what it is you're looking at. A like N.B. that you'll end up inserting under the heading biker is that every professional tattooist, everybody who can remember getting their tattoos remembers getting them from, was, from the sound of everybody's general descriptions, a biker. With regards to the stoic regret group within Ennett House, it emerges that the male tattoos with women's names on them tend, in their irrevocability, to be especially disastrous and regretful given the extremely provisional nature of most addicts' relationships. Bruce Green will have Mildred Bonk on his jilted right triceps forever. Likewise, the Doris in red-dripping Gothic script just below the left breast of Emil Minty, who, yes, apparently did love once. Minty also has a palsied and amateur swastika with the caption, Fuck niggers with one G, on a left biceps, he is heartily encouraged to keep covered as a resident. Chandler Foss has an undulating banner with a redly inscribed Mary on one forearm. Set banner now mangled and necrotic because Foss, dumped and badly coked out one night, tried to nullify the romantic connotations of the tat by inscribing Blessed Virgin above the Mary with a razor blade and a red bick, with predictably ghastly results. Real tattoo artists, Ewell gets this on authority after a white flag group meeting from a biker whose triceps tattoo of a huge disembodied female breast being painfully squeezed by a disembodied hand, which is itself tattooed with a disembodied breast and hand, communicates real tattoo credibility, as far as Tiny's concerned. Real tat artists are always highly trained professionals. What's sad about the gorgeous violet arrow-pierced heart with Pamela incised in a circle around it on Randy Lentz's right hip is that Lentz has no memory either of the tattoo impulse and procedure or of anybody named Pamela. Charlotte Treat has a small green dragon on her calf and another tattoo on a breast she set a boundary about letting Tiny see. Esther Thrale has an amazingly detailed blue and green tattoo of the planet Earth on her stomach, its poles abutting pubis and breasts, an equatorial view of which caused Tiny two weeks of doing Hester's weekly chore. 
Overall searing regret honors probably go to Jennifer Belden, who has four uncoverable black teardrops descending from the corner of one eye, from one night of mescaline and adrenalized grief, so that from more than two meters away, she always looks like she has flies on her, Randy Lentz points out. The new black girl, Dee Dee N., has on the plane of her upper abdomen a tattered screaming skull, off the same stencil as McDade's but without the flames. That's creepy because it's just a tattered white outline. Black people's tattoos are rare, and for reasons you will regard as fairly obvious, they tend to be just white outlines. And in house alumnus and volunteer counselor Calvin Thrust is quietly rumored to have on the shaft of his formerly professional porn cartridge performers unit a tattoo that displays the majuscule initials CT when the unit is flaccid, and the full name Calvin Thrust when hyperemic. Tiny Ewell has soberly elected to let this go unsubstantiated. Alumna and VC Danielle Steenbach once got the bright idea of having eyeliner-colored tattoos put around both eyes, so she'd never again have to apply eyeliner. Not backing on the inevitable fade that over times turned the tattoos a kind of nauseous, dark green, she now has to constantly apply eyeliner to cover up. Current female live-in staffer, Jeanette Foltz, has undergone two of the six painful procedures required to have the snarling orange and blue tiger removed from her left forearm, and so now has a snarling tiger minus a head and one front leg, with the ablated parts looking like someone determined has been at her forearm with steel wool. Ewell decides this is what gives profundity to the tattoo impulse's profound irrevocability. Having a tat removed means just exchanging one kind of disfigurement for another. There are Tingley and Deal's identical palmate cannabis leaf on inner wrist tattoos, though Tingley and Deal are from opposite shores and never crossed paths before entering the house. Nell Gunther refuses to discuss tattoos with Tiny Yule in any way or form. For a while, Tiny Yule considers live-in staffer Don Gately's homemade jailhouse tattoos too primitive to even bother asking about. He'd made a true pest of himself, though, Yule did, when at the height of the obsession, this one synthetic narc-addicted kid came in who refused to be called anything but his street name, Skull, and lasted only like four days, but who had been a walking exhibition of high-regret ink, both arms tattooed with spider webs at the elbows, on his fishy white chest a naked lady with the same kind of over-lush measurements you will remembered from the pinball machines of his Watertown childhood. On Skull's back, a half-meter-long skeleton in a black robe and cowl, playing the violin in the wind on a crag with The Dead in maroon, on a vertical gonfalonish banner, unfurling below. On one biceps, either an ice pick or a mucronate dagger, and down both forearms a kind of St. Vitus's dance of leather-winged dragons with the words on both forearms, How do you like your blue-eyed boy now, Mr. Death? The typos of which, Tiny felt, only served to heighten Skull's whole general tat gestalt's intended effect, which Tiny presumed was primarily to repel. In fact, Tiny E's whole displacement of obsession from Bunk's hospital corners to people's tattoos was probably courtesy of this kid Skull, who on his second night in the newer male residence, five-man room, had shed his electrified muscle shirt and was showing off his tattoos in a boneheaded, regretless, first-category fashion to Ken Erdetti, while R. Lentz did headstands against the closet door in his jockstrap, and Ewell and Jeffrey D., had their wallets, credit cards spread out on Ewell's drum-tight bunk and were trying to settle a kind of admittedly childish argument about who had the more prestigious credit cards. Skull flexing his pectorals to make the overdeveloped woman on his chest writhe, reading his forearms to Erdetti, etc. And Jeffrey Day had looked up from his Amex, gold, to Ewell's platinum, and shaken his moist, pale head at Ewell, and asked rhetorically, what had ever happened to good old traditional U.S. tattoos like Mom or an anchor 
which for some reason touched off a small obsessive explosion in Ewell's detox frazzled psyche. Probably the most poignant items in Ewell's survey were the much faded tattoos of old Boston AA guys who've been sober in the fellowship for decades, the crocodile elder statesmen of the white flag and Alston groups, and the St. Columkill Sunday night group, and Ewell's chosen home group. Wednesday night's Better Late Than Never group, for non-smoking, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital just two blocks down from the house. There is something queerly poignant about a deeply faded tattoo, a poignancy something along the lines of coming upon the tiny and poignantly unfashionable clothes of a child long since grown up in an attic trunk somewhere. The clothes, not the grown child, Ewell confirmed for G. Day. See, for example, White Flag's cantankerous old Francis, ferocious Francis, Gehaney's right forearm's tat, of a martini glass with a naked lady sitting in the glass, with her legs kicking up over the broad, flaring rim, with an old-style Rita Hayworth-era bangs intensive hairstyle. Faded to a kind of underwater blue, its incidental black lines gone soot green, and the red of the lips, nails, Subic Bay 62, USN, 4-07, not lightened to pink, but more like decayed, to the dusty red of fire, through much smoke. All these old sober Boston blue-collar men's irrevocable tattoos, fading almost observably under the low-budget fluorescence of church basements and hospital auditoria. You were watched and charted and cross-referenced them, moved. Any number of good old USN anchors and in Irish Boston, sooty green shamrocks, and several little frozen tableaus of little khaki figures in G.I. helmets plunging bayonets into the stomachs of hideous, urine-yellow, buck-toothed oriental caricatures, and screaming eagles with their claws fated blunt, and semper fi, all autolized to the point where the tattoos look like they're just under the surface of a murky-type pond. A tall, silent, hard-looking, old, black-haired, better-late-than-never group veteran has the terse and hateful single word, pussy, in what's faded to pond-scum green, down one liver-spotted forearm. But yet the fellow transcends even stoic regret by dressing and carrying himself as if the word simply wasn't there, or was so irrevocably there, there was no point even thinking about it. There's a deep and tremendously compelling dignity about the old man's demeanor with regards to the pussy on his arm, and Ewell actually considers approaching this fellow, Ray, the issue of sponsorship, if and when he feels it's appropriate to get an AA sponsor, if he decides it's germane in his case. Near the conclusion of this two-month obsession, Tiny Ewell approaches Don Gately on the subject of whether the jailhouse tattoo should maybe comprise a whole separate phylum of tattoo. Ewell's personal feeling is that jailhouse tattoos aren't poignant so much as grotesque, that they seem like they weren't a matter of impulsive decoration or self-presentation, so much as simple self-mutilation arising out of boredom and general disregard for one's own body and the aesthetics of decoration. Don Gately's developed the habit of staring coolly at Ewell until the little attorney shuts up. Though this is partly to disguise the fact that Gately usually can't follow what Ewell's saying, and is unsure whether this is because he's not smart or educated enough to understand Ewell, or because Ewell is simply out of his fucking mind. Don Gately tells Ewell how your basic type jailhouse tat is homemade with sewing needles from the jailhouse canteen and some blue ink from the cartridge of a fountain pen promoted from the breast pocket of an unalert public defender, is why the jailhouse genre is always the same night sky blue. The needle is dipped in the ink and jabbed as deep into the tattooee as it can be jabbed without making him recoil and fucking up your aim. Just a plain, ultra-minimal blue square like Gately's got on his right wrist takes half a day in hundreds of individual jabs. How come the lines are never quite straight and the colors never quite all the way solid 
is it's impossible to get all the individualized punctures down to the same uniform deepness in the, like, twitching flesh. This is why jailhouse tats always looked like they were done by sadistic children on rainy afternoons. Gately has a blue square on his right wrist and a sloppy cross on the inside of his mammoth left forearm. He's done the square himself, and a cellmate had done the cross in return for Gately doing a cross on the cellmate. Oral narcotics rendered the process both less painful and less tedious. The sewing needle is sterilized in grain alcohol, which Gately explains that the alcohol is got by taking mesol fruit and mashing it up and adding water and secreting the whole mess in a Ziploc just inside the flush hole thing of the cell's toilet to, like, foment. The sterilizing results of this can be consumed as well. Bonded liquor and cocaine are the only things hard to get inside of MDC penal institutions, because the expense of them gets everybody all excited, and it's only a matter of time before somebody goes and eats cheese. The inexpensive CIV oral narcotic Tolwin can be traded for cigarettes, however, which can, in turn, be got at the canteen or one at cribbage and dominoes. MDC regulations prohibit straight-out cards, or got in mass quantities off smaller inmates in return for protection from the romantic advances of larger inmates. Gately is right-handed, and his arms are roughly the size of tiny Ewell's legs. His wrist's jailhouse square is canted and has sloppy extra blobs at three of the corners. Your average jailhouse tack can't be removed even with laser surgery because it's incised so deep in. Gately is polite about Tiny Ewell's inquiries, but not expansive. That is, Tiny has to ask very specific questions about whatever he wishes to know, and then gets a short, specific answer from Gately to just that question. Then Gately stares at him, a habit Ewell tends to complain about at some length up in the five-man room. His interest in tattoos seems to be regarded by Gately not as invasive, but as the temporary obsession of a still-quivering, substanceless psyche that in a couple weeks will have forgot all about tattoos, an attitude Ewell finds condescending in the extremis. Gately's attitude toward his own primitive tattoos is a second-category attitude, with most of the stoicism and acceptance of his tat-regret sincere, if only because these irrevocable emblems of jail are minor rung bells compared to some of the fucked-up and really irrevocable impulsive mistakes Gately made as an active drug addict and burglar, not to mention their consequences, the mistakes, which Gately's trying to accept he'll be paying off for a real long time. Michael Pemulus has this habit of looking first to one side and then over to the other before he says anything. It's impossible to tell whether this is unaffected or whether Pemulus is emulating some film noir type character. It's worse when he's put away a couple dreams. He and Trevor Axford and Hal and Condenza are in Pemulus's room, with Pemulus's roommates, Shocked and Trolch, down at lunch, so they're alone. Pemulus and Axford and Hal stroking their chins, looking down at Michael Pemulus's yachting cap on his bed. Lying inside the overturned hat are a bunch of fair-sized but bland-looking tablets of the allegedly incredibly potent DMZ. Pemulus looks all around behind them in the empty room. This, Inkster, Axe Handle, <laughs> is the incredibly potent DMZ, the great white shark of organosynthesized hallucinogens, the gargantuan feral infant of Hal says, we get the picture. The Yale University of the Ivy League of Acid, says Axford. Your ultimate psychosensual distorter, Femulus sums up. I think you mean psychosensory, unless I don't know the whole story here. Axford gives Hal a narrow look. Interrupting Pemulus means having to watch him do the head thing all over again each time. Hard to find, gentlemen as in very hard to find. 
Last lots came off the line in the early 70s. These tablets here are artifacts. A certain amount of decay and potency, probably inevitable. Used in certain shady CIA-era military experiments. Axford nods down at the hat. Mind control? More like getting the enemy to think their guns are hydrangea. The enemy's a blood relative, that sort of thing. Who knows? The accounts I've been reading have been incoherent, gistless. Experiments conducted, things got out of hand. Let's just say things got out of control. Potency judged too incredible to proceed. Subjects locked away in institutions and written off as casualties of peace. <laughs> Formula shredded. Research teams scattered, reassigned. Vague, but I've got to tell you, pretty sobering rumors. These are from the early 70s, Axe Handel says. See the little trademark on each one, with a guy in bell-bottoms and long sideburns? Is that what that is? <laughs> Unprecedentedly potent, this stuff. The Swiss inventor, they say, was originally recommending LSD-25 as what to take to come down off the stuff. <laughs> Pemulus takes one of the tablets and puts it in his palm and pokes at it with a calloused finger. What we're looking at, we're looking here at either a serious, sudden injection of cash. Axford makes a shocked noise. You'd actually try to peddle the incredibly potent DMZ around this sorry place? Pemulus's snort sounds like the letter K. <laughs> Get a large economy size clue, axe handle. Nobody here would have a clue what they'd even be dealing with, not to mention be willing to pay what they're worth. Why, there are pharmaceutical museums, left-wing think tanks, New York designer drug consortiums. I'm sure would be dying to dissect these. Decocked-like. Toss into the spectrometer and see what's what. That we could get bids from, you're saying? Axford says. Al squeezes a bowl, silently looking at the hat. Pemulus turns the tablet over. Or certain very progressive and hip-type nursing homes I know guys that know of. Or down at Back Bay at that yogurt place with that picture of those historical guys Inc. was saying at breakfast was up on the wall. Ram Das, William Burroughs. Or just down in Harvard Square at Aubon Pan where all those 70s-era guys in old wool ponchos play chess against those little clocks they keep hitting. Axperts pretending to punch Hal's arm in excitement. Pemula says, or, of course, <laughs> I'm thinking I could just go the sheer entertainment route and toss them in the Gatorade barrels at the meet with Port Washington Tuesday or down at the Whataburger. Watch everybody run around clutching their heads or whatever. <laughs> I'd be way into watching Wayne play with <laughs> distorted senses. Al puts one foot up on Pemulus's little frustum-shaped bedside stool and leans farther in. Would it be prying to ask how you finally managed to get hold of these? It wouldn't be prying at all, Pemulus says, removing from the yachting caps lining every piece of contraband he's got, spreading it out on the bed, sort of the way older people will array all their valuables in quiet moments. He has a small quantity of personal consumption, lamb's breath cannabis, bought back from Hal out of a 20-gram eight sold Hal in a dusty baggie. A little saran-wrapped cardboard rectangle with four black stars spaced evenly across it. The odd dream. And it looks like a baker's dozen of the incredibly potent DMZ. Sweet tart-sized tablets of no particular color, with a tiny mod hipster in each center, wishing the viewer peace. We don't even know how many hits this is, he muses quietly. There's sun on the wall, with a hanging viewer and poster of the Paranoid King, and an enormous hand-drawn Serpinski gasket. In one of the three big mullioned west windows, the academy is nothing if not well fenestrated, there's an oval flaw that's casting a bubble of ale-colored autumn sunlight from the window's left side to elongate onto Pemulus's tightly made bed. Seventy-three. And he moves everything his hat's got into the brighter bubble going down on one knee to study a tablet between his forceps. Pemulus owns stuff like philatelic forceps, a loop, a pharmaceutical scale, a postal scale, a personal-sized Bunsen burner. 
with the calm precision of a jeweler. The literature is mute on the titration. Do you take one tablet? He looks up on one side and then back around on the other at the boys' faces leaning in above. Is like half a tab a regulation hit? Two or even three tablets, maybe, Hal says, knowing he sounds greedy but unable to help himself. The accessible date is vague, Femula says, his profile contorted around the loop in his socket. The literature on mucimal lysergic blends is spotty and vague and hard to read except to say how massively powerful the supposed yields are. Hal looks at the top of Pemulus's head. Did you hit a medical library? Well, I got on Med.com off lateral Alice's Watts line. It went back and forth and up and down through Med.com. Plenty on lysergics. Plenty on methoxy class hybrids. Vague and almost gossip columny shit on Fitviabe compounds. To get anything, you got a cross key ergotics with the phrase musimal or musimalated. Only a couple things ring the bell when you key in DMZ. Then they're all potent this, sinister that, nothing with any specifics. And jumbly polysyllables out the ass. <laughs> Whole thing gave me a migraine. Yes, but did you actually hop in the truck and actually go to a real med library? How's his mother Averill's child when it comes to databases? Software spell checks, etc. Axford now really does punch him once in the shoulder, albeit the right one. Pemulus is scratching absently at the little hair hurricane at the center of his hair. It's close to 1430 hours, and the flawed bubble of light on the bed is getting to be the slightly sad color of early winter p.m. There are still no sounds from the west courts outside, but there's high song of much volume through the walls, water pipes. A lot of guys who are drilled past caring in the a.m. don't get it up to shower until after lunch. Then sit through p.m. classes with wet hair and different clothes than their a.m. classes. Famulus rises to stand between them and looks around the empty three-bedded room again, with neat stacks of three players' clothes and bright gear on shelves and three wicker laundry hampers bulging slightly. There is the rich scent of athletic laundry, but other than that the room looks almost professionally clean. Famulus and Schacht's room makes Hal and Mario's room look like an insane asylum, Hal thinks. Axford drew one of the only two single upper-class rooms in last spring's lottery, the other having gone to the vault twins, who get counted as one entry in room draw. Pamulus still has his cheek screwed up to keep the loop in as he looks around. One monograph had this toss-off about DMZ where the guy invites you to envision acid that has itself dropped acid. <laughs> Holy crow! One article at a fucking moment, of all sources, talks about how this one army convict at Leavenworth got allegedly injected with some massive unspecified dose of early DMZ as part of some army experiment and Christ only knows what, and about how this convict's family sued over how the guy reportedly lost his mind. He directs the loop dramatically, at first Hal, and then Axford. I mean, literally lost his mind, like the massive dose picked his mind up and carried it off somewhere and put it down someplace and forgot where. I think we get the picture, Mike. <laughs> Allegedly, Moment says how the guy's found later in his army cell, <laughs> in some impossible lotus position, singing show tunes in a scary, deadly accurate Ethel Merman impression voice. <laughs> Axford says maybe Pemulus stumbled on a possible explanation for poor old Lyle and his lotus position down in the weight room, gesturing with a bad right hand in the direction of Comad. Again, Pemulus, with a thing with a head. The slackening of a cheek lets the loop fall out and bounce off the drum-tight bed, and Pemulus gets it to rebound into his palm without even looking. I think we can err on the side of not dickying the Gatorade barrels, anyway. This soldier story's moral was proceed with caution, big time. The guy's mind's still allegedly AWOL. An old soldier now still belting out Broadway melodies in some secretive institution someplace. <laughs> Blood relatives tried to sue on the guy's behalf. Army apparently came up with enough arguments to give the jury reasonable doubt about if the guy can even be said to legally exist enough to bring suit anymore. 
since the devs misplaced his mind. <laughs> Axford feels absently at his elbow. So you're saying let's proceed with care, why don't we? Hal kneels to prod one of the tablets up against the dusty, baggy side. His finger looks dark in the elongated bubble of light. I'm thinking these look like two tablets are possibly a hit. A kind of Motrinish look to them. Visual guesswork isn't going to do it. This is not Bob Hope, Inc. We could even designate it Ethel, for on the phone, Axford suggests. Pemulus watches Hal, arranging the tablets into the same general cardioid shape as ETA itself. What I'm saying, this is not a fool's rush-in type substance, Inc. This show tune soldier, like, left the planet. Well, so long as he waves every so often. <laughs> the sense I got is the only thing he waves at is his food. But that was from a massive early dose, Axford says. Hal's arrangement of the tablets on the red and gray counterpane is almost zen in its precision. These are from the 70s? After intricate third-party negotiations, Michael Pamulus finally landed 650 milligrams of the vaunted and elusive compound DMZ, or Madame Psychosis, from a small-arms draped duo of reputed former Canadian insurgents who now undertook small and probably kind of pathetic outdated insurgency projects from behind the front operation of a cut-rate mirror, blown glass, practical joke and gag, trendy postcard and low-demand old film cartridge emporium called Antitois Entertainment. Just up Prospect Street, from Inman Square in Cambridge's decayed Portugal brazilian district. Because Pamulus always conducts business solo and speaks no French, the whole transaction, with the nook in charge, had to be negotiated in dumb show. And since this lumberjackish antitois nuckwad tended to look from side to side before he communicated, even more than Pamulus looked all around himself, with his dim-looking partner standing there cradling a broom, and also scanning for eavesdroppers in the closed shop the whole time. The whole negotiated deal had resembled a kind of group psychomotor seizure, with the different bits of whipping and waggling heads reflected in dislocated sections and at jagged angles in more mirrors and pebble-blown glass vases than Pemulus had ever seen crammed into anywhere. A very low-rent TP, indeed, had a hardcore porn cartridge going at five times the normal speed, so it looked like crazed rodents, and may have turned Pemulus's sexual glands off for all time, he feels. God alone knew where these clowns had acquired thirteen incredibly potent fifty-milligram artifacts of the B.S. 1970s. But the good news is, they were Canadians. And like fucking nucksters about almost anything, they had no idea what what they were in possession of was worth, as it slowly emerged. Pemulus, with aid of 150 milligrams of time-release tenuate dosepan, almost danced a little post-transaction jig on his way up the steps of the Yoshios Cambridge bus, feeling the way W. Penn in his Quaker Oats hat, in like the 16th century must have felt, trading a few trinkets to babe in the woods natives for New Jersey, he imagines, doffing the nautical cap to two nuns in the aisle. Over the course of the next academic day, the incredibly potent stash now wrapped tight in saran and stashed deep in the toe of an old sneaker that sits atop the aluminum strut between two panels in subdorm B's drop ceiling, Pemulus's time-tested entrepot over the course of the next day or so, the matter's hashed out, and it's decided that while there's no real reason to involve Boone or Stice or Struck or Trolch, it's really Pemulus and Axford and Hal's right, duty almost, to the spirits of inquiry and good trade practice, to sample the potentially incredibly potent DMZ in predeterminedly safe amounts before unleashing it on Boone or Trolch or any unwitting civilians. Axford, having been allowed in on the front end, the question of Hal's defraying the opportunity cost of his part in the experiment is tactfully broached, and turns out to be no problem. Pemulus's markup isn't anything beyond accepted norms, and there's always room in Hal's budget for spirited inquiry. Hal's one condition 
is that somebody tech literate actually take the truck down to BU or MIT's medical library and physically verify that the compound is both organic and non-addictive. Which Pamela says a physical hands-on library assault is already down in his day planner in pen anyway. After PM drills on Thursday, as Hal Incandenza and Pemulus, with camera-mounted Mario Incandenza in tow, stand with their hands in the chain-link mesh of one of the show court's fencing, and watch Teddy Shock play a private exhibition against a Syrian satellite pro who's at ETA for two paid weeks of corrective instruction on a service motion that's eroding his rotator cuff. The guy wears thick glasses with a black athletic band around his head and plays with an upright, square-jawed, liquid precision, and is dispatching Ted Schacht handily, which Schacht is taking with his customary sanguine good temper, giving his stolid all, learning what he can, one of very few genuinely stocky players at ETA, and one of the even fewer ranked junior players around without an apparent ego, wholly non-insecure since he blew out his knee on a contrapié in the pre-Thanksgiving exhibition three years back, which is odd. Now, still in and at it just for the fun, and more or less doomed, therefore, to a purgatorial existence in 128 to 256 Alphabetville. As Pamulus and Hal stand there, sweaty in full red and gray ETA sweats, on a raw 11.5 p.m., the sweat in their hair starting to accrete and freeze, Mario said, bowed under the weight of the head mount rig and is hideously arachnodactylic fingers whitening as the fence takes his forward weight. Hal's posture subtly but warmly inclined ever so slightly toward his tiny older brother, who resembles him the way creatures of the same order but not the same family might resemble one another. As they stand watching and hashing matters out, Hal and Pemulus, there's the thud and sprong of an EWD transnational catapult off way below to their left, and then the high keen sound of a waste displacement projectile the clouds are too low to let them see the flight of, though a weirdly yellow sheep-shaped cloud is visible somewhere up off past Acton, connecting the horizon seam to some kind of coming storm front held off by the ATH SCME fans along the Lowell Methuen stretch of border northwest. Pamulus finally nixes the notion of performing the spirited controlled experiment here in Enfield, where Axford has to be at the A Squad's dawn drills every morning at 0500. And also Hal, unless he's slept over at the headmaster's house the night before, with the headmaster's house just not being a good DMZ dropping venue at all. Pemulus, scanning up and down the length of the fence and winking at Mario, posits that a solid 36 hours of demand-free time will be advisable for any interaction with the incredibly potent you know what -ski. That also lets out the inter-academy thing with Port Washington tomorrow, for which Charles Tavis has chartered two buses because so many ETA players are getting to go and do battle in this one. Port Washington Academy is gargantuan, the Xerox Inc. of North American Tennis Academies, with over 300 students and 64 courts, half of which they'll have already put under warm, inflatable testar cover, as of, like, Halloween, PW staff being less into the value of elemental suffering than Stitt and company. So many that Tavis will almost surely go ahead and bust them all back up from Long Island just as soon as the post-competition dance is over, rather than shell out for all those motel rooms without corporate support. This ETA, PW meet, and buffet and dance, are private inter-academy tradition, an epic rivalry almost a decade old. Plus, Pamela says, he'll need a couple weeks of quality med library stacks tossing time to do the more exacting titration and side effects research Hal agrees the soldier's sobering story seems to dictate. So, they conclude, the window of opportunity looks to be 11.20 to 21 the weekend right after the big end-of-fiscal-year fundraising exhibition with the ETA, A and B squads in singles against this year, Quebec's notoriously hapless Junior Davis and Junior Whiteman Cup squads. 74. 
Invited down under very quiet, low-profile political conditions via the good expatriate offices of Averill and Condensa to get vivisected by Wayne and Hal and others for the philanthropic amusement of ETA patrons and alums, then to dance the PM away at a catered supper and alumni ball, the weekend right before Thanksgiving week, and the Whataburger Invitational in sunny Arizona. Because this year, in addition to Friday, 11.20, they also get Saturday, 11.21 off, as in, from both class and practice, because C.T. and Stitt have arranged a special one-match doubles exhibition for the Saturday a.m. following the big meet, one between two female coaches of the Quebecois Whitemans and ETA's infamous Vaught twins, Karen and Sharon Vaught, 17. ONAN's top-ranked junior women's doubles team, unbeaten in three years, an unbeatable duo, uncanny in their cooperation on the court, moving as one at all times, playing not just as if, but in fact, because they shared a brain, or at least the psychomotor lobes of one, the twins, Siamese, fused at the left and right temple, banned from singles by ONAN regs, the broad shadow-casting vaults, flinty-eyed tire executives' daughters out of Akron, using her-slash-their four legs to cover chilling amounts of court, plus to sweep the Charleston competition at every post-exhibition formal ball for the last five years running. Tavis will be on Wayne to play some sort of exhibitory thing, too, though asking Wayne to publicly smear a second Quebecer in two days might be a bit much. And but everyone who's anyone will be down at the lung watching the Vaughts vivisect some adult-ranked nooks, plus maybe Wayne. 75. Then the ETAs will get Saturday to rest and recharge before starting both the pre-Whataburger training week and the bell lap of prep for 12-12s boards. Meaning, late Friday night to Sunday a.m. will give Pemulus, Howe, and Axford, and maybe Struck if Pemulus needs to let Struck in for help with library tossing, enough time to psycho-spiritually rally from whatever meninges withering hangover the incredibly potent DMZ might involve. And Axford in the sauna predicted it would be a witherer indeed. Since even just LSD alone, he observed, left you the next day not just sick or down, but utterly empty, a shell, void inside, like your soul was a wrung-out sponge. Hal wasn't sure he concurred. An alcohol hangover was definitely no frolic in the psychic glade, all thirsty and sick and your eyes bulging and receding with your pulse. But after a night of involved hallucinogens, Hal said the dawn seemed to confer on his psyche a kind of pale, sweet aura, a luminescence. 76. Halation, Axford observed. Pemulus appears to have left out of his calculations the fact that he'll get that Saturday p.m. off classes only if he makes the traveling list for the Tucson Whataburger the following week. And that unlike Hal and Axford, he's not a lock. Pemulus's USTA rank, accepting his halcyon 13th year in the year of the Purdue Wonder Chicken, has never gotten higher than 128. And the Whataburger draws kids from all over. O-N-A-N, and even Europe. The draw will have to be weak indeed for him to get even one of the 64 qualifying round invitations. Axford's on the fringes of the top 50, but he got to go last year at 17, so he's almost got to get to go. And Hal is looking at getting a third or maybe fourth seed in 18's singles. He's definitely going, barring some sort of cataclysmic ankle relapse against either Port Washington or Quebec. Axford postulates that Pemulus isn't miscalculating so much as simply showing a slitty-eyed confidence, which as far as his match-play outlook is concerned would be unusual and rather a fine thing. Pro-Rector Aubrey de Lint says publicly that seeing M. Pemulus in practice versus seeing M. Pemulus in a real match that means anything is like getting to know some girl through email as like email keyboard-type pen pals, and really falling for her, and then finally meeting her in person and finding out she's got like just one enormous tit in the exact middle of her chest or something like that. 
Seventy-seven. Mario will get to come along if Avril can convince CT to bring him along to get Waterburger footage for this year's ETA promotional Christmas giveaway to private and incorporated patrons cartridge. Shocked and the glossy Syrian are laughing together about something up at the net post, where they've walked to gather gear and various spare rotator cuff and knee appliances. After the Syrian kind of cornerly jumped the net and pumped Shocked's hand. Breath and sweat, steam rising up off and moving off through the fences, mesh toward the manicured western hills. As Mario's laugh rings out at some broad mock supplicant's gesture, shocked, just now made. The seventh of November, year of the depend adult undergarment. You can be at certain parties. And not really be there. You can hear how certain parties have their own implied ends embedded in the choreography of the party itself. One of the saddest times Joel Van Dyne ever feels anywhere is that invisible pivot where a party ends, even a bad party. That moment of unspoken accord when everyone starts collecting his lighter and date jacket or greatcoat. Is one last beer hanging from the plastic rinds five rings? Says certain perfunctory things to the hostess in a way that acknowledges their perfunctoriness without seeming insincere, and leaves, usually shutting the door. When everybody's voices recede down the hall, when the hostess turns back in from the closed door and sees the litter and the expanding white V of utter silence in the party's wake, Joelle. At the end of her rope and preparing to hang from it, listening, is supported by a polished hardwood floor above both river and bay's edge, perched uncomfortably in striated light, in one of Molly Notkin's chairs molded in the likeness of great filmmakers from the celluloid canon. Seated between empty cucker and frightening Murnau, in Malaise's fiberglass lap, his trousers crease uncomfortable. And his cummerbund, MIT crested. The lurid chairs' directors are larger than life. Joelle's feet dangle well off the floor. Her squished hamstrings beginning to burn under a damp, thick cotton Brazilian skirt, which is vivid, curled pale purples, and fresh red against a Latin black that seems to glow above pale knees and white rayon knee socks and feet in clogs that are hanging half off. Legs swinging like a child's, always feeling like a child in Molly's chairs, conspicuously perched in the eye of a bad party's somewhat forced feeling storm of wit and good cheer, sitting by herself under what used to be her window, the daughter of a low pH chemist and homemaker from Western Kentucky, a lot of fun to be with normally, if you can get over the disconcerting veil. Among pernicious myths is the one where people always get very upbeat and generous. And other directed right before they eliminate their own map for keeps. The truth is that the hours before a suicide are usually an interval of enormous conceit and self-involvement. There are decorative bars, slender and of black iron, that pigeon droppings have made piebald over the west windows to this third-floor cooperative apartment on the East Cambridge fringes of the Back Bay, where near Professor Notkin is holding a party. To celebrate passing her orals in film and film cartridge theory, the doctoral program where Joel, before her retreat into broadcast sound, had met her. Molly Notkin often confides on the phone to Joel Van Dyne about the one tormented love of Notkin's life thus far, an erotically circumscribed G. W. Pabst scholar at New York University, tortured by the neurotic conviction. That there are only a finite number of erections possible in the world at any one time, and that his tumescence means, for example, the detumescence of some perhaps more deserving or tortured third-world sorghum farmer, or something, so that whenever he tumefies, he'll suffer the same order of guilt that your less eccentrically tortured PhD type person will suffer at the idea of, say, wearing baby seal fur. Molly still takes the high-speed rail down to visit him every couple weeks, to be there for him in case, by some selfish mischance, he happens to harden, prompting in him 
black waves of self-disgust, and an extreme neediness for understanding and non-judgmental love. She and poor Molly Notkin are just the same, Joel reflects, seated alone, watching doctoral candidates taste wine. Sisters, sororal twins, with her fear of direct light, Notkin, and the disguises and whiskers are simply veiled veils. How many Sabrosa twins are there, out there, really? What if heredity, instead of linear, is branching? What if it's not arousal that's so finitely circumscribed? What if, in fact, there were ever only like two really distinct individual people walking around back there in history's mist? That all difference descends from this difference. The whole and the partial, the damaged and the intact the deformed and the paralyzingly beautiful, the insane and the attendant, the hidden and the blindingly open, the performer and the audience, no Zen type one, always rather two, one upside down in a convex lens. Joel is thinking about what she has in her purse. She sits alone in her linen veil and pretty skirt, obliquely looked at, listening to bits of conversation she reels in out of the overall voice's noise, but seeing no one really else. The absolute end of her life and beauty running in a kind of stuttered, old, handheld 16 millimeter before her eyes, projected against the white screen on her side for once from Uncle Bud and twirling to Orin and Jim and YYY, all the way up to today's wet walk here from the Red Lines downtown stop walking the whole way from East Charles Street, employing a self-conscious and kind of formal stride, but undeniably pretty. The overall walk at her last hours was, on this last day before the great O-N-A-N-ite interdependence revel. East Charles to the back bay today is a route full of rained-on, sienna-glazed streets and upscale businesses with awnings and wooden signs hung with cute colonial script and people looking at her like you look at the blind, naked gazes, not knowing she could see everything at all times. She likes the wet walk for this, everything milky and halated through her veil's damp linen, the brick sidewalks of Charles Street unchipped and impersonally crowded, her legs on autopilot, she a perceptual engine, holding the collar of her overcoat closed at her poncho's neckline, in a way that lets her hold the veil secure against her face with a finger on her chin. Thinking always about what she has in her purse. Stopping in at a discount tobacconist and buying a quality cigar in a glass tube, and then a block later placing the cigar inside carefully, in among the overflowing waste, atop a corner receptacle of pine-green mesh. But keeps the tube, puts the glass tube in her purse, can hear the rain's thup on tight umbrellas, and hear it hiss in the street, and can see droplets broken and regathering on her polyresin coat, cars sheening by with a special lonely sound of cars in rain, wipers making black rainbows on taxis' shining windshields. In every alley are green IWD dumpsters and the smaller red IWD dumpsters to take the overflow from the green dumpsters and the sound of her wood sole clogs against the receding staccato of brittle women's high heels, on brick, westward, as Charles Street now approaches Boston Common, and becomes less quaint and upscale. Sodden litter, flat, the way only wet litter can be flat, appears on the sidewalk and then the curb seam, and now murky-colored people with sacks and grocery carts appraising that litter, squatting to lift and sift through litter and the rustle and jut of limbs from dumpsters being sifted by people who all day do nothing but sift through IWD dumpsters, and other people's blue, shoeless limbs, extending in coronal rays from refrigerator boxes in each block's three alleys, and the little cataract of rainwater off the edge of each dumpster's red annex's downsloping side, and hitting refrigerator boxes' tops with a rhythmless thappa thappa pa thap Somebody going psst from an alley's lip, and ghastly white or blotched faces, declaiming to thin air from recessed doorways, curtained by rain. And for an other directed second, 
To well wishes, she'd hung on to the cigar to give away. And moving westward into the territory of the endless stem, near the end of Charles, she starts to dispense change she is asked for from doorways and inverted up-tilted boxes, and she gets asked about the deal with the veil with a lack of delicacy she rather prefers. A sooty wheelchaired man with a dead white face below a Notre Ray pays cap silently extends a hand for coins. A puffed red cut across the business-like palm is half-healed and almost visibly closing. It looks like a dent in dough. Joel gives him a folded U.S. 20 and likes that he says nothing. She buys a .473 liter Pepsi Cola in a blunt plastic bottle at a store 24, whose Jordanian clerk just looks at her blankly when she asks if they carry big red soda water, and settles for the Pepsi, and comes out and pours the pop out down a storm drain, and watches it pool there, foaming, brownly, and stay put because the drain's grate is clogged solid with leaves and sodden litter. She walks on toward the common with the empty bottle and glass tube in her purse. There is no need to buy chore boy pads at the store 24. Joelle Van Dyne is excruciatingly alive and encaged, and in the director's lap can call up everything from all times. What will be that most self-involved of acts, self-canceling? To lock oneself in Molly Notkin's bedroom or bath and get so high that she's going to fall down and stop breathing and turn blue and die, clutching her heart. No more back and forth. Boston Common is like a lush hole Boston's built itself around. A two-kilometer square of shiny trees and dripping limbs and green benches over wet grass. Pigeons all over, the same sooty cream as the willow's rinds. Three young black men perched like tough crows along a bench's back, approve her body and call her bitch with harmless affection, and ask where's the wedding at. No more deciding to stop at 2300 hours, and then barely getting through the hour's show, and hurtling back home at 0130 hours and smoking the chore boy's resins and not stopping after all. No more throwing the material away, and then half an hour later rooting through the trash. No more all fours scrutiny of the carpet in hopes of a piece of lint that looks enough like the material to try to smoke. No more singeing the salvage of veils. The common south edge is Boylston Street, with its 24-7 commerce, upscale cashmere scarves and cellular holsters, doormen with gold braid, jewelers with three names, women with valence curtain bangs, stores, disgorging shoppers with their wide, white, monogrammed, twine-handled bags. The rain's wet veil blurs things like Jim had designed in his neonatal lens to blur things in imitation of a neonatal retina, everything recognizable and yet without outline. A blur that's more deforming than fuzzy, no more clutching her heart on a nightly basis. What looks like the cage's exit is actually the bars of the cage. The afternoon's meshes. The entrance says exit. There isn't an exit. The ultimate annular fusion, that of exhibit and its cage. Jim's own cage number three, free show. It is the cage that has entered her, somehow. The ingenuity of the whole thing is beyond her. The fun has long since dropped off the too much. She's lost the ability to lie to herself about being able to quit, or even about enjoying it still. It no longer delimits and fills the hole. It no longer delimits the hole. There's a certain smell to a rain-wet veil, something about that caller and the moon saying the moon never looked away, revolving and yet not. She had hurtled on back home on the night's final tea and gone home and at least finally not turned her face away from the situation. The predicament that she didn't love it anymore. She hated it and wanted to stop and also couldn't stop or imagine stopping or living without it. She had in a way done as they'd made Jim do near the end and admitted powerlessness over this cage, this unfree show, weeping, literally clutching her heart, 
smoking first the chore boy scrap she'd used to trap the vapors and form a smokable resin, then bits of the carpet and the acetate panties she'd filtered the solution through hours earlier, weeping and veilless and yarn-haired like some grotesque clown in all four mirrors of her little room's walls. Chronology of Organization of North American Nations Revenue-Enhancing Subsidized Time By Year 1. Year of the Whopper 2. Year of the Tux Medicated Pad 3. Year of the Trial Size Dove Bar 4. Year of the Purdue Wonder Chicken 5. Year of the Whisper Quiet Maytag Dishmaster 6. Year of the You Shit You 2007 Mimetic Resolution Cartridge View Motherboard Easy to Install Upgrade for Infernatron Interlaced TP Systems for Home, Office, or Mobile. 7. Year of Dairy Products from the American Heartland. 8. Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. 9. Year of Glad. 78. Jim's eldest, Orin, punter extraordinaire, dodger of flung acid extraordinaire, had once shown Joel Van Dyne his childhood collection of husks of the lemon pledge that the school's players used to keep the sun off. Different sized legs and portions of legs, well-muscled arms, a battery of five-hold masks hung on nails from an upright fiberboard sheet. Not all the husks had names below them. Boylston Street East means she passes again the black bronze equestrian statue of Boston's Colonel Shaw and the Massachusetts 54th, illuminated now by a patch of emergent sunlight. Shaw's metal head and raised sword, illicitly draped in a large Quebecois fleur-de-lis flag with all four irises, stems, altered to red blades. So it's absurdly now a red, white, and blue flag. Three Boston cops on ladders with poles and shears. The Canadian militants come in the night, on the eve of interdependence, thinking anyone cares whether they hang things from historic icons, hang anti-O-N-A-N flags, as if anyone not paid to remove them cares one way or the other. The encaged and suicidal have a really hard time imagining anyone caring passionately about anything. And here, too are East Boylston's dealers, sirens of the other second cage, standing, as always, outside F.A.O. Schwartz, young little black boys, boys so black they're blue, horrifically skinny and young, little more than living shadows and knit caps and knee-length sweatshirts and very white high tops, shifting and blowing into their cupped hands, alluding to the availability of a certain material just barely eluding his all, with their postures and bored, blank, important gaze. Certain salesmen have only to stand there. Certain types of sales, the customer comes to you, and lo. The cops at the flag across the street don't give them a look. Joelle hurries past the line of dealers. She tries to, her clogs loose and clocking, tarrying for just a moment at the end just past the gauntlet's end, still within two extended hands' reach of the last board dealer. For here on the street outside Schwartz is placed an odd adverting display. Not a live salesman of any sort, but rather a humanoid figure of something that's better than cardboard. Untouched by the vendors, they don't seem even to look. A display on an angled rear mount stand, like a photo frame stand. 2D. The figure of a man in a wheelchair in a coat and tie, his lap blanketed and no legs below, his well-fed face artistically reddened with some terrible joy, his smile's arc of the extreme curvature that exists between mirth and fury, his ecstasy terrible to see, his head hairless and plastic and cast back, his eyes on the blue harlequin patches of the post-storm sky looking straight up or having a seizure, or ecstatic, 
his arms also up and out, in a gesture of submission or triumph or thanks, his oddly thick right hand, the receptacle for the black spine of the case of some new film cartridge being advertised for distribution. The cartridge stuck like a tongue out of a slot in his lineless palm. Except there was only this display, this ecstatic figure, and a cartridge no feral vendors removed, no mention of title, no blurbs or quoted references to critics' thumbs. The case's spine itself, bare black, slightly pebble generic plastic, conspicuously unlabeled. Two Oriental women's shopping bags catch and make her raincoat billow slightly as Joelle stands there, briefly, feeling the lines dealers looking at her, assessing. And then someone calls something to one of the cops halfway up the statue, using his first name, which echoes slightly and breaks the spell. The little black boys look away. None of the passers-by seem to notice the display she stands before, reflecting. It's some kind of anti-ad, to direct attention at what is not said. Lead up to an inevitability you deny. Not new, but an expensive and affecting display. The film cartridge itself would be a blank, too, or the case empty. Worthless because it really can be removed all the way from the slot in the figure's hand. Joel removes it and looks at it and puts it back. She's had her last fling with film cartridges. Jim had used her several times. Jim, at the end, had filmed her at prodigious and multi-lensed length and refused to share what he'd made of it and died without a note. 79. Her mental name for the man had been Infinite Jim. The display cartridge shoves home with a click. One of the such young dealers calls her mama and asks, where's the funeral at? For a while, after the acid, after first Orin left and then Jim came and made her sit through that filmed apology scene and then vanished and then came back but only two only four years, seven months, six days passed to leave for a while after taking the veil. For a while, she liked to get really high and clean, Joelle did. Scrub sinks until they were mint white. Dust the ceilings without using any kind of ladder. Vacuum like a fiend and put in a fresh vacuum bag after each room. Imitate the wife and mother they both declined to shoot. Use Incandenza's toothbrush on tiles grout. In places along Boylston, cars are triple parked. People's wipers are on that setting that Joelle, who does not drive, imagines to read occasional on the controls. Her own personal daddy's old car had wipers controls on the turn signal stalk by the wheel. Available yellow cabs pass, hissing in the streets. Over half the passing cabs out here in the rain are advertising themselves as available. Purple numbers lit below taxi. As she remembers things Jim was. Besides a great filmic mind and her true heart's friend, the world's best hailer of Boston cabs, known to have less hailed than conjured cabs in spots where Boston cabs, by all that's right, just aren't. A hailer of Boston cabs in places like Vetersburg, Indiana, and Powell, Wyoming. Something in the authority of the lifted arm's height, the oncoming taxi undergoing a sort of parallax as it bore down over tumbleweed streets, appearing under Incandenza's upraised palm, as if awaiting benediction. He was a tall and physically slow-moving man with a great love of taxis, and they loved him back. Never again a cab in four-plus years after that. And so Joelle Van Dyne, a.k.a. Madam P., surrendered, suicidal, a shoes, tumbrel or hack, her solid clog sounding formal on the smooth cement down Boylston sidewalk past fine stores, revolving doors, southeast toward serious brownstone terrain, open coat swirling over poncho, and hanging rain breaking into stutters and drips. After she had smoked homemade freebase cocaine this a.m. for the last time, and then fired up the chore boys and good panties she'd used as a last filter, 
and choked on burnt acetate when she shredded and smoked them, and had wept and imprecated at the mirrors and thrown away her paraphernalia again for the final time, when an hour later she'd walked not formally to her tea stop under a parliament of gathering storm clouds and faint sticky bits of autumn thunder to ride to Upper Brighton and find Lady Delphina, get real weight from Lady Delphina, so hard to just cut it off in mid-binge, on a Saturday, unless she just passed out, to tell L.D. when she'd said goodbye, and it was the last time, it had been really the penultimate time, but that this was the last time. This was goodbye, for real and get serious weight from Lady Delphina, pay her twice the eight-gram rate as a generous farewell as she walked without much real formality to her tea stop and stood on the platform, each time mistaking little mutters of thunder for the approach of the train, wanting more of it so badly she could feel her brain heaving around in its skull, then a pleasant and gentle-faced older black man in raincoat and hat, with a little flat black feather in the band, and the sort of black-framed, styleless spectacles pleasant older black men wear, with the weary, but dignified, mild comportment of the older black, waiting alone with her on the chill, dim Davis Square subway platform. This man had folded his herald neatly lengthwise, and had it under the same arm he tipped his hat with, and said to excuse him, if this was an intrusion, he said, but he'd had occasion to see one or two of these linen veils before around, like what she wore, and was interested and rendered curious. He pronounced all four syllables of interested, which Joel from Kentucky enjoyed. If he might be so bold, he said, tipping his hat. Joel had engaged with him completely, which was extremely rare, even off the air. She rather welcomed the chance to think about anything else at all, with a train surely never pulling in. She reflected that the anecdote had gotten about, but not the incident's legacy, she said, as if that part were hidden. The union of the hideously and improbably deformed was unofficially founded in London in B.S. 1940, in London, United Kingdom, by the cross-eyed, palate-clefted, and wildly carbuncular wife of a junior member of the House of Commons, a lady whom Sir Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, having had several glasses of port plus a toddy at a reception for an American Lend-Lease administrator, had addressed in a fashion wholly inappropriate to social intercourse between civilized gentlemen and ladies. Unwittingly all but offering the union design to afford the scopophobic, empathic fellowship and the genesis of sturdy inner resources through shame-free and unconstrained concealment. Winston Churchill, when the lady, no person's doormat, informed him with prim asperity that he appeared to be woefully inebriated, made the anecdotally famous reply that, while yes, yea, verily, he was indeed inebriated, he would the following a.m. be once again sober, while she, dear lady, would tomorrow still be hideously and improbably deformed. Churchill, doubtless under weighty emotional pressures during this period in history, and then proceeded to extinguish his cigar in the lady's sherry, and to place a finger-bowl napkin delicately over the ruined features of her flaming visage. The laminated non-photo UHID membership card Joel showed the interested old black gentleman, related all this data and more, in a point size so tiny the card looked somehow both blank and defaced. Putative Curriculum Vitae of Helen P. Steeply, 36, 1.93 meters tall, 104 kilograms in weight, A.B. M.J.A. One year, time, graduate intern, newsmakers section. Sixteen months, Decade Magazine, hottest and notest, a trends and style analysis column, until Decade Folded. Five years, Southwest Annual. Human Interest, Geriatric Medical, Personality and Tourism Articles. Five Months, Newsweek. Eleven small features on trends and entertainment, until her executive editor, with whom she was in love, left Newsweek and took her with him. One Year, Ladies' Day. Personality and Medical Cosmetic Features, 
some research firsthand, until one week in which the executive editor reconciled with his wife, NHPS got mugged and purse snatched on West 62nd, and vowed never again to live in Manhattan. Fifteen months to present. Moment Magazine. Southwest Bureau. Arithma, Arizona. Medical. Soft Sports. Personality. And Home Entertainment Trends Reporting. Masthead Byline. Contributing Editor Status. Thereafter, proceeding first to the Upper Brighton and now the cooperative Back Bay Edge brownstone she had lived in once with Oren and performed in with his father, and then passed on to Molly Notkin, today's party's guest of honor and hostess in one. As of yesterday, enjoying ABD pre-doctoral status in film and film cartridge theory at MIT, having cleared the notorious hurdle of oral examinations on that day by offering her examination committee a dramatically rendered and, if she did say so herself, devastating oral critique of post-millennial Marxist film cartridge theory from the point of view of Marx himself. Marx as pretend film cartridge theorist and scholar. Still dressed as Karl Marx a day later in celebration, the glued beard matted and pubic black, Homburg ordered directly from Wiesbaden, soot from a terribly obscure British souvenir filth shop, she has no idea that Joelle's been in a cage since year of the trial-sized dove bar, has no idea what she and Jim in Condenza were even about for twenty-one months, whether they were lovers or what, whether Orrin left because they were lovers or what, or that Joelle even now lives hand to lung on a grossly generous trust willed her by a man she unveiled for but never slept with, the prodigious punter's father, infinite jester, director of a final opus so magnum he'd claimed to have had it locked away. 80. Joelle's never seen the completed assembly of what she'd appeared in, or seen anyone who's seen it, and doubts that any sum of scenes as pathologic as he'd stuck that long, quartzy, auto-wobbling lens on the camera and filmed her for could have been as entertaining as he'd said the thing he'd always wanted to make had broken his heart by ending up. Climbing to the third floor, stairs pale from wear, still trembling from the A.M.'s interruptus, Joelle finds herself having a hard time climbing, as if the force of gravity goes up as she does. The party sounds start around the second landing. Here is Molly Notkin, dressed as a crumbling Marx again, greeting Joelle at her door, with a sort of delighted mock surprise U.S. hostesses use for greetings. Notkin secures Joelle's veil for her during removal of the beaded coat and poncho, then lifts the veil slightly in a practiced two-finger gesture to deliver a double-cheek kiss that is sour with cigarettes and wine. Joelle never smokes when veiled. Asking how Joelle got here, and then without waiting for an answer, offering her that odd kind of British Columbian apple juice they'd found they both liked so, and that Joelle at home's abandoned and gone back to the big red soda water of childhood, which Nockin doesn't know, and still cluelessly considers extra-sweet Canadian juice to be pretty much both her and Joelle's biggest vices. Molly Notkin's the kind of soul you want desperately to be polite to, but have to hide it with because she'd be mortified if she suspected you were ever just being polite to her about anything. Joelle makes a get-out-of-here gesture. The really, really good kind? The kind that looks muddy and so fresh. Where'd you get it this late, this far east? The kind you just about had to strain, it's so fresh. The living room is full and hot, campy mambo playing, walls still the same off-white, but all the trim now a confectioner's rich brown. Or, plus there's wine, Joelle sees. A whole assortment on the old sideboard it took three men with cigars and gray jumpsuits to get up the stairs when they got it. An assortment of bottles of different shapes and dim colors and different levels of what's inside. Molly Notkin has one dirty-nailed hand on Joelle's arm and one on the head of a chair of Maya Darren, brooding avant-guardedly in vivid spun-glass polymers, and is telling Joelle about her orals in a party's near shout that will leave her hoarse well before this big one's sad end. A good, muddy juice fills Joelle's mouth with spit 
that's as good as the juice. And her linen veil is drying and beginning once again comfortingly to flutter with her breath, and, perched alone, and glanced at covertly. By persons who do not know, they know her voice. She feels the desire to raise the veil before a mirror, to refine some of her purse's untouched material. Raise the veil, and set free the encaged, rapacious thing inside to breathe the only unclothed gas it can stomach. She feels ghastly and sad. She looks like death. Her mascara's all over the place. No one can tell. The plastic Pepsi bottle and glass cigar tube and lighter and packet of glycine bags are a shape in the corner of the rain-darkened cloth purse that rests on the floor just below her dangling clogs. Molly Notkin is standing with Rutherford Keck and Crosby Baum, an erratically bad-postured man before the school-supplied Infernatron viewer. Baum's wide back and pompadour obscure whatever's on the screen. Academics' voices sound nasal, with a cultivated stutter at sentences start. A good many of James O. Incandenza's films were silent. He was a self-acknowledged visual filmmaker. His damaged, grinning boy, Joel never got to know, because Orrin had disliked him, often carried the case with the lenses, grinning like somebody squinting into bright light that insufferable child actor, Smothergill, used to contort his face at the boy, and he'd just laugh, which sent Smothergill into tantrums that Miriam Prickett would resolve in the bathroom somehow. An old Latin revival CD issues at acceptable volume from the speakers screwed into planters and hung with thin chains from each corner of the cream ceiling. Another large loose group is dancing in the cleared space between the cluster of directorial chairs and the bedroom door, most favoring Year of the Depend Adult Undergarments Minimal Mambo, this autumn's East Coast anti-craze, the dancers appearing to be just this side of standing still, the subtlest possible hints of fingers snapping under right-angled elbows. Orin and Condenza, she has not forgotten, had a poor mottled, swollen elbow above a forearm the size of a leg of lamb. He had switched neatly from arm to leg. Joel was Orin Incandenza's only lover for twenty-six months and his father's optical beloved for twenty-one. A foreign academic with an almost Franciscan bald spot has the swirling limp of someone with a prosthesis hired by MIT after her time. The better dancers' movements are so tiny they are evocative and compel watching their near-static mass, curdled and bent somehow, subtly around one beautiful young woman, quite beautiful, her back undulating minimally, in a thin, tight, blue-and-white striped, sailorish top, as she alludes to a cha-cha, with maracas empty of anything to rattle, watching herself almost dance in the full-length mirror of quality plate that after Orin left, Joel had forbidden Jim to hang, and had slid beneath her bed face down. Now it's the west wall's framed mirror, hung between two empty ornate gilt frames. Notkin thinks she's been retro-ironic by having the frames themselves framed, in rather less ornate frames, in wry allusion to the early experialist fashion of making art out of the accessories of artistic presentation. The framed frames, hanging not quite evenly on either side of the mirror he'd cut for the scenes, of that last, ghastly thing he'd made her stand before, reciting in the openly empty tones she'd gone on to use on air. The girl stands, transfixed in alternating horizontal blue and white, then vertically sliced by bar-cut sunlight, diced, drunk, so wrecked on good vintage her lips hang slack, and the reflected cheeks' muscles have lost all integrity, and the cheeks jiggle like the outstanding paps in her little sailor's top. Apocalyptic rouge, and a nose ring, that's either electrified or is catching bits of light from the window. She is watching herself with unselfconscious fascination in the only serviceable mirror here outside the bathroom. This absence of shame at the self-obsession. Is she Canadian? Mirror cult? Not possibly 
A U-H-I-D, the bearing's all wrong. But now, whispered to by a near motionless man in an equestrian helmet, she turns abruptly, falling away from her own reflection, to explain, not to the man so much as no one in particular, the whole dancing mass. I was just looking up my tits, she says, looking down at herself. Aren't they beautiful? And it's moving. There's something so heartbreakingly sincere in what she says Joel wants to go to her. Tell her it is, and we'll be completely all right. She's pronounced beautiful, like the earlier interested in four syllables, splitting the diphthong, betraying her class and origin, with the heartbreaking openness Joel's always viewed as either terribly stupid or terribly brave. The girl raising her striped arms in triumph, or artless thanks, for being constructed this way. These tits, built by whom and for whom never occurring, artlessly ecstatic. She is not drunk, Joel now sees, but has taken ecstasy, Joel can see, from the febrile flush and eyes jacked so wide you can make out brain meat behind the ball's poles, also known as X or MDMA, a beta something, an early synthetic, emotional acid, the love drug, so-called, big among the artistic young under, say, Bush and successors, since fallen into relative disuse because its pulverizing hangover has been linked to the impulsive use of automatic weapons in public venues, a hangover that makes a freebase hangover look like a day at the emotional beach. The difference between suicide and homicide consisting perhaps only in where you think you discern the cage's door. Would she kill somebody else to get out of the cage? Was the allegedly fatally entertaining and scopophiliac thing Jim alleges he made out of her unveiled face here at the start of the year of the trial-sized dove bar a cage or really a door? Had he even cut the tape into something coherent? There was nothing coherent in the mother-death cosmology and apologies she'd repeated over and over, inclined over that auto-wobbled lens propped up in the plaid-sided pram. He never let her see it, not even the dailies. He killed himself less than ninety days later. Fewer than ninety days? How much must a person want out to put his head in a microwave oven? A dim woman all the kids had known of in Boaz had put her cat in a microwave to dry it after a tick bath and set the oven just on defrost, and the cat ended up all over the woman's kitchen's walls. How would you rig the thing so it would activate with the door open? Is there some sort of refrigerator light button you could hold down and secure with tape? Would the tape melt? She cannot remember thinking of it once in four years. Did she kill him, somehow, just inclining, veilless, over that lens? The woman in love with her own breasts is being congratulated with the subtlest possible allusions to clapping hands from barely animate dancers with their glass tulips held between their teeth. And Vogelsong of Emerson College tries suddenly to stand on his head and is immediately ill in a spreading plum-colored ectoplasm the dancers do not even try to evade the spread of. And Joel applauds the ecstatic woman as well, because they are, Joel admits freely, the paps. They are attractive, which in the union is designated compelling within compatible relative limits. Joel has no problem seeing beauty approved within compatible relative limits. She feels not empathy or maternal nurture any longer, just a desire to swallow every last drop of saliva she will ever manufacture and exit this vessel, have fifteen more minutes of too much fun, eliminate her own map with the afflatus of the blind god of all doorless cages. And she lets herself slide forward from Melia's lap, a tiny fall, leading with her lumpy purse, and glass of mad apple juice toward the door beyond the lines of a becalmed conga and doorwayed huddles of a warm and well-felt theoretical party. And then again delays, dithers, and the easement to the bathroom is blocked. She is the only veiled woman here, and an academic generation ahead of most of these candidates, and rather feared 
even though not many know she is an aural personality, feared for quitting instead of failing. And because of the connection of the memory of Jim, and she is given a certain wide social berth, allowed to delay and orbit and stand, unengaged at the fringes of shifting groups, obliquely glanced at, veil going concave at each in-breath, waiting with hip-shot nonchalance for the bathroom off the bedroom to clear. Aya Carino, the chaplain archivist, and a jaundiced yellow older man have gone into Molly's bedroom and left the door ajar, waiting nonchalantly, ignoring the foreign academic who wishes to know where she works with that veil, turning from him rudely, brain heaving in its bone box, memorizing every detail like collecting empty shells, sipping cloudy juice under neatly lifted corners of veil, now looking at instead of through the translucent cloth, the improbably deformed equivalent of closing the eyes in concentration, on sound, letting the very last party wash over her, passed gracefully by different mingling guests, and once or twice almost touched, seeing only inrushing and then billowing white, listening to different mingling voices, the way the unveiled young taste wine. Uh, th this is a technologically constituted space. Thing opens tight on Remington in a hideous grandfatherly flannel suit, black and white, straight full frontal shot on this grainy black and white stuff Bouvier taught him to manipulate the F-stop to mimic that horrid old Super 8, straight full frontal, staring past the camera, no attempt to disguise he's reading off a prompter, monotone and all, saying... Few foreigners realize that the German term Berliner is also the vulgate idiom for a common jelly donut. And thus Kennedy's seminal Ich bin ein Berliner was greeted by the Teutonic crowds with a delight only apparently political. At which point he aims his thumb and finger at his own temple, at which point his T.A. doubles the focal length. So there's this giant... I would die to defend your constitutional right to error, friend. But in this one case, you... Uh, th th they used to be less beautiful, but then Rutherford said to quit sleeping face down. No, no, I'm saying that this, this whole thing, what you and I are discoursing within, is a technologically constituted space. <laughs> Ad nous savons foi au poison. It's good cheese, but I've had better cheese. Uh, m m m man wearing this is K Kirby. Kirby, he is in pain. He's been telling me about it, and now he'd like to tell you about it. Complete mystery why Eve Plum didn't show. It's known she'd re-up for the part. The whole rest of them were there, even Henderson. And that Davis woman is Alice, who had to be wheeled out under nurse's care. My God, and Peter? Looking as if he'd eaten nothing but pastry for the past forty years. Greg with that absurd hairpiece and snakeskin boots. Yes, but all the kids recognizable underneath somehow this pre-digital insistence on continuity through time that was the project's whole magic and raison. You know this. You're current on pre-digital phenomenology and Brady theory. And then, but now, here's this entirely incongruous middle-aged black woman playing Jan. <laughs> Balls. An incongruous central blackness could have served to accentuate the terrible whiteness that had been in any luck. The entire historical effect of a seminal program was horribly, horribly altered. Terribly altered. Uh, Eisenstein and Kurosawa and Michaud walk into a bar. Do you know these mass market cartridges for the masses? The ones that are so bad they are somehow perversely good? This was worse than that. So-called phantom, but real and mobile. First the spine, then not the spine, but the right eye socket. Then the old sockets fit as a fiddle, but the thumb, <laughs> the thumb doubles me over. It won't stay put. Fucks with the emotions gradient so that all the tesseract's angles appear to be right angles. Except in... So what I did, I sat up right next to him, you see. So, in a sense, he didn't have room to stalk or draw a bead. 
Keck had said they needed a good ten meters, so I, I cocked the hat just so, just ever so slightly, l like so, just cocked it over to the side like so, and sat down practically on the man's knee, asked after his show carp. Uh, he, he keeps pedigreed carp. <laughs> and, of course, you can imagine what... Uh, the more interesting issue from a Heideggerian perspective is a priori, where the space as a concept is inframed by technology as a concept. It has mobile cunning, a kind of wraith or phantom-like... Because they're emotional more label at that stage. So get dentures, she said. So get dentures? So who shot the incision? Who did the cinematography on the incision? Why it can be film qua film, Comstock says if it even exists, it has to be something more like an aesthetic pharmaceutical, some beastly post-annular scopophiliacal vector, supra-subliminals and that, <laughs> some kind of abstractable hypnosis, an optical dopamine cue, a recorded delusion, Duquette says he's lost contact with three colleagues. He said a good bit of Berkeley isn't answering their phone. I don't think anyone here would dispute that they're absolutely fetching tits, Melinda. We had brimis with caviar. There were tartines. We had sweetbreads and mushroom cream sauce. He said it was all on him. He said he was treating... There was roast artichoke top of the sort of fly only I <laughs> mutton stuffed with foie gras, double chocolate rum cake, seven kinds of cheese, a kiwi glossé and brandy and snifters you needed two hands to swirl. <laughs> that coke addled fag and his Morris Mini The prosthetic film scholar. Fans do not begin to keep it all in the great convexity. It creeps back in. What goes around, it comes back around. This your nation refuses to learn. It will keep creeping back in. You cannot give away your filth and prevent all creepage, no? Filth by its very nature is a thing that is creeping always back. <laughs> Me, I can remember when your Charles was café with cream. Look now at it. It is the Blue River. You have a river outside you that is robin eggs blue. I think you mean great concavity, Elaine. I mean great convexity. I know what is the thing I meant. And then it turned out he put a bacac in the brandy. It was the most horrible thing you've ever seen. Everyone, all over, spouting like whales. I'd heard the term projectile vomiting, but I never thought that I... Oof, you could aim, the pressure was such that you could aim. And out come his grad technicians from under the tablecloths like overhang, and he pulls out a canvas chair and clapper and begins filming the whole horrible, staggering, spouting, groaning. This ultimate cartridge's aesthetic death rumor has been going around like a lazy toilet since Dishmaster, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Simply make inquiries, mention some obscure foundation grant, obtain the thing through whatever shade of market the thing's alleged to be out in. <laughs> Have a look! See, there's doubtless just high-concept erotica, or an hour of rotating whirls. Or something like late Maccabio, something that's only entertaining after it's over, on reflection. The striated parallelogram of PM sunlight is elongated in transit across the co-op's eastern wall. Over bottle-laden sideboard and glass cabinet of antique editing equipment, and louvered vent and shelves of art cartridges, and their dull black and dun cases, the mole-studded man in the equestrian helmet is either winking at her or has a tick. There's the pre-suicide's classic longing. Sit down one second. I want to tell you everything. My name is Joelle Van Dyne, Dutch-Irish and I was reared on family land east of Shiny Prize, Kentucky, the only child of a low-pH chemist and his second wife. I now have no accent except under stress. I am 1.7 meters tall and weigh 48 kilograms. I occupy space and have mass. I breathe in and breathe out. Joel has never before today been conscious of the sustained 
volition required to just breathe in and breathe out. Her veil, recessing into nose and rounded mouth, and then bowing out slightly like curtains over an open pane. Convexity! Concavity! Convexity! Concavity, damn your eyes! The bathroom has a hook in a mirrored medicine cabinet over the sink and is off the bedroom. Molly Notkin's bedroom looks like the bedroom of someone who stays in bed for serious lengths of time. A pair of pantyhose has been tossed onto a lamp. There are not crumbs but whole portions of crackers protruding from the gray surf of wopsed-up bedding. A photo of the fallow neurotic New Yorker with the same fold-out triangular support as the blank cartridge's anti-ad. A ziplock of pot and easy widers and seeds in the ashtray. Books with German and Cyrillic titles lie open in spine-cracking attitudes on the colorless rug. Joelle's never liked the fact that Notkin's father's photograph is nailed at iconic height to the wall above the headboard. A systems planner out of Knoxville, Tennessee, his smile, the smile of a man who wears white loafers and a scorting carnation. And why are bathrooms always way brighter lit than whatever room they're off? On the private side of the bathroom door, she's had to take two damp towels off the top of to close all the way, the same rotten old hook for a lock never quite ever seeming to want to fit its receptacle in the jam. The party's music now some horrible collection of mollified rock classics with all soft rock's grim dental associations. The business side of the door is hung with a selective automation of Knoxville calendar from before subsidized time, and cut out photos of Kinski as Paganini, and Leo as Duanel, and a borderless still of the crowd seen in what looks like Peterson's The Lead Shoes, and rather curiously the off-printed image of J. Van Dyne, M.A.'s one and only published film theory monograph. 81. Joelle can smell through her veil in own stale exhalations, the little room's complicated spice of sandalwood rubble and a little violet-ribboned pomander and deodorant soap and the sharp, decayed lemon odor of stress diarrhea. Low-budget celluloid horror films created ambiguity and possible elision by putting a question mark after the end is what pops into her head. The end? Amid the odors of mildew and dicky academic digestion? Joelle's mother's family had no indoor plumbing. It is all right. She represses all pathetic, this will be the last thing I smell thought patterns. Joelle is going to have too much fun in here. It was beyond all else so much fun at the start. Oren had neither disapproved nor partaken. His urine was an open book because of football. Jim hadn't disapproved so much as been vacant with disinterest. His, too much, was neat bourbon, and he had lived life to the fullest and had gone in for detoxification again and again. This had been simply too much fun at the start. So much better even than nasaling the material up through rolled currency and waiting for the cold, bitter drip at the back of your throat and cleaning the newly spacious apartment to within an inch of its life while your mouth twitches and writhes unbidden beneath the veil. The base frees and condenses, compresses the whole experience to the implosion of one terrible shattering spike in the graph, an afflated orgasm of the heart that makes her feel truly attractive, sheltered by limits, deveiled and loved, observed and alone and sufficient and female. Full, as if watched for an instant, by God. She always sees, after inhaling, right at the apex of the graph's spike's tip, Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa, behind glass at the Vittoria for some reason, the saint recumbent, half-supine, her flowing stone robe lifted by the angel, in whose other hand a bare arrow is raised for that best descent, the saint's legs frozen in opening the angel's expression not charity, 
but the perfect vice of barb-headed love. The stuff had not just been her encaging God, but her lover, too, fiendish, angelic, of rock. The toilet seat is up. She can hear a helicopter's chop somewhere overhead east, a traffic helicopter over Starro, and Molly Notkin's shriek as an enormous glass crash sounds off in the living room, imagines her beard hanging aslant and her mouth ellipsed with champagne's foam as she waves off the breakage that signals, Good party! can hear through the door the ecstatic Melinda's apologies and Molly's laugh, which sounds like a shriek. Oh, everything falls off the wall sooner or later! Joelle has lifted her veil back to cover her skull like a bride. Since she threw away her pipes and bowls and screens again this a.m., she is going to have to be resourceful. On the counter of an old sink, the same not quite white as the floor and ceiling, the wallpaper is a maddening, uncountable pattern of roses twined in garlands on sticks. On the counter are an old splay-bristled toothbrush, tube of gleam rolled neatly up from the bottom, unsavory old no-coat scraper, rubber cement, negrum, depilatory ointment, tube of monostat not squeezed from the bottom, phony beard whisker bits and curled green threads of used mint floss and parapectylin, and a wholly unsqueezed tube of diaphragm foam, and no makeup but serious styling gel in a big jar with no lid and hairs around the rim, and an empty tampon box half filled with nickels and pennies and rubber bands. And Joelle sweeps an arm across the counter and squunches everything over to the side under the small rod with a washcloth wrung viciously out and dried in the tight spiral of a twisted cord. And if some items do totter and fall to the floor, it is all right because everything eventually has to fall. On the cleared counter goes Joelle's misshapen purse. The absence of veil dulls the bathroom's smells somehow. She's been resourceful before, but this is the most deliberate Joelle has been able to be about it in something like a year. From the purse, she removes the plastic Pepsi container, a box of wooden matches kept dry in a resealable baggie, two little thick glycine bags, each holding four grams of pharmaceutical-grade cocaine, a single-edge razor blade, increasingly tough to find, a little black Kodachrome canister whose gray lid she pops and discards to reveal baking soda, sifted fine as talc, the empty glass cigar tube, a folded square of Reynolds wrap foil the size of a playing card, and an amputated length of the bottom of a quality wire coat hanger. The overhead light casts shadows of her hands over what she needs, so she turns on the light over the medicine cabinet's mirror as well. The light stutters and hums and bathes the counter with cold lithium-free fluorescence. She undoes the four pins and removes the veil from her head and places it on the counter with the rest of the material. Lady Delphina's little glycine baglets have clever seals that are green when sealed and blue and yellow when not. She taps half a glycine's worth into the cigar tube and adds half again as much baking soda, spilling some of the soda in a parenthesis of bright white on the counter. This is the most deliberate she's been able to be in at least a year. She turns the sink's C knob and lets the water get really cold, then cranks the volume back to a trickle and fills the rest of the tube to the top with water. She holds the tube up straight and gently taps on its side with a blunt, unpainted nail, watching the water slowly darken the powders beneath it. She produces a double rows of flame in the mirror that illuminates the right side of her face as she holds the tube over the match's flame and waits for the stuff to begin to bubble. She uses two matches, twice. When the tube gets too hot to hold, she takes and folds her veil and uses it as a kind of oven mitt over the fingers of her left hand, careful, from habit and experience, not to let the bottom corners get close enough to the flame to brown. After it's bubbled for just a second, Joelle shakes out the matches with a flourish and tosses them in the toilet to hear that briefest of hisses. She takes up the black wire prod from the hanger 
and begins to stir and mash the just bubbled stuff in the tube, feeling it thicken quickly and its resistance to the wire's tiny circles increase. It was when her hands started to tremble during this part of the cooking procedure that she'd first known she liked this more than anyone can like anything and still live. She is not stupid. The Charles, rolling away far below the windowless bathroom, is livid blue, more mildly blue, on top from the fresh rainwater that had made purple rings appear and widen, a deeper magic marker-type blue below the dilute layer, gulls stamped to the cleared sky, motionless as kites. A bulky thump sounds from behind the large flat-top Enfield Hill on the river's south shore. A large but relatively shapeless projectile of drums wrapped in brown postal paper and belted with twine, hurtling in a broad upward arc that bothers the gulls into dips and wheels. The brown package quickly a pinpoint in the yet hazy sky to the north, where a yellow-brown cloud hangs just above the line between sky and terrain, its top slowly dispersing and opening out, so that the cloud looks like a not very pretty sort of waste basket, waiting. Inside, Joel hears only a bit of the bulky thump, which could be anything. The only other thing besides what she's about to do too much of here right now she'd ever come close to feeling this way about. In Joel's childhood, Paducah, not too bad a drive from Shiny Prize, still had a few public movie theaters, six and eight separate auditoria clustered in single honeycombs at the edges of interstate malls. The theaters always ended in flex, she reflected. The this Oplex and that Oplex. It had never struck her as odd, and she never saw even one film there, as a girl, that she didn't just about die with love for. It didn't matter what they were. She and her own personal daddy up in the front row. They sat in the front rows of the narrow little over-insulated plexes up in neck crick territory and let the screen fill their whole visual field her hand in his lap and their big box of Cracker Jacks in her hand, and soda pops secure in little rings cut out of the plastic of their seat's arms. And he, always with a wooden match in the corner of his mouth, pointing up into the rectangular world at this one or that one. Performers, giant, flawless, 2D beauties iridescent on the screen, telling Joel over and over again, how she was prettier than this one or that one right there. Standing in the placid line, as he bought the Plex's paper tickets that looked like grocery receipts, knowing that she was going to love the celluloid entertainment no matter what it was, wonderfully innocent, still thinking quality referred to the living teddy bears and Qantas commercials. Standing, handheld, eyes even with his wallet's back pocket bulge, she never so much again as in that line felt so taken care of. Destined for big screen entertainment's unalloyed good fun. Never once again until starting in with this lover, cooking and smoking it five years back, before Incandenza's death at the start. The punter never made her feel quite so taken care of. Never made her feel about to be entered by something that didn't know she was there, and yet was all about making her feel good anyway, coming in. Entertainment is blind. The improbable thing of the whole thing is that when the soda and water and cocaine are mixed right and heated right and stirred just right as the mix cools down, then when the stuff's too stiff to stir and is finally ready to come on out, it comes out slick as shit from a goat. Just an inverted ketchup bottle thump, and out the son of a fucking horse lines, one molded cylinder hardened onto the black wire, its snout round from the glass tube's bottom. The average pre-chopped freebase rock looks like a 38 round. What Joel now slides with three Phillips from the cigar tube is a monstrous white wiener, a county fair corn dog. Its sides a bit rough, like mache. A couple clots left on the inside of the tube that are what you forage and smoke before the chore boys and panties. She is now a little under two deliberate minutes from too much fun for any one mortal to hope to endure. 
Her unveiled face in the dirty lip mirror is shocking in the intensity of its absorption. Out in the bedroom doorway, she can hear Reeves Mainwaring telling some helium-voiced girl that life is essentially one long search for an ashtray. Too much fun. She uses the razor blade to cross-section chunks out of the freebase wiener. You can't whittle thin deli-shaved flakes off because they'll crumble back to powder right away, and they anyway don't smoke as well as you'd think. Blunt chunks are standard operating procedure. Joelle chops out enough chunks for maybe twenty good-sized hits. They form a little quarry on the soft cloth of her folded veil on the counter. Her Brazilian skirt is no longer damp. Reeves, Mainwaring's blonde imperial, often had little bits of food residue in it. The ecstasy of St. Teresa is on perpetual display at the Vittoria in Rome, and she never got to see it. She will never again say, and lo, and invite people to watch darkness dance on the face of the deep. The Face of the Deep had been the title she'd suggested for Jim's unseen last cartridge, which he'd said would be too pretentious, and then used that skull fragment out of the Hamlet graveyard scene instead, which, talk about pretentious, she'd laughed. His frightened look when she'd laughed is, for the life of her, the last facial expression memory she can remember of the man. Orrin had referred to his father sometimes as himself, and sometimes as the mad stork, and once in a slip as the sad stork. She lights one wooden match and blows it right out and touches the hot black head to the side of the plastic pop bottle. It melts right through and makes a little hole. The helicopter is probably a traffic helicopter. Somebody at their academy had had some connection to some traffic helicopter that had had an accident. She can't for the life of her. Mm, no one out there knows she is in here getting ready to have too much. She can hear Molly Notkin calling through rooms about, Has anyone seen Keck? In her first theory seminar, Reeves Mainwaring had called one film wretchedly ill-conceived and another desperately acquiescent, and Molly Notkin had pretended to have a coughing fit, and it had a Tennessee accent, and that was how they met. The Reynolds wrap is to make a screen that will rest in the bottle's open top. A regular dub screen is the size of a thimble, its sides spread out like an opening bud. Joelle uses the point of some curved nail scissors on the back of the toilet to poke tiny holes in the rectangle of aluminum foil and shapes it into a shallow funnel large enough to siphon gasoline, narrowing its tip to fit in the bottle's mouth. She now owns a pipe with a monster-sized bowl and screen now and puts in enough chunklets to make five or six hits at once. The little rocks lie there piled and yellow-white. She puts her lips experimentally to the melted hole in the side of the bottle and draws, then, very deliberately, lights another match and extinguishes it and makes the hole bigger. The idea that she'll never see Molly Notkin or the Cerebral Union or her UHID support brothers and sisters, or the YYY engineer, or Uncle Bud on a roof, or her stepmother in the locked ward, or her poor personal daddy again, is sentimental and banal. The idea of what she's about in here contains all other ideas and makes them banal. Her glass of juice is on the back of the toilet, half empty. The back of the toilet is lightly sheened with condensation of unknown origin. These are facts. This room in this apartment is the sum of very many specific facts and ideas. There is nothing more to it than that. Deliberately setting about to make her heart explode has assumed the status of just one of these facts. It was an idea, but now is about to become a fact. The closer it comes to becoming concrete, the more abstract it seems. Things get very abstract. The concrete room was the sum of abstract facts. Are facts abstract, or are they just abstract representations of concrete things? 
Molly Notkin's middle name is Cantrell. Joel puts two more matches together and prepares to strike them, breathing rapidly in and out like a diver preparing for a long descent. I say, is someone in there? The voice is the young post-new formalist from Pittsburgh who affects Continental and wears an ascot that won't stay tight. With that hesitant knocking of when you know perfectly well someone's in there, the bathroom door composed of 36, that's three times a lengthwise 12, recessed two beveled squares in a warped rectangle of steam-softened wood, not quite white, the bottom outside corner right here raw wood and mangled from hitting the cabinet's bottom drawer's wicked metal knob, through the door and offset red and glowering actors and calendar and very crowded scene and pubic spiral of pale blue smoke from the elephant-colored rubble of ash and little blackened chunks in the foil funnel's cone. The smoke's baby blanket blue that sent her sliding down along the wall past knotted washcloth, towel rack, blood flower wallpaper, and intricately grimed electrical outlet. The light, sharp, bitter tint of a heated sky's blue that's left her uprightly fetal with chin on knees and yet another North American bathroom. Deveiled, too pretty for words. Maybe the prettiest girl of all time. Prettiest G-O-A-T. Knees to chest, slew-footed by the radiant chill of the claw-footed tub's porcelain. Molly's had somebody lacquer the tub in blue lacquer. She's holding the bottle, recalling vividly its slogan for the last generation was, The Choice of a Nude Generation, when she was of back pocket height and prettier by far than any of the peach-colored titans they'd gazed up at. His hand in her lap, her hand in the box, and rooting down past candy for the prize, more fun, way too much fun, inside her veil on the counter above her. The stuff in the funnel exhausted. Though it's still smoking thinly, its graph reaching its highest spiked prick, peak, the arrow's best descent, so good she can't stand it, and reaches out for the cold tub's rim's cold edge to pull herself up, as the white party noise reaches for her, the sort of stereophonic precipice of volume, to teeter on just before the speaker's blow, people barely twitching, and conversations strattering against a ghastly old pre-Carter thing saying, We've only just begun. Joelle's limbs have been removed to a distance, where their acknowledgement of her commands seems like magic, both clogs simply gone, nowhere in sight, and socks oddly wet, pulls her face up to face the unclean medicine cabinet mirror twin roses of flame still hanging in the glasses corner, hair of the flame she's eaten now trailing like the legs of wasps through the air of the glass she uses to locate the defaced veil and what's inside it, loading up the cone again, the ashes from the last load make the world's best filter. This is a fact. Breathes in and out like a savvy diver. Look here, then. Who's that in there? Is someone in there? I do open up. I'm on one foot, then the other out here. I say, Notkin, someone's been in here, locked in and, well, sounding unwell. I mean, rather a queer scent. And as knelt, vomiting over the lip of the cool blue tub, gouges on the tub's lip revealing sandy, white, gritty stuff below the lacquer and porcelain, vomiting muddy juice and blue smoke and dots of mercuric red into the claw-footed trough, and can hear again, and seems to see, against the fire of her closed lid's blood, bladed vessels aloft in the night to monitor flow, searchlit helicopters, fat fingers of blue light from one sky, searching. Enfield, Massachusetts, is one of the stranger little facts that make up the idea that is Metro Boston, because it is a township composed almost entirely of medical, corporate, and spiritual facilities. A kind of arm shape extending north from Commonwealth Avenue and separating Brighton into upper and lower, its elbow nudging East Newton's ribs and its fist sunk into Alston, and Field's broad municipal tax base includes St. Elizabeth's Hospital, Franciscan Children's Hospital, the Universal Bleacher Company, the Provident Nursing Home, Shuko Mist Medical Pressure Systems, Incorporated, the Enfield Marine Public Health Hospital Complex, the Svelte Nail Company, 
half the Metro Boston turbine and generating stations of Sun Strand Power and Light. The part that gets taxed is in Incorporated Alston. Corporate headquarters for the ATH SCME family of air displacement effectuators, meaning they make really big fans. The Enfield Tennis Academy, St. John of God Hospital, Hahnemann Orthopedic Hospital, the Leisure Time Ice Company, a Discalced Monastery, the Combined St. John Seminary and offices for the RCC's Boston Archdiocese, partly in Upper Brighton, neither half-taxed, Convent Headquarters of the Sisters for Africa, the National Craniofacial Pain Foundation, the Dr. George Roebling Runyon Memorial Institute for Podiatric Research, Regional Shiny Truck, Lion Barge, and Catapult Facilities for the ONAN-subsidized Empire Waste Displacement Company, what the Quebecois call Les Très Boucher Noirs, spectacular block-long catapults that make a sound like a giant stamping foot as they fling great twine-bundled waste vehicles into the subannular regions of the Great Concavity at a parabolic altitude exceeding five kilometers. The device's slings are of alloy-belted elastic, and they're huge cupped vehicle receptacles like catcher's mitts from hell. A half dozen or so of the catapults in this blimp, hangarish thing, with a selectively slide-backable roof, taking up a good six square blocks of Enfield's Brackerform incursion into the Alston Spur, occasional school tours tolerated but not encouraged, and so on. With the whole flexed Enfield limb, sleeved in a perimeter layer of light residential and mercantile properties. The Enfield Tennis Academy occupies probably now the nicest site in Enfield. Some ten years after balding and shaving flat, the top of the big abrupt hill that constitutes a kind of raised cyst on the township's elbow. The better part of seventy-five hectares of broad lawns and clover-leafing paths and topologically cutting-edge erections 32 asphalt tennis courts and 16 hard true composition tennis courts, and extensive underground maintenance and storage, and athletic training facilities, and briars, and calliopsis and pines mixed artfully in on the inclines with deciduous trees. The ETA hilltop overlooking on one side, east, historic Commonwealth Avenue's acclimated migration out of the squalor of Lower Brighton. Liquor stores, and laundromats, and bars, and palisades of somber and guano-dappled tenement facades. The huge and brooding Brighton Project high-rises, with three-story high orange ID numerals on the side, plus liquor stores, and pale men in leather, and whole gangs of pale children in leather on the corners, and Greek-owned pizza places with yellow walls and dirty corner markets owned by Orientals, who try like heck to keep their sidewalks clean, but can't, even with hoses, plus the quarter-hourly trundle and ding of the Green Line trains labor up the avenue's long rise to Boston College, into the spiky elegance of Boston College and the broad gentrification of Newton out to the west, where the haze, haloed Boston sun drops behind the last node in the four-kilometer sine wave that is collectively called the historic April Marathon's Heartbreak Hill, the sun always setting 15 minutes to the nanosecond after DeLent turns on the court's high tower lights. Two, I think it must be the southwest, ETA overlooks the steely gray tangle of sun strands transformers and high voltage grids and coaxial chokers strung with beads of ceramic insulators with not one sun strand smokestack anywhere in sight but a monstrous mega-ohm insulator cluster at the terminus of a string of signs trailing in from the northeast, each sign talking with many zeros about how many annular-generated amps are waiting underground for anyone who digs or in any way dicks around, with hair-raising nonverbal stick-figure symbols of somebody with a shovel going up like a Kleenex in a fireplace. There are smokestacks in the visual background slightly south of Sunstrand, though, from the EWD hangars, each stack with a monstrous ATH SCME 2100 series ADE fan bolted behind it and blowing due north 
with an insistent high-pitched fury that is somehow soothing, orally, at ETA's distance and height. From both the north and northeast tree lines, ETA looks down its hill's steepest, best-planted decline into the complexly decaying grounds of Enfield Marine. The 5th of November, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment The transparent phone sounded from somewhere under the hill of bedding as Hal was on the edge of the bed with one leg up and his chin on its knee, clipping his nails into a waste basket that sat several meters away in the middle of the room. 82 It took four rings to find the receiver in the bedding and pull the antenna out. Yellow... Mr. Incondenso, this is the Enfield Raw Sewage Commission, and quite frankly, we've had enough shit out of you. Hello, Warren. How hangs it, kid? God, please no. Please, oh, no more separatism questions. Relax, never cross my mind. Social call. Shoot the breeze. Interesting you should call just now, because I'm clipping my toenails into a wastebasket several meters away. Jesus, you know how I hate the sound of nail clippers. Except I'm shooting 70-plus percent. The little fragments of clipping, it's uncanny. I keep wanting to go out in the hall and get somebody in here to see it. But I don't want to break the spell. The fragile magic spell feel of those intervals where it feels you just can't miss. It's definitely one of those can't-miss intervals. It's just like that magical feeling on those rare days out there playing... Playing out of your head, Delink calls it. Loach calls it the zone. Being in the zone. Those days when you feel perfectly calibrated. Coordinated as God. Some groove in the shape of the air of the day guides everything down and in. When you feel like you couldn't miss if you tried to. I'm so far away, the wastebasket's mouth looks more like a slot than a circle. And yet, in they go. Ka-ching, ka-ching. There went another one. Even the misses are near misses. Karam's off the rim. I'm sitting here with the leg in a whirlpool in the bathroom of a Norwegian deep tissue therapist's ranch-style house, 1,100 meters up in the Superstition Mountains. Mesa Scottsdale in flames far below. The bathroom's redwood paneled and overlooks a precipice. The sunlight's the color of the bronze. But you never know when the magic will descend on you. You never know when the grooves will open up, and once the magic descends, you don't want to change even the smallest detail. You don't know what concordance of factors and variables yields that calibrated can't-miss feeling. And you don't want to soil the magic by trying to figure it out, but you don't want to change your grip, your stick, your side of the court, your angle of incidence to the sun. Your heart's in your throat every time you change sides of the court. You start to get like a superstitious native. What's the word? Propitiate the divine spell. I suddenly understand the Gesundheit impulse. Assault over the shoulder and apotropiac barn signs. I'm actually frightened to switch feet now. I'm clipping off the tiniest aerodynamically viable clippings possible to prolong the time on this foot, in case the magic's a function of the foot. This isn't even the good foot. These can't-miss intervals make superstitious natives out of all of this halley. The professional football players may be the worst superstitious native of all the sports. That's why all the high-tech padding and garish lycra and complex play terminology, the, like, self-reassuring display of high-tech, because the bug-eyed natives lurking just under the surface we know, the bug-eyed, spear-rattling, grass-skirted primitive, feeding virgins to Popogatapec and afraid of planes. The new discursive OED says... The Ots of Vancouver used to cut virgins' throats and pour the blood very carefully into the orifices of the embalmed bodies of their ancestors. I can hear those clippers. Quit with the clippers a second. The phone's no longer wedged under my jaw. Ha! I can even do it one-handed, holding the phone in one hand, but it's still the same foot. You don't know from true bug-eyed athletic superstition till you hit the pro ranks, Allie. When you hit the show is when you'll understand primitive. Winning streaks bring the native bubbling up to the surface. Jock straps unwashed game after game until they stand up by themselves in the overhead luggage compartments of planes. Bizarrely ritualized dressing, eating, <laughs> peeing. 
Make duration. Picture a 200 kilo interior lineman insisting on sitting down to pee. Don't even ask what wives and girlfriends have to suffer during a can't miss winning streak. I don't want to hear sexual stuff. Then there are the players who write down exactly what they say to everybody before a game. So if it's a magical can't miss type game, they can say exactly the same things to the same people in the same exact order before the next game. Apparently the aunts tried to fill up ancestors' bodies completely with virgin blood to preserve the privacy of their own mental states. The opposite aunt dictum here being, quote, the sated ghost cannot see secret things. The discursive OED postulates that this is one of the earlier on-record prophylactics against schizophrenia. Hey, Hallie. After a burial, rural Papineau region Quebecers purportedly drill a small hole down from the ground level all the way down through the lid of the coffin to let out the soul if it wants out. Hey, Hallie, I think I'm being followed. This is a big moment. I've totally exhausted the left foot finally, and I'm switching to the right foot. This will be the real test of the fragility of the spell. I said I think I'm being followed. Some men are born to lead, oh. I'm serious, and here's the weird part. Here's the part that explains why you're sharing this with your estranged little brother instead of with anybody whose credulity you'd actually value. The weird part is, I think I'm being followed by... by handicapped people. Two for three on the right foot, with one carom. Jury's still out. Quit the clipping a second. I'm not kidding. Take the other day, I strike up a conversation with a certain subject in line in the post office. I notice a guy in a wheelchair behind us. No big deal. Are you listening? What are you doing going to the post office? You hate snail mail. And you quit mailing the moms the pseudo-form replies two years ago, Mario says. But so the conversation goes well and hits it off. Seduction strategies 12 and 16 are employed, which I'll tell you about sometime at length. The point is... The subject and I walk out together, hitting it off, and there's another guy in a wheelchair, whittling in the shade of a shop awning just down the street. Okay. Still, not necessarily any kind of deal. But now the subject and I drive to her trailer park. Phoenix has trailer parks? Not those silverish metal trailers. So, but we get out of the car and across the park's lot. Here's yet another wheelchair guy, trying to maneuver in the gravel and not making a very good job of it. Doesn't Arizona have more than its share of the old and infirm? But none of these handicapped guys were old. They were all awfully burly for guys in wheelchairs. And three in an hour's kind of stretching it, I was thinking. I always picture you having your little trysts in more domestic suburban settings. Or else tall motels with exotically shaped beds. Do women in metal trailers even have small children? This one had very sweet little twin girls who played very quietly with blocks without supervision the whole time. Huh. Cockle warming, oh. And but, so the point is, I decamp the trailer, like, X number of hours later, and the guy's still there, mired in gravel. And in the distance, I could swear, he's got on some kind of domino mask. And now everywhere I go the last several days, there seems to be a statistically improbable number of wheelchaired figures around, lurking, somehow just a, a little too nonchalantly. Very shy fans, possibly? Some club of leg dysfunctional people all obsessed in that shy fan-like way with one of the first North American sports figures people think of in connection with the word leg? It's probably my imagination. A dead bird fell in my jacuzzi. But now let me ask you a couple questions. This all wasn't even why I originally called. But you brought up trailer parks and trailers. I need to confirm some suspicions. Uh, two points! Yeah, right in there, ka -ching. Never having been in a trailer, and even the discursive OED having pretty much of a lacuna where trailer park trailers are concerned. And this is the one supposedly non-bat family member I call. This is who I reach out to. It'd be whom, I think. But this trailer, this lady you met's trailer, confirm or deny the following. Its carpet was wall-to-wall -wall and extremely thin, a kind of burnt yellow or orange. Yes. The living room or like den area contained some or all of the following. 
a black velvet painting featuring an animal, a videophonic diorama on some sort of knick-knack shelf, a needlepoint sampler with some kind of frothy biblical saw on it, at least one piece of chintz furniture with protective doilies on the arms, a smoke-begone air filtration ashtray, the last couple of years readers' digests neatly displayed in their own special inclined magazine rack. Check on velvet painting of leopard, sampler sofa with doilies, ashtray. Mm, no readers' digests. This isn't especially funny, Hallie. The moms comes out in you in these odd little ways sometimes. The last one. The trailer person's name. Um, Jean. May. Nora. Vera. Uh, and Nora Jean or Vera May. That was my question. I guess I'll have to get back to you on that. Boy, you really put the small R in romance, don't you? But why I'm calling, it's not clear whether the fragile can't miss magic's still in force on the right foot. I'm seven for nine, but there's a whole different feel of somehow deliberately trying to get them in. Hallie! I've got somebody from Moment Fucking Magazine out here doing a, quote, soft profile. You've got, what? A human interest thing, on me as a human. Moment doesn't do hard sports, this lady says. They're more people-oriented, human interest. It's for something called, quote, people right now, a section. Moment's a supermarket checkout lane display magazine. It's in there with the Rodneys and gum. Lateral Alice Moore reads it. It's all over CT's waiting room. They did a thing on the little blind Illinois kid Thorpe thought so well of. Al... I think Lateral Alice spends a lot of time in grocery store checkout lanes, which, if you think about it, are almost the ideal environment for her. Hal, being that she can just locomote sideways right on through. Hallie! This physically imposing moment girl's asking all these soft, profile-esque family background questions. She wants to know about himself? Everybody! You? The mad stork? The moms? It's gradually emerging it's going to be some sort of memorial to the stork as patriarch. Everybody's talents and accomplishments profiled as some sort of refracted tribute to El Storco's careers. He always did cast a long shadow, you said. Of course, and my first thought is to invite her to go piss up a string. But Moment's been in touch with the team. The front office has indicated a soft profile would be positive for the team. Cardinal Stadium isn't exactly groaning under the weight of all the fannies, winning streak or no. I've also thought of referring her to Bane. Let Bane rant at her, or send her letters, just trying to unparse for quotes and take her a month. Her as in female, not your typical Oren-type subject, a hardened, fast-lane, gum-cracking, maybe even small, childless, journalist-type female, in from New York, on the red eye. Mm, plus, you said imposing. Not all that tough or hard, but physically imposing. Large, but not unerotic. A girl and a half, <laughs> in all directions. A girl to dominate the space of any trailer she lives in. Enough with the trailerisms. The strained quality is me trying to speak and pick caromed toenail pairings up off the floor at the same time. This girl's immune to most of your standard conversational distractions. You're afraid you're losing your touch? An immune girl and a half? I said distraction, not seduction. You kind of wisely avoid any female who you suspect could beat you up if things came down to that. She's more imposing than like most of our starting backfield, but weirdly sexy. The linemen are gaga. The tackles keep making all these cracks about does she maybe want to see their hard profile. Let's hope her prose is better than whoever did the human interest thing on the blind kid last spring. Have you bounced this new fear of the handicapped off her? Listen, you of all people should know I have zero intent of forthrightly answering any stained family linen type questions from anybody, much less somebody who takes shorthand, physical charms or no. You in tennis, you in the saints, himself in tennis, the moms and Quebec and Royal Victoria, the moms and immigration, himself and annulation, himself and Lyle, 
himself and distilled spirits, himself killing himself, you and Joel, himself and Joel, the moms and CT, you versus the moms, ETA, non-existent films, etc. But you can see how it's all going to get me thinking. How to avoid being forthright about the stork material unless I know what the really forthright answers would be. Everybody said you'd regret not coming to the funeral, but I don't think this is what they meant. For example, the stork took himself down before C.T. moved in upstairs at the headmaster's house, or after. This is you asking me? Don't make this appalling for me, Hal. I wouldn't dream of even trying. Immediately before. Two, three days before. C.T. had had uh, what's now... The Lentz room, next to Stitz in Comad. And Dad knew they were... very close? I don't know, Oh, You don't know? Mario might know. Like to chew the fat with Boo Boo on this, O? Oh? Don't make this like this, Hallie. A and Dad? Uh, the mad stork put his head in the oven. The microwave, Oh. The rotisserie microwave over next to the fridge, on the freezer side, on the counter, under the cabinet, with the plates and bowls to the left of the fridge as you face the fridge. A microwave oven. That is a Raj and Wilk, oh. Nobody ever said a microwave. I think it came out generally at the funeral. I keep getting your point if you're wondering. So, where was he found then? Twenty for twenty-eight is what, uh, sixty-five percent? It's not like this is all that... The microwave was in the kitchen. I already explained, oh. All right. All right. So, okay, now. Who would you say speaks most about the guy? Keeps his memory alive, verbally. The most now. Uh, you, C.T., or the moms? I think it's a three-way tie. So it's never mentioned. Nobody talks about him. It's taboo. But you seem to be forgetting somebody. Mario talks about him. About it. Sometimes. To what and or who all this talking? To me, for one, I suppose. And so you do talk about it, but only to him, and only after he initiates it. Oren, I lied. I haven't even started on the right foot yet. I've been too afraid to change my angle of approach to the nails. The right foot's a whole different angle of approach. I'm afraid the magic is left foot dependent. I'm like your superstitious lineman. Talking about it's broken the spell. Now I'm self-conscious and afraid. I've been sitting here on the edge of the bed with my right knee up under my chin, poised, studying the foot, frozen with aboriginal terror, and lying about it to my own brother. Can I ask you who it was who found him? His... Uh, who found him at the oven? Found by one Harold James in Condenza, thirteen going on really old. You were who found him? Not the moms? Listen, may I ask why this sudden interest after four years, 216 days, and with two years of that not even once even calling... I've already said I don't feel safe not answering Helen's questions if I haven't got a handle on what I'm not saying. Helen, so you did, is why. I'm still frozen, by the way. The self-consciousness that kills the magic is getting worse and worse. This is why Pemulus and Trolch always seem to let a lead slip away. The standard term is tightening up. The clippers are poised, blades on either side of the nail... I just can't achieve the unconsciousness to actually clip. Maybe it was cleaning up the few that missed. Suddenly the wastebasket seems small and far away. I've lost the magic by talking about it instead of just giving into it. Launching the nail out toward the wastebasket now seems like an exercise in telemetry. You mean telemetry? How embarrassing. When the skills go, they go. Listen. You know... Why don't you go ahead and ask me whatever standard ghoulish questions you want not to answer? This may be your only shot. Usually I seem not to talk about it. Um, was she there? The PGOAT? 
Joel hadn't been around the ground since you two split up. You know about that. Himself met her at the brownstone shooting. I'm sure you know way more about whatever it was they were trying to make. Joel and himself. Himself went underground, too. CT was already doing most of the day-to-day -day administration. Himself was down in that little post-production closet off the lab for like a solid month. Mario would bring food and essentials down. Sometimes he'd eat with Lyle. I don't think he came up to ground level for at least a month, except for just one trip out to Belmont to McLean's for a two-day purge and detox. This was about a week after he came back. He'd flown off somewhere for three days, for what the impression I get was work-related business, uh, film-related. If Lyle didn't go with him, Lyle went somewhere, because he wasn't in the weight room. I know Mario didn't go with him and didn't know what was up. Mario doesn't lie. It was unclear whether he'd finished whatever he was editing. Himself, I mean. He stopped living on April 1st, if you weren't sure, was the day. I can tell you on April 1st he wasn't back by the time PM matches started because I'd been around the lab door right after lunch and he wasn't back. He went in for another detox, you say. In what, March? The moms herself emerged and risked exterior transit and took him herself, so I gather it was urgent. He quit drinking in January, Hal. It was something Joelle was real specific about. She called even after we'd agreed not to call and told me about it, even after I said I didn't want to hear about him if she was going to still be in his things. She said he hadn't had a drop in weeks. It was her condition for letting him put her in what he was doing. She said he said he'd do anything. Well, I don't know what to tell you. By this time, it was hard to tell whether he'd been ingesting anything or not. Apparently, at a certain point, it stops making a difference. Did he have film-related things with him when he flew somewhere? A film case? Equipment? Oh, I didn't see him leave, and I didn't see him come back. He wasn't around by match time, I know. Freer beat me badly and fast. It was four and one, four and two, something, and we were the first ones done. I came around the headmaster's house to do an emergency load of laundry before dinner. This was around uh, 1630. I came over and came in and noticed something right away. And found him. And went to get the moms. Then changed my mind and went to get C.T., then changed my mind and went to get Lyle. But the first authority figure I ran into was Shtit. He was irreproachably brisk and efficient and sensible about everything and turned out to be just the authority figure to go get in the first place. I didn't even think a microwave oven would go on unless the door was closed. What with microwaves oscillating all over inside him. I thought there was like a refrigerator light or a read-only tab-like device. You seem to be forgetting the technical ingenuity of the person we're talking about. And you were totally shocked and traumatized. And he was asphyxiated, irradiated, and or burnt. As we later reconstructed the scene, he'd used a wide-bit drill and small hacksaw to make a head-sized hole in the oven door. Then when he'd gotten his head in, he'd carefully pack the extra space around his neck with wadded-up aluminum foil. Sounds kind of ad hoc and jerry-rigged and haphazard. Everybody's a critic. This wasn't an aesthetic endeavor. And there was a large and half-full bottle of wild turkey found on the counter not far away, with a large red decorative gift wrappish bow on the neck. Uh, on the bottle's neck, you mean? That is a Raj. As in he hadn't been sober after all. That would seem to follow, O. Oh, and he left no note or living will type video or communique of any kind. Oh, I know you know very well he didn't. You're not asking me stuff I know you know, besides criticizing him and making sobriety claims when you weren't anywhere near the scene or the funeral. Are we just about through here? I've got a whole long-nailed foot waiting for me here. As you reconstructed the scene, you just said. Also, it just hit me. I've got a library book I was supposed to return. I'd forgotten all about it. Kertwang. 
reconstructed the scene as in the scene when you found him was somehow deconstructed? You of all people, O. Oh. You know that was the one word he hated more than so burned then. Just say it. He was really, really badly burned. No, wait, asphyxiated. The packed foil was to preserve the vacuum in a space that got automatically evacuated as soon as the magnetron started oscillating and generating the microwaves. Magnetron? What do you know about magnetrons and oscillators? Aren't you the brother of mine who has to be reminded which way to turn the ignition key in a car? Brief uh, liaison with this one subject he used to model at kitchen appliance trade shows. It was kind of a... Brutal brand of modeling. She'd stand there on a huge rotating Lazy Susan in a one-piece, with one thigh turned in and a hand out palm up, indicating the appliance next to her. Stood there smiling and spinning day after day. She'd stagger around half the evening trying to get her balance back. Did this subject by any chance explain to you how microwaves actually cook things? Or have you, for example, say... Uh, ever, like, baked a potato in a microwave oven? Did you know you have to cut the potato open before you turn the oven on? Do you know why that is? Jesus. The BPD field pathologist said the buildup of internal pressures would have been almost instantaneous, an equivalent in kilograms per square centimeter to over two sticks of TNT. 83. Jesus Christ, Allie. Hence the need to reconstruct the scene. Jesus. Don't feel bad. There's no guarantee anybody would have told you, even if you'd popped in for, say, the memorial service. I, for one, wasn't exactly a jabberjaw at the time. I seemed to have been evincing shock and trauma throughout the whole funeral period. What I mostly recall is a great deal of quiet talk about my psychic well-being. It got so I kind of enjoyed popping in and out of rooms just to enjoy the quiet conversation stopping in mid claws. You must have been traumatized beyond fucking belief. Your concern is much appreciated. Believe me. Trauma seems to have been the consensus. It turns out Rusk and the moms had begun interviewing top-flight trauma and grief counselors for me within hours after it happened. I was shunted directly into concentrated grief and trauma therapy. Four days a week for over a month, right in the April-May gearing up for summer tour period. I lost two spots on the 14's ladder just because of all the PM matches I missed. I missed the hardcore qualies and would have missed Indianapolis if, if I hadn't finally figured out the grief and trauma therapy process. But it helped, ultimately, the grief therapy. The therapy ended up taking place in that professional building right up Com Ave, past the Sunstrand Plaza by Lake Street, the one with bricks the color of Thousand Island dressing we all run by four days a week. Who was to know one of the continent's top grief men was right up the street? The moms didn't want the process going on too far from the old web, if need be, I'm sure. This grief counselor insisted I call him by his first name, which I forget. <laughs> A large red meaty character with eyebrows at a demonic-looking synclinal angle and very small, nubbly gray teeth and a mustache. He always had the remains of a sneeze in his mustache. I got to know that mustache very well. His face had that same blood pressure flush CT's face gets. And that's not even going to the man's hands. The mom's had rusk. Shunt you to a top grief pro so she wouldn't have to feel guilty about practically sawing the hole in the microwave door herself. Among other little guilt and anti-guilt operations. She always did believe himself was doing more with Joel than work. Poor old himself never had eyes for anybody but the moms. This was one tough hombre, oh, this grief counselor. He made a rusk session look like a day on the Adriatic. He wouldn't let up. How did it feel? How does it feel? How do you feel when I ask how it feels? Rusk always reminded me of a freshman fumbling for some subject's bra, the way she'd sort of tug and fumble at your head. The man was unsatisfiable and scary. Those eyebrows, that ham-rind face, bland little eyes, he never once turned his face away or looked away at anything but right at me, 
It was the most brutal six weeks of full-bore professional conversation anybody could imagine. With fucking C.T. already moving his collection of platform shoes and unconvincing hairpieces and Stairmaster in upstairs at the headmaster's house already. The whole thing was nightmarish. I just could not figure out what the guy wanted. I went down and chewed through the Copley Square Library's grief section. Not disc. The actual books. I read Kubler-Ross. Hinton. I slogged through Kastenbaum and Kastenbaum. I read things like Elizabeth Harper Neal's Seven Choices, Taking the Steps to New Life After Losing Someone You Love, which was 352 pages of sheer goo. 84. I went in and presented with textbook perfect symptoms of denial, bargaining, anger, still more denial, depression. I listed my seven textbook choices and vacillated plausibly between and among them. I provided etymological data on the word acceptance all the way back to Wycliffe and 14th century Languedoc French. The grief therapist was having none of it. It was like one of those final exams in nightmares where you prepare immaculately, and then you get there and all the exam questions are in Hindi. I even tried telling him himself was miserable and pancreatitic, and out of his tree half the time by then anyway, that he and the moms were basically estranged, that even work and wild turkey weren't helping anymore, that he was despondent about something he was editing, that turned out so bad he didn't want it released, that the... that what happened was probably kind of... A mercy in the end. Himself didn't suffer then in the microwave. The BPD field pathologist who drew the chalk lines around himself's shoes on the floor said maybe ten seconds tops. He said the pressure buildup would have been almost instantaneous. Then he gestured at the kitchen walls. Then he threw up. The field pathologist. Jesus Christ, Hallie. But the grief therapist was having none of it. The at least his sufferings over angle that Kastenbaum and Kastenbaum said is basically a neon bright sign of real acceptance. This grief therapist hung on like a Gila monster. I even tried telling him I really didn't feel anything. Which was a fiction. Of course it was a fiction. What could I do? I was panic stricken. This guy was a nightmare. His face just hung there over his desk like a hypertensive moon never turning away with his glistening mucoidal dew in his mustache. And don't even ask me about his hands. He was my worst nightmare. Talk about self-consciousness and fear. He was a top-rank authority figure, and I was failing to supply what he wanted. He made it manifestly clear I wasn't delivering the goods. I never failed to deliver the goods before. You were our designated deliverer, Hallie. No question about it. And here, but here was this authority figure with top credentials in frames over every square centimeter of his walls, who sat there and refused even to define what the goods here would be. Say what you will about Stitt and DeLint, they let you know what they want in no uncertain terms. Flotman, Chawaf, Cricket, Nwangi, Fentress, Lingley, Pettyjohn, Ogilvy, Leith, even the moms in her way. They tell you on the very first day of class what they want from you. But this son of a bee right here, no dice. You must have been in shock the whole time, too. Oh, it got worse and worse. I dropped weight. I couldn't sleep. This was when the nightmare started. I kept dreaming of a face in the floor. I lost to Freer again, then to Coil. I went three sets with Trolch. I got bees on two different quizzes. I couldn't concentrate on anything else. I'd become obsessed with the fear that I was somehow going to flunk grief therapy. That this professional was going to tell Rusk and Stitt and C.T. and the moms that I couldn't deliver the goods. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. The odd thing was that the more obsessed I got, the worse I played and slept, the happier everybody got. The grief therapist complimented me on how haggard I was looking. Rusk told DeLint, the grief therapist had told the moms that it was starting to work, that I was starting to grieve but that it was a long process. Long and costly. Roger. I began to despair. I began to foresee somehow getting left back in grief therapy, never delivering the goods, and it never ending. Having these Kafka-esque interfaces with this man day after day, week after week. It was now May. The Continental Clays I'd gotten all the way to the fourth round of the year before were coming up, and it became quietly clear that 
Everybody felt I was at a crucial stage in the long, costly, grieving process, and I wasn't going to get to go with the contingent to Indianapolis unless I could figure out some last-ditch way to deliver the emotional goods to this guy. I was totally desperate, a wreck. So you slept on down to the weight room. You and the forehead paid a visit to good old Lyle. Lyle turned out to be the key. He was down there reading Leaves of Grass. He was going through a Whitman period, part of grieving for himself, he said. I'd never gone to Lyle before in any kind of supplicatory capacity. But he said he took one grief-stricken look at me, flailing away down there, working up a gourmet sweat, and said he felt so moved by my additional suffering on top of having had to be the first of himself's loved ones to experience the loss of himself, that he'd bend every cerebral effort. I assumed the position, and let him at the old forehead, and explained what had been happening, and that if I couldn't figure out some way to satisfy this grief pro, I was going to end up in a soft, quiet room somewhere. Lyle's key insight was that I'd been approaching the issue from the wrong side. I'd gone to the library and acted like a student of grief. What I needed to chew through was the section for grief professionals themselves. I needed to prepare from the grief pro's own perspective. How could I know what a professional wanted unless I knew what he was professionally required to want, etc.? It was simple, he said. I needed to empathize with the grief therapist, Lyle said, if I wanted to spread a broader breast than his own. It was such a simple observation of my normal goods delivery preparation system that it hadn't once occurred to me, Lyle explained. Lyle said all that? That doesn't sound like Lyle. But a sort of soft light broke inside me for the first time in weeks. I called a cab, still in my towel, I jumped in the cab before it had even stopped at the gate. I actually said, the nearest library with a cutting-edge professional grief and trauma therapy section and step on it, etc., etc. The Lyle my class knew wasn't a how-to-deliver-the-goods-to-authorities type figure. By the time I hit the grief therapists the next day, I was a different man, immaculately prepared, unfazable. Everything I'd come to dread about the man, the eyebrows, the multicultural music in the waiting room, the implacable stare, the crusty mustache, the little gray teeth, even the hands. Did I mention that this grief therapist hid his hands under his desk at all times? But you got through it. You grieved to everybody's satisfaction, you're saying. What I did, I went in there and presented with anger at the grief therapist. I accused the grief therapist of actually inhibiting my attempt to process my grief by refusing to validate my absence of feelings. I told him I told him the truth already. I used foul language and slang. I said I didn't give a damn if he was an abundantly credentialed authority figure or not. I called him a shithead. I asked him what the cock-shitting fuck he wanted from me. My overall demeanor was paroxysmic. I told him I'd told him that I didn't feel anything, which was the truth. I said it seemed like he wanted me to feel toxically guilty for not feeling anything. Notice I was subtly inserting certain loaded professional grief therapy terms like validate, process as a transitive verb, and toxic guilt. These were library-derived. The whole difference was this time you were walking on court oriented with a sense of where the lines were, Stitt would say. The grief therapist encouraged me to go with my paroxysmic feelings to name and honor my rage. He got more and more pleased and excited as I angrily told him I flat out refused to feel iota one of guilt of any kind. I said, what? I was supposed to have lost even more quickly to free her, so I could have come around the headmaster's house in time to stop himself? It wasn't my fault, I said. It was not my fault I found him, I shouted. I was down to black street socks. I had legitimate emergency-grade laundry to do. By this time, I was pounding myself on the breastbone with rage as I said that it just by God was not my fault that... That what? That's just what the grief therapist said. The professional literature had a whole bold font section on abrupt pauses in high affect speech. The grief therapist was now leaning way forward at the waist. His lips were wet. I was in the zone, therapeutically speaking. I felt on top of things for the first time in a long time. I broke eye contact with him. That, I'd been hungry. 
I muttered. Uh, come again? That's just what he said, the grief therapist. I muttered that it was nothing. Just that it damn sure wasn't my fault that I had the reaction I did when I came through the front door of the headmaster's house before I came into the kitchen to get to the basement stairs and found himself with his head in what was left of the microwave. When I first came in and was still in the foyer trying to get my shoes off without putting the dirty laundry bag down on the white carpet and hobbing around and couldn't be expected to have any idea what had happened, I said nobody can choose or have any control over their first unconscious thoughts or reactions when they come into a house. I said it wasn't my fault that my first unconscious thought turned out to be... Jesus, kid, what? That something smelled delicious, I screamed. The force of my shriek almost sent the greet therapist over backwards in his leather chair. A couple credentials fell off the wall. I bent over in my non-leather chair as if for a crash landing. I put a hand to each temple and rocked back and forth in the chair, weeping. It came out between sobs and screams. That had been four hours plus since lunchtime, and I'd worked hard and played hard, and I was starved. That the saliva had started the minute I came through the door. That, golly, something smells delicious, was my first reaction. But you forgave yourself. I absolved myself with seven minutes left in the session, right there, in full, approving view of the grief therapist. He was ecstatic. By the end, I swear, his side of the desk was half a meter off the floor, and my grief therapist textbook breakdown into genuine effect and trauma and guilt, and textbook ear-splitting grief, then absolution. Christ on a jet ski, Hallie. But you got through it. You really did grieve. And you can tell me what it was like so I can say something generic but convincing about loss and grief for Helen for a moment. But I'd admitted that somehow the single most nightmarishly compelling thing about this top grief therapist was that his hands were never visible. The dreadfulness of the whole six weeks somehow coalesced around the issue of the guy's hands. His hands never emerged from underneath his desk. It was as if his arms terminated at the elbow. Besides mustache material analysis, I also spent large blocks of each hour trying to imagine the configurations and activities of those hands under there. Hallie, let me just ask, and then I'll never bring it back up again. You implied before that what was especially traumatic was that himself's head had popped like an uncut spud. Then on what turned out to be the last day of the therapy, the last day before the A-squads were picked for Indianapolis, after I'd finally delivered the goods and my traumatic grief was professionally pronounced uncovered and countenanced and processed, when I put on my sweatshirt and got set to take my leave and came up to the desk and put out my hand in a trembly, grateful way he couldn't possibly have refused, and he stood and brought out the hand and shook my hand, I finally understood. His hands were disfigured or something. His hands were no bigger than a four-year-old girl's. It was surreal. This massive, authoritative figure, with a huge red meaty face and thick walrus mustache and dewlaps and a neck that spilled over the rim of his shirt collar, and his hands were tiny and pink and hairless and butt soft, delicate as shells. The hands were the capper. I barely made it out of the office before it started. The cathartic, post-traumatic-like re-experience hysteria. You reeled out of there. I barely made it to the men's room down the hall. I was laughing so hysterically I was afraid all the periodontists and CPAs on either side of the men's room would hear. I sat in a stall with my hands over my mouth, stamping my feet and beating my head against first one side of the stall and then the other in hysterical mirth. If you could have seen those hands! But you got through it all and you can thumbnail sketch the overall feeling for me. What I feel is myself gathering my resources for the right foot, finally. That magic feeling's back. I'm not lining up the vectors for the wastebasket or anything. I'm not even thinking. I'm trusting the feeling. It's like that celluloid moment when Luke removes his high-tech targeting helmet. Uh, what helmet? You know, of course, that human nails are the vestiges of talons and horns, but they're atavistic like coccyges and hair, that they develop in utero long before the cerebral cortex. What's the matter? 
that at some point in the first trimester we lose our gills but are now still now little more than a bladdery sack of spinal fluid and a rudimentary tail and hair follicles and little microchips of vestigial talon and horn. Is this to make me feel bad? Did this fuck you up, me probing for details after all this time? Did it reactivate the grief? Just one more confirmation. The trailer's interior. There was some object, or contiguous trio of objects, with the following color scheme. Brown, lavender, and either mint green or jonquil yellow. I can call back when you're more yourself. The lake's starting to prune a bit from the whirlpool anyway. I'll be right here. I've got a whole foot to yield to the magic with. I'm not going to alter the smallest particular. I'm just about ready to bear down on the clippers. It's going to feel right, I know. A throw. Like an Afghan throw on the chintz sofa. The yellow was more fluorescent than jonquil. And the word is asphyxiated. Kick some egg-shaped balls for all of us, oh. The next sound you hear will be unpleasant, Hal said, holding the phone down right next to the foot, his expression terrifically intense. The 6th of November, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment White halogen off the green of the composite surface, the light out on the indoor courts at the Port Washington Tennis Academy is the color of sour apples. To the spectators at the gallery's glass, the duos of players arrayed and moving down below have a reptilian tinge to their skin, a kind of seasick-type pallor. This annual meet is mammoth. Both academies A and B teams, for both boys and girls, both singles and doubles, and 14 and unders, 16 and unders, 18 and unders. 36 courts stretch out down away from one end's gallery under a fancy tri-dome system of permanent all-weather lung. A junior tennis team has six people on it, with the highest ranked playing number one singles against the other team's best guy, the next highest ranked playing number two, and on down the line to number six. After the six singles matches, there are three doubles, with the team's best two singles players usually turning around and also playing number one doubles, with occasional exceptions, for example, the Vought twins, or the fact that Schacht and Trolch, way down on the B squad in the 18s singles, play number two doubles on ETA's 18s 18, because they've been a doubles team since they were incontinent toddlers back in Philly, and they're so experienced and smooth together they can wipe surfaces with the 18s A-teams, number three and number four singles guys, Coyle and Axford, who prefer to skip doubles altogether. It all tends to get complicated and probably not all that interesting. Unless you play. But so a normal meet between two junior teams is the best out of nine matches, whereas this mammoth annual early November thing between ETA and PWTA will try to be the best out of 108. A 54-match all-conclusion is extremely unlikely, odds being 1 in 2 to the 27th power, and has never happened in nine years. The meet's always down on Long Island because PWTA has indoor courts out the bazoo. Each year, the academy that loses the meet has to get up on tables at the buffet supper afterward and sing a really silly song. An even more embarrassing transaction is supposed to take place in private between the two schools' headmasters, but nobody knows quite what. Last year, Enfield lost 57 to 51, and Charles Tavis didn't say one word on the bus ride home and used the lavatory several times. But last year, ETA didn't have John Wayne, and last year, H.J. Incandenza hadn't yet exploded competitively. John Wayne, formerly of Montserrat, Quebec, an asbestos mining town ten clicks or so from the infamously rupture-prone Mercier Dam, formerly the top-ranked junior male in Canada at 16, as well as number five overall in the Organization of North American Nations Tennis Association computerized rankings, 
was finally, successfully recruited by Gerhard Stitt and Aubrey de Lint last spring via the argument that two gratis years at an American academy would maybe let Wayne bypass the usual couple seasons of top college tennis and go pro immediately at 19 with more than enough competitive tempering. This reasoning was not unsound, since the top four U.S. Tennis Academy's tournament schedules closely resemble the ATP Tour in terms of numbing travel and continual stress. John Wayne is currently ranked number three in the ONANTA's Boys 18s and number two in the USTA. Canada, under provincial pressure, has disowned him as an immigrant. It has, in this year of the Depend Adult Undergarment, reached the semis of both the Junior French and Junior U.S. Opens, and has lost to exactly nobody American in seven meets and a dozen major tournaments. He trails the number one American kid, an independent down in Florida, Veach, by only a couple USTA computer points, and they haven't yet met in sanctioned play this year. And the kid is well known to be hiding out from Wayne, avoiding him, staying down in Pompano Beach, allegedly nursing a, like, four-month groin pull sitting on his ranking. 85. He's supposed to show at the Whataburger Invitational in Arizona in a couple weeks. This Veach. Having won the 18s at age 17 there last year. But he's got to know Wayne's coming down. And speculation is rife and complex. O-N-A-N-T-A-wise, there's an Argentine kid that Mexico's Academia de Veracruz has got rattled away who's number one, but not about to lose to anybody, having this year taken three out of four legs of the Junior Grand Slam, the first time anybody's done that since a sepulchral Czech kid named Lendl, who retired from the show and suicided well before the advent of subsidized time. But, so, there's Wayne at number one. And it's been established that Hal and Condenza, last year a respectable, but by no means to write hum about 43rd nationally, and bouncing between number four and number five on the Academy's A team in boys' 16s singles, has made a kind of quantumish competitive plateaus hop, such that this year, the one nearly done, Kimberly Clark Corporation's Depend Absorbent Products Division, soon to give way to the highest corporate bidder for rights to the new year. In Condenza, mind you, this year just 17, is fourth in the nation and number six on the ONANTA computer and playing A number two for ETA in boys' 18s. These competitive explosions happen sometimes. Nobody at the academy talks to how much about the explosion, sort of the way you avoid a pitcher who's got a no-hitter going. Hal's delicate and spinny, rather cerebral game hasn't altered, but this year it seems to have grown a beak. No longer fragile or abstracted looking on court, he seems now almost to hit the corners without thinking about it. His unforced error stats look like a decimal error. Hal's game involves attrition. He'll probe, pecking, until some angle opens up. Until then... He'll probe. He'd rather run his man ragged, wear him down. Three different opponents this past summer had to go to oxygen during breaks. 86. His serve yanks across at people as if on a hidden diagonal string. His serve now, suddenly, after four summers, of thousand-a-day serves to no one at dawn, is suddenly supposed to be one of the best left-handed kick serves the junior circuit has ever seen. Stitt calls Hal in Condenza his revenant now, and sometimes points his pointer at him in an affectionate way from his observation crow's nest in the transom during drills. Most of the singles A matches are underway. Coyle and his man on three are in an endless butterfly-shaped rally. Hal's muscular but unquick opponent is bent over trying to get his breath, while Hal stands there and futzes with his strings. Tall Paul Shaw, on six, bounces the ball eight times before he serves, never seven or nine. And John Wayne's, without question, 
the best male player to appear at Enfield Academy in several years. He'd been spotted first by the late Dr. James Incandenza at age six, eleven summers back, when Incandenza was doing an early and coldly conceptual Super 8 on people named John Wayne, who were not the real thespio historical John Wayne. A film Wayne's not to be fucked with Papa eventually litigated the kid's segment out of because the film had the word homo in the title. 87. On one, for John Wayne up at net, Fort Washington's best boy throws up a lob. It's a beauty. The ball soars slowly up, just skirts the indoor court's system of beams and lamps and floats back down gentle as lint. A lovely quad function of fluorescent green seems whirling. John Wayne backpedals and flies back after it. You can tell if you play seriously. You can tell just by the way the ball comes off a guy's strings whether the lob is going to land fair. There's surprisingly little thought. Coaches tell serious players what to do so often it gets automatic. John Wayne's game could be described as having a kind of automatic beauty. When the lob first went up, he'd backpedaled from the net, keeping the ball in sight until it reached the top of its flight and its curve broke, casting many shadows in the tray of lights hung from the ceiling's insulation. Then, Wayne turned his back to the ball and sprinted flat out for the spot where it will land fair. Would land. He doesn't have to locate the ball again until it's hit the green court just inside the baseline. By now he's come around the side of the bounced ball's flight, still sprinting. He looks mean in a kind of distant way. He comes around the side of the bounced ball's second ascent, the way you come up around the side of somebody you're going to hurt. And he has to leave his feet and half pirouette to get his side to the ball and whip his big right arm through it, catching it on the rise and slapping it down the line past the Port Washington boy, who's played the percentages and followed the beauty of a lob up to net. The Port Washington kid applauds with the heel of his hand against his strings, an acknowledgment of a really nice get, even as he looks up at Port Washington's coaching staff in the gallery. The spectator's glass panel is at ground level, and the players play below it on courts that have been carved out of a kind of pit dug long ago. Some northeast clubs favor courts below ground because earth insulates and keeps utility bills daunting instead of prohibitive once the lungs go up. The gallery panel stretches overhead behind courts one through six, but there's a decided spectatorial clumping at the part of the gallery that looks out over the show courts, boys' eight teens, number one and number two, Wayne and Hal, and PWTA's two best. Now, after Wayne's balletic winner, there's the sad sound of a small crowd behind the glasses' applause. On the court, the applause is muffled and compromised by on-court sounds, and sounds like the trapped survivors of something tapping for help at a great depth. The panel is like an aquarium's glass, thick and clean, and traps noise behind it, and to the gallery it seems that seventy-two well-muscled children are arrayed and competing in total silence in the pit. Almost everyone in the gallery is wearing tennis clothes and bright nylon warm-ups. Some even wear wristbands, the tennis equivalent of a football fan's pennant and raccoon coat. John Wayne's post-pirouette backward inertia has carried him into the heavy black tarpaulin that hangs several meters behind both sides of the 36 courts on a system of rods and rings not unlike a very ambitious shower curtain. The tarps hiding from view the water-stained walls of puffy white-wrapped insulation and creating a narrow passage for players to get to their courts without crossing open court and interrupting play. Wayne hits the heavy tarp and kind of bounces off, producing a boom that resounds. The sounds on court in an indoor venue are huge and complex. Everything echoes and the echoes then meld. In the gallery, Tavis and Nwangi bite their knuckles, and Delint squashes his nose flat against the glass in anxiety, as everyone else politely applauds. Stitt calmly taps his pointer against the top of his boot at times of high stress. 
Wayne isn't hurt, though. Everybody goes into the tarp sometimes. That's what it's there for. It always sounds worse than it is. The boom of the tarp sounds bad down below, though. The boom rattles Teddy Shocked, who's kneeling in the little passage right behind court number one, holding M. Pemulus's head as Pemulus, down on one knee, is sick into a tall white plastic spare ball bucket. Shocked has to haul Pemulus slightly back as Wayne's outline bulges for a moment into the billowing tarp and threatens to knock Pemulus over, plus maybe the bucket, which would be a bad scene. Pemulus, deep into the little hell of his own nauseous, pre-match nerves, is too busy trying to vomit without sound to hear the mean sound of Wayne's winner or the boom of him against the heavy curtain. It's freezing back here in the little passage, up next to insulation and eye beams and away from the infrared heaters that hang over the courts. The plastic bucket is full of old, bald Wilson tennis balls and Pemulus's breakfast. There is, of course, an odor. Shock doesn't mind. He lightly strokes the sides of Pemulus's head as his mother had stroked his own big, sick head back in Philly. Placed at eye-level intervals in the tarp are little plastic windows, archer-slit views of each court from the cold backstage passage. Shocked sees John Wayne walk to the net post and flip his card as he and his opponent change sides. Even indoors you change ends of the court after every odd-numbered game. No one knows why odd rather than even. Each PWTA court has, welded to its west net post, another smaller post with a double set of, like, flippable cards with big red numerals from one to seven. In umpless competition, you're supposed to flip your card appropriately at every change of sides to help the gallery follow the score in the set. A lot of junior players neglect to flip their cards. Wayne is always automatic and scrupulous in his accounts. Wayne's father is an asbestos miner, who at 43 is far and away the seniorest guy on his shift. He now wears triple-thick masks and is trying to hold on until John Wayne can start making serious dollars and take him away from all this. He has not seen his eldest son play since John Wayne's Quebecois and Canadian citizenships were revoked last year. Wayne's card is on five. His opponent has yet to flip a card. Wayne never even sits down to take the sixty seconds he's allowed on each change of sides. His opponent, in his light blue, flare-collared shirt with Wilson and PWTA on the sleeves, says something not unfriendly as Wayne brushes past him by the post. Wayne doesn't respond one way or the other. He just goes back to the baseline farthest from Schacht's little tarp window and bounces a ball up and down in the air with the reticulate face of his stick as the Port Washington boy sits in his little canvas director's chair and towels the sweat off his arms, neither of which is large, and looks briefly up at the gallery behind the panel. The thing about Wayne is, he's all business. His face on court is blankly rigid, with the hypertonic masking of schizophrenics and zen adepts. He tends to look straight ahead at all times. He is about as reserved as they come. His emotions emerge in terms of velocity, intelligence as strategic focus. His play, like his manner in general, seems to shocked less alive than undead. Wayne tends to eat and study alone. He's sometimes seen with two or three expatriate ETA nooks. But when they're together, they all seem morose. It's wholly unclear to Shocked how Wayne feels about the U.S. or his citizenship status. He figures Wayne figures it doesn't much matter. He is destined for the show. He will be an all-business entertainer, citizen of the world, everywhere undead, endorsing juice drinks and liniment ointment. Pemulus has nothing left and is spasming dryly over the bucket. His covered Dunlop gut-strung sticks and gear tumble just past shocks in the passage. They are the last guys to get out on court. 
Shocked is to play number three singles on the 18's B team. Pemulus, number six B. They are undeniably tardy getting out there. Their opponents stand out on the baselines of courts nine and twelve, waiting for them to come out and warm up, jittery, stretching out the way you do when you've already stretched out, dribbling fresh, bright balls with their black Wilson wide-body sticks. The whole Port Washington Tennis Academy student body gets free and mandatory Wilson sticks under an administrative contract. Nothing personal, but no way would Shock let an academy tell him what brand of stick to swing. He himself favors headmasters, which is regarded as bizarre and eccentric. The AMF head rep brings them out to him out of some cobwebby warehouse, where they're kept since the line was discontinued during the large head revolution many years back. Aluminum headmasters have small, perfectly round heads and a dull blue plastic brace in the V of the throat, and look less like weapons than toys. Coir and Axford are always kibitzing that they've seen a headmaster for sale at, like, a flea market or a garage sale someplace, and shocked, better get down there quick. Shocked, who's historically tight with Mario and with Lyle down in the weight room, where shocked, since the knee and the Crohn's disease, likes to go even on off days to work off discomfort, and Delint and Loach are always on him about not getting muscle-bound, has a way of just smiling and holding his tongue when he's kibitzed. Are you okay? Pamela says, Blurg! He wipes at his forehead in a gesture of completion and submits to being hauled to his feet and stands there on his own with his hands on his hips, slightly bent. Shock straightens and pulls some wrinkles out of the bandage around the brace on his knee. Take maybe another second. Wayne's already way up. Pemulus sniffs unpleasantly. How come this happens to me every time? <sniffs> this is not like me. Happens to some people is all. This hunched, spurting pale guy is not any me I ever recognize. Shock gathers gear. Some people, their nerves are in their stomachs. Sisney, yard guard, lord, you... Stomach men. Teddy, brother. Man, I'm never once hung over or a competitive thing. I'm, I take elaborate precautions, not so much as a whippet. I'm always in bed the night before by 2300, all pink-cheeked and clean. As they pass the plastic window behind Court 2, Shock sees Hal and Condenza try to pass his serve-and-volley guy with a Baroque sideways slice down the backhand side and miss just wide. Hal's cards already flip to four. Shocked gives a little toodaloo wave that Hal can't see to acknowledge. Pemulus is in front of him as they go down the cold passage. Hal's way up, too. Another victory for the forces of peace. Ugh, Jesus, I feel awful, Pemulus says. Things could be worse. <laughs> Expand on that, will you? This wasn't like that Atlanta stomach incident. We were enclosed here. No one saw. You saw that glass. The shtit and the land, it's all a silent movie down here. Nobody heard thing one. Our guys will think we were back here butting heads to get enraged or something. Or we can tell them I got a cramp. That was a freebie in terms of stomach incidents. Pemulus is a whole different person before competitive play. Ah, oh, I'm fucking inept. Shocked laughs. You're one of the aptest people I know. Get off your own back. Never remember getting sick as a kid. Now it's like I make myself sick just from worrying about getting sick. Well, then there you go. Just don't think anything thoracic. Pretend you don't have a stomach. I have no stomach, Pemula says. His head stays still when he talks, at least, negotiating the passage. He carries four sticks, a rough white PWTA locker room towel, an empty ball can full of high chlorine Long Island water, nervously zipping and unzipping the top sticks cover. Shocked only ever carries three sticks. His don't have covers on them, except for Pemulus and Raider and Unwin, and a couple others who favor gut strings and really need protection. Nobody at Enfield uses racket covers. 
It's like an anti-fashion statement. People with covers make a point of telling you they're valid and for gut. A similar point of careful non-pride is never having their shirts tucked in. Ortho Stice used to drill and cut off black jeans until Shtit had Tony Nwangi go over and scream at him about it. Each academy has its own style or anti-style. The PWTA people, more or less a de facto subsidiary of Wilson, have unnecessary light blue Wilson covers on all their courtside synthetic strong sticks and big red W's stenciled on their Wilson synth gut strings. You have to let your company of choice spray paint their logo on your strings if you want to be on their free list for sticks is the universal junior deal. Shocked's orange Gamma 9 synthetic strings have AMF head inks weird Taoist paraboloid logo sprayed on them. Pemulus is an on Dunlop's free list, but gets the ETA stringer to put Dunlop's dot and circumflex trademark on all his sticks strings as a kind of touchingly insecure gesture, in Schacht's opinion. 88. I played your guy in Tampa two years ago, Pemulus says, sidestepping one of the old discolored drill balls that always litter passages behind indoor tarps. Name escapes. Love something, says Schacht. Yet another nook. One of those names that start with le. Mario and Condenza and a pair of little Aldern Talat Kelpsa's ETA drill sweats, is lurching noiselessly some ten meters behind them in the passage, his police lock-up and head uncamered. He's framing Schacht's back in a three-cornered box with his thumbs and long fingers simulating the view through a lens. Mario's been authorized to travel with the squads to the Whataburger Invitational for final footage for his short and upbeat annual documentary. Brief testimonials and lighthearted moments and behind-the-scenes shots and emotional moments on court, etc., that every year gets distributed to ETA alumni and patrons and guests at the pre-Thanksgiving fundraising exhibition and formal fete. Mario is wondering how you could get enough light back here in the tarp tunnel to film a tense, cold, pre-match gladiatorial march behind an indoor tarp, carrying tennis rackets in your arms like an obscene bouquet, without sacrificing the dim and diffuse and kind of gladiatorially doomed quality figures in the dim passage have. After Pemulus has mysteriously won, he'll tell Mario maybe a Merino 350 with a diffusion filter on some kind of overhead cable you could winch along behind the figures at about twice the focal length, or else use fast film and station the Merino at the tunnel's very start and let the figures' backs gradually recede into a kind of doomed mist of low exposure. I remember your guy as being one big forehand, nothing but slice off the back. His vaps never varies. If you, uh, kick the serve over to the back end, he'll slice it short. You can come in behind it at, like, will. Worry about your own guy, Shock says. Your guy's got zero imagination, and you've got an empty expanse where your stomach ought to be, remember? I am a man with no stomach. They emerge through flaps in the tarp with hands upraised and slight apology to their opponents, walk out onto the warmer courts, the slow, green, eraserish footing of indoor composite. Their ears dilate into all the sounds in the larger space. Gasps and thwops, and pox, and sneakers squeaks. Famulus's court is almost down in female territory. Courts 13 to 24 are girls, 18s A and B, all bobbing ponytails and two-handed backhands and high-pitched grunts that if girls could only hear what their own grunts sounded like, they'd cut it out. Famulus can't tell whether the very muffled applause way down up behind the gallery panel is sardonic applause at his finally appearing after several minutes of vomiting, or is sincerely for K.D. Coyle on Court 3, who's just smashed a sucker lob so hard it's bounced up and racked Three's tray of hanging lights. Except for some rubber in his legs, Pemulus feels stomachless 
and tentatively, okay. This match is an all-out must-win for him in terms of the Whataburger. The infralit courts are warm and soft. The heaters bolted into both walls above the tarp's upper hem are the deep warm red of little square suns. The Port Washington players all wear matching socks and shorts and tucked-in shirts. They look sharp, but effete, a mannequinish aspect to them. Most of the higher-ranked ETA students are free to sign on with different companies for no fees but free gear. Coyle is Prince and Reebok, as is Trevor Axford. John Wayne is Dunlop and Adidas. Shocked is Headmaster Styx, but his own clothes and knee supports. Orthostice is Wilson in all-black fila. Keith Freer is Fox Styx, and both Adidas and Reebok until one of the two companies' NNE reps catches on. Trolch is Spalding, and damn lucky to get that. Howlin' Condenza is Dunlop, and lightweight Nike high tops, and an air stirrup brace for the dicky ankle. Shaw is Kinex Sticks and clothes from Tachani's Big and Tall line. Pemulus's entrepreneurial vim has earned him complete freedom of choice and expense. Though he's barred by DeLint and Nwangi from shirts that mention the Sinn Féin or that extol Alston, Massachusetts in any way in competition. Before going back to the baseline and warming up ground strokes, Shocked likes to take a little time courtside futzing around, hitting his head's frames against strings and listening for the pitch of best tension, arranging his towel on the back of his chair, making sure his cards aren't still flipped from some previous match, etc. And then he prefers to sort of snuffle around his baseline for a bit, checking for dust bunnies of ball fuzz and little divots or ridges from cold weather heave, adjusting the brace on his ruined knee, putting his thick arms out, cruciform, and pulling them way back to stretch out the old pecs and cups. His opponent waits, patiently, twirling his polybutylene stick. And when they finally start to hit around, the guy's expression is pleasant. Shocked always prefers a pleasant match, one way or the other. He really doesn't care all that much whether he wins anymore, since first the crones and then the knee at sixteen. He'd probably now describe his desire to win as a preference, nothing more. What's singular is that his tennis seems to have improved slightly in the two years since he stopped really caring. It's like his hard flat game stopped having any purpose beyond itself and started feeding on itself and got fuller, looser, its edges less jagged, though everybody else has been improving too, even faster, and Schacht's rank has been steadily declining since 16, and the staff has stopped talking even about a top college ride. Stitz warmed to him, though, since the knee and the loss of any urge beyond the play itself, and treats Schacht now almost more like a peer than an experimental subject with something at stake. Schacht is already in his heart committed to a dental career, and he even interns twice a week for a root specialist over at the National Craniofacial Pain Foundation in East Enfield when not touring. It strikes Schacht as odd that Pemulus makes such a big deal of stopping all substances the day before competitive play, but never connects the neurasthenic stomach to any kind of withdrawal or dependence. He'd never say this to Pemulus unless Pemulus asked him directly, but Schacht suspects Pemulus is physically dream-dependent, preludin or attenuate or something. It's not his business. Schacht's supposedly French-Canadian guy is as broad as Schacht, but shorter his face dark, and with a kind of eskimoid structure to it. At 18, his hairline recessed in the sort of way where you just know the kid's already got hair on his back. And he warms up with crazy spins, Mooney top off a western forehand and weird inside-out shit off a one-hand back. His knees dipping oddly whenever he makes contact, and his follow-through full of the dancerly flourishes that characterize a case of nerves. A nervous spin artist can be eaten more or less for lunch if you hit as hard as Shocked does. And what Pemulus said is true. The guy's backhand is always sliced and lands shallow. Shocked looks over at Pemulus's guy, a grunter with a moody profile and the storky look of recent puberty. 
Pamulus is looking oddly sanguine and competent after a couple minutes futzing with the cans of water, rinsing out the oral cavity and so on. Pemulus is maybe going to win, too, despite himself. Shock figures he can run in and get one of the twelve-year-old's he big buddies to go back into the passage and empty Pemulus's bucket on the sly before anybody coming off court sees it. Evidence of nervous incapacity of any kind gets noted and logged at ETA, and Schacht observed Pemulus having some kind of vested emotional interest in attending the Whataburger Invitational over Thanksgiving. He thought Mario's lurking around in the cold passage, scratching his poor big head over technical lighting problems, was kind of funny. There will be no lungs or tarps or dim passages at the Whataburger. The Tucson tournament is outside, and Tucson cruised around 40 degrees Celsius even in November, and the sun there was a retinal horror show on overheads and serves. Though Schacht buys quarterly urine like the rest of them, it seems to Pemulus that Schacht ingests the occasional chemical that way grown-ups who sometimes forget to finish their cocktails drink liquor to make a tense but fundamentally okay interior life, interestingly different but no more. No element of relief. A kind of tourism. And Schacht doesn't even have to worry about obsessive training, like ink or stice or get sick so often from the physical stress of constant dreams, like Trolch, or suffer from thinly disguised, psychological fallout like Ink or Struck or Pemulus himself. The way Pemulus and Trolch and Struck and Axford ingest substances and recover from substances and have a whole jargony argot based around various substances gives shock to the creeps a bit. But since the knee injury broke and remade him at sixteen, He's learned to go his own interior way and let others go theirs. Like most very large men, he's getting comfortable early with the fact that his place in the world is very small and his real impact on other persons even smaller, which is a big reason he can sometimes forget to finish his portion of a given substance. So interested does he become in the way he's already started to feel. He's one of these people who don't need much, much less, much more. Shocked and his opponent warm up their ground strokes with the fluid economy of years of warming up ground strokes. They take turns feeding each other some volleys at net, and then each take a couple up lobs, hitting loose, easy overheads, slowly adjusting the idle from half speed to three-quarter speed. The knee feels fundamentally all right, springy. Slow indoor composite surfaces do not like Shocked's hard flat game but they are kind to the knee, which after some days outside on hard cement swells to about the size of a volleyball. Shocked feels blandly happy down here on nine, playing in private, way down past the gallery's panel. There is a nourishing sense of pregnable space in a big indoor club that you never get playing outside, especially playing outside in the cold, when the balls feel hard and sullen and come off the stick's strung face, with an echoless ping. Here everything cracks and booms. The grunts and shoe squeaks and booming pocks of impact and curses unfolding across the white on green plain and echoing off each tarp. Soon they'll all go inside for the winter. Shit will yield and let them inflate the ETA lung over the sixteen center courts. It's like a barn raising, inflation day. It's communal and fun and they'll take down the central fences and outdoor night lamps and unbolt all the posts into sections and stack them and store them, and the Testar and ATH SCME guys will come up in vans smoking cigarettes and squinting with weary expertise at tubes of plans in Draftsman Blue, and there'll be one and sometimes two ATH SCME helicopters with slings and grappling hooks for the lungs dome and nacelle. And Stitt and Alint will let the younger ETAs get the infrared indoor heaters out of the same corrugated shed the disassembled fences and lamps will go in. Leaf cutter ant or Korean like armies of fourteen and sixteen year olds carrying sections and heaters and Gore Tex swatches and long halolithiated bulbs, while the eighteens get to sit on canvas chairs and kibbits because they did their leaf cutter lung-raising bits at 13 to 16 already. 
Two Testar guys will supervise Otis P. Lord and all this year's conspicuous tech wonks in mounting the heaters and stringing the lights and running coaxial shunts with ceramic jacks between the pump room's main breaker and the sunstrand grid and booting up the circulation fans and pneumatic hoists. That'll raise the lung to the inflated shape of a distended igloo. Sixteen quarts in four rows of four, enclosed and warmed by nothing but fibrous Gore-Tex and AC current, and an enormous ATH SCME exhaust flow effectuator that an ATH SCME crew in one of the ATH SCME helicopters will bring in in a sling and cable, and mount and secure on the lungs nipply nacelle at the top of the inflating dome. On that first night after inflation, traditionally the fourth Monday of November, all the upper-class 18s so inclined will crank up the infrareds and get high and eat low-lipid microwave pizza and play all night, sweating magnificently, sheltered for the winter atop Enfield's level-headed hill. Shock stands back in the deuce court and lets his guy warm up his serves. Oddly flat and low margin for a nervous touch artist. Shocked bloops each return up with severe backspin so the balls will roll back to him and he can serve them back to this guy, also warming up. The warm-up routine has become automatic and requires no attention. Way up on number one, Shock sees John Wayne just plaster a backhand cross-court. Wayne hits it so hard a little mushroom cloud of green fuzz hangs in the air where Ball had met strings. Their cards were too far to read in the sour apple light, but you could tell by the way Port Washington's best boy walked back to the baseline to take the next serve that his ass had already been presented to him. In a lot of junior matches, everything past the fourth game or so is kind of a formality. Both players tend to know the overall score by then, the big picture. They'll have decided who's going to lose. Competitive tennis is largely mental, once you're at a certain plateau of skill and conditioning. Shtid would say spiritual instead of mental, but as far as Shocked can see, it's the same thing. As Shocked sees it, Shtid's philosophical stance is that to win enough of the time to be considered successful, you have to both care a great deal about it, and also not care about it at all. 89. Shocked does not care enough, probably, anymore, and has met his gradual displacement from ETA's A single squad with an equanimity some ETAs thought was spiritual, and others regarded as the surest sign of dicklessness and burnout. Only one or two people have ever used the word brave in connection with Shocked's Radical reconfiguration after the things with the Crohn's disease and knee. Howland Condenza, who's probably as asymmetrically hobbled on the care-too-much side as Shocked is on the not-enough, privately puts Shocked's laissez-faire down to some interior decline, some doom-gray surrender of his childhood's promise to adult-gray mediocrity, and fears it. But since Shocked is an old friend and a dependable designated driver, and has actually gotten pleasanter to be around since the knee, which I'll praise fervently that the ankle won't start being the size of a volleyball itself at the end of each outdoor day. Hal, in a weird and deeper internal way, almost, somehow, admires and envies the fact that Schacht's stoically committed himself to the oral professions and stopped dreaming of getting to the show after graduation an air of something other than failure about Shocked's not caring enough, something you can't quite define, the way you can't quite remember a word that you know you know inside. Hal can't quite feel the contempt for Teddy Shocked's competitive slide. That would be a pretty much natural contempt in one who cared so dreadfully, secretly much. And so the two of them tend to settle for not talking about it. Just as Shocked cheerfully, wordlessly, drives the tow truck on occasions, when the rest of the crew are so incapacitated they have to hold one eye closed even to see an undoubled road, and consents without protest to pay retail for clean quarterly urine.
It doesn't say a word about Hal's devolution from occasional tourist to subterranean compulsive, substance-wise, with his pump room visits and visine, even though Shark deep down believes that the substance compulsion's strange apparent contribution to Hal's irrumpent explosion up the rankings has got to be a temporary thing, that there's like a psychic credit card bill for Hal in the mail somewhere coming, and is sad for him in advance about whatever's surely got to give, eventually. Though it won't be the boards, Hal will murder his boards, and Shocked may well be among those jockeying to sit near him. He'd be the first to admit. On two, Hal now kicks a second serve to the ad court with so much left-handed top on it that it almost kicks up over Port Washington's number two guy's head. It's clearly carnage up there on show courts one and two. Dr. Tavis will be irrepressible. The gallery is barely even applauding Wayne and in Condenza anymore. At a certain point, it becomes like Romans applauding lions. All the coaches and staff and PWTA parents and civilians in the overhead gallery wear tennis outfits, the high white socks and tucked in shirts of people who do not really play. Shocked and his man play. Both Pat Montesian and Gately's AA sponsor like to remind Gately how this new resident, Jeffrey Day, could end up being an invaluable teacher of patience and tolerance for him, Gately, as Ennett House staff. So then at 46 years of age, I came here to learn to live by clichés, is what Day says to Charlotte Treat, right after Randy Lentz asked what time it was, again, at 0825. To turn my life and will over to the care of clichés. One day at a time. Easy does it. First things first. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. Ask for help. Thy will, not mine, be done. It works if you work it. Grow or go. Keep coming back. Poor old Charlotte Treat, needle-pointing primly beside him on the old vinyl couch that just came from Goodwill, purses her lips. You need to ask for some gratitude. Oh, no. But the point is, I've already been fortunate enough to receive gratitude. Day crosses one leg over the other in a way that inclines his whole little soft body toward her. For which, believe you me, I'm grateful. I cultivate gratitude. That's part of the system of clichés I'm here to live by. An attitude of gratitude. A grateful drunk will never drink. I know the actual cliché is a grateful heart will never drink, but since organs can't properly be said to imbibe, I'm still afflicted with just enough self-will to decline to live by utter non-sequiturs, as opposed to just good old clichés. I'm taking the liberty of light amendment. He gives with this a look like butter wouldn't melt. Albeit, uh, grateful amendment, of course. Charlotte Treat looks over to Gately for some sort of help or staff enforcement of dogma. The poor bitch is clueless. All of them are clueless still. Gately reminds himself that he too is probably mostly still clueless still, even after all these hundreds of days. I didn't know that I didn't know is another of the slogans that looks so shallow for a while and then all of a sudden drops off and deepens like the lobster waters off the North Shore. As Gately fidgets his way through daily AM meditation, he always tries to remind himself daily that this is all an Ennett House residency is supposed to do. Buy these poor yutzes some time, some thin pie slice of abstinent time, till they can start to get a whiff of what's true and deep, almost magic, under the shallow surface of what they're trying to do. I cultivate it assiduously. I do special gratitude exercises at night up there in the room. Gratitude ups, you could call them. <laughs> Ask Randy over there if I don't do them like clockwork, diligently, sedulously. Well, it's true is all, Treat sniffs, about gratitude. Everybody else except Gately, lying on the old, 
other couch opposite them, is ignoring this exchange, watching an old interlaced cartridge whose tracking is a little messed up, so that staticky stripes eat at the screen's pictures bottom and top. Day is not done talking. Pat M. encourages newer staff to think of residents they'd like to bludgeon to death as valuable teachers of patience, tolerance, self-discipline, restraint. Day is not done talking. One of the exercises is being grateful that life is so much easier now. I used sometimes to think. I used to think in long compound sentences with subordinate clauses and even the odd polysyllable. Now I find I needn't. Now I live by the dictates of macrame samplers ordered from the back page ad of an old Reader's Digest or Saturday Evening Post. Easy does it. Remember to remember. But for the grace of capital G God. Turn it over. Terse. Hard-boiled. Monosyllabic. Good old Norman Rockwell, Paul Harvey wisdom. I walk around with my arms straight out in front of me and recite these clichés in a monotone. No inflection necessary. Hmm, could that be one? Could that be added to the cliché pool? <laughs> no inflection necessary. Hmm, too many syllables, probably. Randy Lentz says, I ain't got time for this shit. Poor old Charlotte Treat, all of nine weeks clean, is trying to look primmer and primmer. She looks again over to Gately, lying on his back, taking up the living room's whole other sofa. One sneaker up on the sofa's square, frayed fabric arm thing, his eyes almost closed. Only staff get to lie on the couches. Denial, Charlotte finally says, is not a river in Egypt. How's about the both of you shut the fuck up? says Emil Minty. Jeffrey, not Jeff, Jeffrey Day, has been at Ennett House six days. He came from Roxbury's infamous Dimmick Detox, where he was the only white person, which Gately Betts must have been broadening for him. Day has a squished, blank, smeared, flat face, one requiring, like, great self-effort to like and eyes that are just starting to lose the nictitated glaze of early sobriety. Day is a newcomer, and a wreck. A red wine and quaalude man, who finally nodded out in late October, and put his sob through the window of a Malden sporting goods store, and then got out and proceeded to browse until the finest came and got him. Who taught something horseshit sounding like social historicity, or historical sociality at some junior college up the expressway in Medford, and came in saying on his intake he also manned the helm of a scholarly quarterly. Word for word, the house manager had said, manned the helm and scholarly. His intake estimated that Day's been in and out of a blackout for most of the last several years, and his wiring is still, as they say, a bit frayed. His detox at Dimmick, where they barely have the resources to give you a librium if you start to DT, must have been just real grim, because Jeffrey D. alleges it never happened. Now his story is he just strolled into Ennett House on the lark one day from his home, ten clicks away in Malden, and found the place too hilariously egregulous to want to ever leave. It's the newcomers with some education that are the worst, according to Gene M., they identify their whole selves with their head, and the disease makes its command headquarters in the head. Ninety. Day wears chinos of indeterminate hue, brown socks with black shoes, and shirts that Pat Montesian had described in the intake as Eastern European-type Hawaiian shirts. Day's now on the vinyl couch with Charlotte Treat after breakfast in the Ennett House living room, with a few of the other residents that either aren't working or don't have to be at work early, and with Gately, who pulled an all-night dream duty shift out in the front office till 0400, then got temp relieved by Jeanette Foltz, so we could go to work janitoring down at the Shattuck shelter until 0700, then came and hauled ass back up here and took back over so that Jeanette could go off to her N.A. thing 
with a bunch of N.A. people in what looked like a dune buggy, if the dunes in question were in hell, and is now, Gately, trying to unclench and center himself inside by tracing the cracks in the paint of the living room ceiling with his eyes. Gately often feels a terrible sense of loss, narcotics-wise, in the A.M. still, even after this long clean. His sponsor over at the White Flag Group says some people never get over the loss of what they thought was their one true best friend and lover. They just have to pray daily for acceptance and the brass danglers to move forward through the grief and loss to wait for time to harden the scab. The sponsor, Ferocious Francis G., doesn't give Gately one iona of shit for feeling some negative feelings about it. On the contrary, he commends Gately for his candor in breaking down and crying like a baby and telling him about it early one a.m. over the payphone, the sense of loss. It's a myth no one misses it. Their particular substance? Shit. You wouldn't need help if you didn't miss it. You just have to ask for help and, like, turn it over, the loss and pain, to keep coming, show up, pray, ask for help. Gately rubs his eye. Simple advice like this does seem like a lot of clichés. Based right about how it seems. Yes, and if Jeffrey Day keeps on steering by the way things seem to him, then he's a dead man for sure. Gately's already watched dozens come through here and leave early and go back out there and then go to jail or die. If Day ever gets lucky and breaks down finally and comes to the front office at night to scream that he can't take it anymore and clutch at Gately's pant cuff and blubber and beg for help at any cost, Gately will get to tell Day the thing is that the cliché directives are a lot more deep and hard to actually do, to try and live by instead of just say. But he'll only get to say it if Day comes and asks. Personally, Gately gives Jeffrey D. like a month at the outside before he's back tipping his hat to parking meters. Except who is Gately to judge who'll end up getting the gift of the program versus who won't, he needs to remember. He tries to feel like Day is teaching him patience and tolerance. It takes great patience and tolerance not to want to punt the soft little guy out into the Commonwealth Avenue ravine and open up his bunk to somebody that really desperately wants it, the gift. Except who is Gately to think he can know who wants it and who doesn't deep down? Gately's arm is behind his head, up against the sofa's other arm. The old D.E.C. viewer is on to something violent and color-enhanced Gately neither sees nor hears. It was part of his gifts as a burglar. He can sort of turn his attention on and off like a light. Even when he was a resident here, he'd have this prescient housebreaker's ability to screen input, to do sensory triage. It was one reason he'd even been able to stick out his nine residential months here with 21 other newly detoxed housebreakers, hoods, whores, fired execs, Avon ladies, subway musicians, beer-bloated construction workers, vagrants, indignant car salesmen, bulimic trauma mamas, bunko artists, mincing pillow biters, North End hard guys, pimply kids with electric nose rings, denial-ridden housewives, and etc. All jonesing and head-gaming and mocus and grieving and basically whacked out and producing non-stopping output 24-7-365. At some point in here, Day's saying, So bring on the lobotomist. Bring him on, I say. Except Gately's own counselor when he was a resident here. Eugenio Martinez, one of the volunteer alumni counselors, a one-eared, former boiler room bunko man, and now a cellular phone retailer, who hooked up with the house under the original founder, guy that didn't even use his first name, and had about ten years clean, Gene M. did. Eugenio lovingly confronted Gately early on about his special burglar's selective attention and about how it could be dangerous because how can you be sure it's you doing the screening and not the spider? Gene called the disease the spider and talked about feeding the spider versus starving the spider and so on and so forth. Eugenio M., had called Gately into the house manager's back office and said, what if Don's screening input turned out to be 
feeding the old spider. And what about an experimental unscreening of input for a while? Gailey had said he'd do his best to try, and had come back out and tried to watch a spot dissum of the Celtics while two resident pillow biters from the Fenway were having this involved conversation about some third fag having to go in and get the skeleton of some kind of fucking rodent removed from inside their butthole. 91. The unscreening experiment had lasted half an hour. This was right before Gately got his 90-day chip, and wasn't exactly wrapped real tight or real tolerant still. And at house this year, there's nothing like the freak show it was when Gately went through. Gately has been completely substance-free for 421 days today. Ms. Charlotte Treat, with a carefully made-up ruined face, is watching the viewer's striped shot cartridge while she needlepoints something. Conversation between her and Jeffrey D. has mercifully petered out. Day is scanning the room for somebody else to engage and piss off so he can prove to himself he doesn't fit in here and stay separated off, isolated inside himself, and maybe get them so pissed off there's a beef and he gets bounced out, Day, and it won't be his fault. You can almost hear his disease chewing away inside his head, feeding. Emil Minty, Randy Lentz, and Bruce Green are also in the room, sprawled in spring-shot chairs, lighting one gasper off the end of the last, their postures, the don't-fuck-with-me slouch of the streets, that here makes their body's texture somehow hard to distinguish from that of the chairs. Neil Gunther is sitting at the long table in the doorless dining room that opens out right off the old DEC fold-out TP's pine stand, whitening under her nails, with a manicure pencil amid the remains of something she's eaten that involved serious syrup. Bert F. Smith is also in there, way down by himself at the table's far end, trying to saw at a waffle with a knife and fork attached to the stumps of his wrists with Velcro bands. A long time ago former DMV driver's license examiner, Bert F. Smith is 45 and looks 70 has almost all-white hair that's waxy and yellow from close-order smoke, and finally got into Ennett House last month after nine months stuck in the Cambridge City Shelter. Bert F. Smith's story is he's making his, like, 50th-odd stab at sobriety in AA. Once the Valley R.C., Bert F.S. has potentially lethal trouble with faith in a loving God, ever since the R.C. Church apparently granted his wife an annulment in, like, B.S. 99, after 15 years of marriage. Then for several years, a rooming house drunk, which on Gately's view is about like one step up from a homeless person type drunk. Bert F.S. got mugged and beaten half to death in Cambridge on Xmas Eve of last year and left there to, like, freeze there, in an alley, in a storm, and ended up losing his hands and feet. Dooney Glenn's been observed telling Bert F.S. things like that there's some new guy coming into the disabled room off Pat's office with Bert F.S., who's without not only hands and feet, but arms and legs and even a head, and who communicates by farting in Morse code. This Sally earned Glenn three days full house restriction and a week's extra chore for what Jeanette Fultz described in the log as exive cruelty. There is a vague intestinal moaning in Gately's right side watching Bert F. Smith smoke a Benton and Hedges by holding it between his stumps, with his elbows out like a guy with pruning shears, is an adventure in fucking pathos as far as Gately's concerned. And Jeffrey Day cracks wise about there but for grace. And forget about what it's like trying to watch Bert F. Smith try and light a match. Gately, who's been on live-in staff here four months now, believes Charlotte Treat's devotion to Needlepoint is suspect. All those needles, in and out of all that thin, sterile white cotton, stretched drum-tight in its round frame. The needle makes a kind of thud and squeak when it goes into the cloth. It's not much like the soundless pop and slide of real cook-and-shoot, but still, she takes such great care. Gately wonders what color he'd call the ceiling if forced to call it a color. It's not white, and it's not gray. The brown-yellow tones are from high-tar gaspers, 
A pole hangs up near the ceiling, even this early in the new sober day. Some of the drunks and track jockeys stay up most of the night, joggling their feet and chain-smoking, even though there's no cartridges or music allowed after, oh, hundred hours. He has that odd house staffer's knack, Gately, already after four months, of seeing everything in both living and dining rooms without really looking. Emil Minty, a hardcore smack addict punk here for reasons nobody can quite yet pin down, is in an old mustard-colored easy chair with his combat boots up on one of the standing ashtrays, which is tilting not quite enough for Gately to tell him to watch out, please. Minty's orange mohawk and the shaved skull around it are starting to grow out brown, which is just not a pleasant sight in the morning at all. The other ashtray on the floor by his chair is full of the ragged little new moons of bitten nails, which has got to mean that the Hester tea that he'd ordered to bed at 0230 was right back down here in the chair, going at her nails again the second Gately left to mop shit at the shelter. When he's up all night, Gately's stomach gets all tight and acidy, from either all the coffee, maybe, or just staying up. Minty's been on the streets since he was like sixteen, Gately can tell. He's got that sooty complexion homeless guys get, where the soot has insinuated itself into the dermal layer and thickened, making Minty look somehow upholstered. And the big-armed driver from Leisure Time Ice, the quiet kid, green, a garbage head, all-substance-type kid, maybe twenty-one, face very slightly smunched in on one side, wears sleeveless khaki shirts, and had lived in a trailer in that apocalyptic Enfield trailer park out near the Alston Spur. Gately likes Green because he seems to have got sense enough to keep his map shut when he's got nothing important to say, which is basically all the time. The tattoo on the kid's right tricep is a spear-pierced heart over the hideous name Mildred Bonk, who, Bruce G. told him, was a ray of living light and a dead ringer for the late lead singer of The Fiends in Human Shape and his dead heart's one love ever, and who took their daughter and left him this summer for some guy that told her he ranched fucking longhorn cows east of Atlantic City, New Jersey. He's got, even by Ennett House standards, major league sleep trouble, Green, and he and Gately play cribbage sometimes in the wee dead hours, a game Gately picked up in jail. Bert F. Smith is now hunched in a meaty coughing fit, his elbows out and his forehead purple. No sign of Hester Thrale, nail-biter, and something Pat calls borderline. Gailey can see everything without moving or moving his head or either eye. Also in here is Randy Lentz, who, Lentz is, a small-time organic coat dealer who wears sport coats rolled up over his parlor-tanned forearms, and is always checking his pulse on the inside of his wrists. It's come out that Lance is of keen interest to both sides of the law, because this past May, he had apparently, all of a sudden, lost all control, and holed up all of a sudden in a Charlestown motel and freebased most of a whole 100 grams. He'd been fronted by a suspiciously trusting Brazilian, and what Lentz didn't know was supposed to have been a DEA sting operation in the South End. Having screwed both sides in what Gately secretly views as a delicious fuck-up, Randy Lentz has, since May, been the most wanted he's probably ever been. He is seedily handsome in the way of pimps and low-level coke dealers, muscular in the MP-ish way that certain guys' muscles look muscular, but can't really lift anything, with complexly gelled hair and the little bird-like head movements of the deeply vain. One forearm's hair has a little hairless patch, which Gately knows well, spells knife owner. And if there's one thing Gately's never been able to stomach, it's a knife owner. Little swaggery guys that always queer a square beef, and come up off the ground with a knife where you have to get cut to take it away from them. Lenz is teaching Gately reserved politeness to people you pretty much want to beat up on sight. It's pretty obvious to everybody except Pat Montesian whose odd gullibility in the presence of human sludge, though, Gately needs to try to remember, had been one of the reasons why he himself had got into Ennett House originally. Obvious that Lentz is here mostly just to hide out. He rarely leaves the house except under compulsion, 
avoids windows, and travels to the nightly required AANA meetings in a disguise that makes him look like Cesar Romero after a terrible accident. And then, he always wants to walk back to the house solo afterward, which is not encouraged. Lance is now seated low in the northeasternmost corner of an old fake velour love seat he's jammed in the northeasternmost corner of the living room. Randy Lentz has a strange compulsive need to be north of everything, and possibly even northeast of everything, and Gately has no clue what it's about, but observes Lentz's position routinely for his own interest and files. Lentz's leg, like Ken or Daddy's leg, never stops joggling. Day claims it joggles even worse in sleep. Another gurgle and abdominal chug from Don G. lying there. Charlotte Treat has violently red hair, as in hair the color of, like, a red crayon. The reason she doesn't have to work an outside menial job is she's got some strain of the virus, or, like, HIV. Former prostitute, reformed. Why do prostitutes, when they get straight, always try and get so prim? It's like long-repressed librarian ambitions come flooding out. Charlotte T. has a cut-rate whore's hard, half-pretty face. Her eyes lassoed with shadow around all four lids. Her also with a case of dermal layers sooty complexion. The riveting thing about Treat is how her cheeks are deeply pitted in these deep trenches that she packs with foundation and tries to cover over with blush, which along with the hair gives her the look of a mean clown. The ghastly wounds in her cheeks... Look for all the world like somebody got at her with a wood-burning kit at some point in her career path. Gately would rather not know. Don Gately is almost twenty-nine, and sober, and just huge, lying there gurgling and inert with a fluttery-eyed smile. One shoulder blade and buttock pooch out over the side of a sofa that sags like a hammock. Gately looks less built than poured, the smooth immovability of an Easter Island statue. It would be nice if intimidating size wasn't one of the major factors in a male alumni getting offered the male live-in staff job here, but there you go. Don G. has a massive square head, made squarer looking by the prince's valiantish haircut he tries to maintain himself in the mirror to save money. Room and board aside, plus the opportunity for service, he makes very little as an Ennett House staffer, and is paying off restitution schedules in three different district courts. He has the fluttery, white-eyed smile now of someone who's holding himself just over the level of doze. Pat Montesian is due in at 0900, and Don G. can't go to bed until she arrives because the house manager has driven Jennifer Belbin to a court appearance downtown, and he's the only staffer here. Fultz, the female live-in staffer, is at a Narcotics Anonymous convention in Hartford for the long Interdependence Day weekend. Gately personally is not hot on N.A., so many relapses and unhumble returns, so many war stories told with non-disguised bullshit pride, so little emphasis on service or serious message, all these people in leather and metal preening. Rooms full of randy lenses, all hugging each other, pretending they don't miss the substance. Rampant, newcomer fucking. There's a difference between abstinence versus recovery. Gately knows. Except, of course, who's Gately to judge what works for who? He just knows what seems like it works for him today. A.A.'s tough Enfield Brighton love. The White Flag Group. Old guys with suspended bellies and white crew cuts and geologic amounts of sober time. The crocodiles that'll take your big square head off if they sense you're getting complacent or chasing tail or forgetting that your life still hangs in the balance every fucking day. White flag newcomers so crazed and sick they can't sit and have to pace at the meeting's rear like Gately when he first came. Retired old kindergarten teachers and Polyresin slacks and a pince-nez who bake cookies for the weekly meeting 
and relate from behind the podium how they used to blow bartenders at closing for just two more fingers in a paper cup to take home against the morning's needled light. Gately, albeit an oral narcotics man from way back, has committed himself to AA. He drank his fair share, too, he figures, after all. Executive Director Pat Montesian is due in at 0900 and has application interviews with three people, two female and one male, who better be showing up soon, and Gately will answer the door when they don't know enough to just come in and say welcome and get them a cup of coffee if he judges them able to hold it. He'll get them aside and tip them off to be sure to pet Pat Montesian's dogs during the interview. They'll be sprawled all over the front office, sides heaving, writhing and biting at themselves. He'll tell them it's a proved fact that if Pat's dogs like you, you're in. Pat Montesian has directed Gately to tell appliers this, and then if the appliers do actually pet the dogs, two hideous white golden retrievers with superated scabs and skin afflictions, plus one has grand mal epilepsy, It'll betray a level of desperate willingness that Pat says is just about all she goes by, deciding. A nameless cat oozes by on the broad windowsill above the back of the fabric couch. Animals here come and go. Alumni adopt them, or they just disappear. Their fleas tend to remain. Gately's intestines moan. Boston's dawn coming back on the green line this morning was chemically pink. Trails of industrial exhaust blowing due north. The nail parings in the ashtray on the floor are, he realizes now, too big to be from fingernails. These bitten arcs are broad and thick and a deep autumnal yellow. He swallows hard. He tells Jeffrey Day how, even if they are just clichés, clichés are A, soothing, and B, remind you of common sense, and C, license the universal ascent that drowns out silence, and four, silence is deadly, pure spider food, if you've got the disease. Gene M. says you can spell the disease D-I-S-E-A-S-E, which sums the basic situation up nicely. Pat has a meeting at the Division of Substance Abuse Services and Government Center at noon she needs to be reminded about. She can't read her own handwriting, which the stroke affected her handwriting. Gately envisions going around having to find out who's biting their fucking toenails in the living room and putting the disgusting toenail bits in the ashtray at, like, 0500. Plus, house regs prohibit bare feet any place downstairs. There's a pale brown water stain on the ceiling, over day and treat, the almost exact shape of Florida. Randy Lentz has issues with Jeffrey Day because Day is glib and a teacher at a scholarly journal's helm. This threatens the self-concept of a Randy Lentz that thinks of himself as a kind of hiply, sexy artist intellectual. Small-time dealers never conceptualize themselves as just small-time dealers, kind of like whores never do. For occupation, on his intake form, Lentz had put freelance scriptwriter and he makes a show of that he reads. For the first week here in July, he'd held the books upside down in the northeast corner of whatever room. He had a gigantic medical dictionary. He'd hauled down and smoke and read until Annie Parrott, the assistant manager, had to tell him not to bring it down anymore because it was fucking with Morris Hanley's mind. At which juncture he quit reading and started talking, making everybody nostalgic for when he just sat there and read. Jeffrey D. has issues with Randy L. also, you can tell. There's a certain way they don't quite look at each other. And so now, of course, they're mashed together in the three-man together, since three guys in one night missed curfew and came in without one normal-sized pupil between them and refused urines and got bounced on the spot, and so Day gets moved up in his first week from the five-man room to the three-man. Seniority comes quick around here. Past Minty, down at the dining room table's end, Bert F. Smith's still coughing, still hunched over, his face a dusky purple. And Nell G. is behind him, pounding him on the back so it keeps sending him forward over his ashtray. And he's waving one stump vaguely over his shoulder 
to try to signal her to quit. Lens and Day, my beef, may be brewing. Day'll try to goad Lens into a beef that'll be public enough so he doesn't get hurt but does get bounced and then he can leave treatment and go back to Chianti and Lunes and getting assaulted by sidewalks and make out like the relapse is Ennett House's fault and never have to confront himself or his disease. To Gately, Day is like a wide-open interactive textbook on the disease. One of Gately's jobs is to keep an eye on what's possibly brewing among residents and let Pat or the manager know and try to smooth things down in advance if possible. The ceiling's color could be called done, if forced. Someone has farted. No one knows just who. But this isn't like a normal adult place where everybody coolly pretends a fart didn't happen. Here, everybody has to make their little comment. Time is passing. And it house reeks of passing time. It is the humidity of early sobriety, hanging and palpable. You can hear ticking in clockless rooms here. Gately changes the angle of one sneaker, puts the other arm behind his head. His head has real weight and pressure. Randy Lentz's obsessive compulsions include the need to be north, a fear of discs, a tendency to constantly take his own pulse, a fear of all forms of timepieces, and a need to always know the time with great precision. Day, man, you got the time maybe um, uh, real quick? Lens. For the third time in half an hour. Patience, tolerance, compassion, self-discipline, restraint. Gately remembers his first six months here straight. He'd felt the sharp edge of every second that went by, and the freak show dreams, nightmares beyond the worst DTs you'd ever heard about. A reason for a night shifter staffer in the front office is so somebody's there for the residents to talk at when, not if, when, when the freak show dreams ratchet them out of bed at like o oh, three hundred. Nightmares about relapsing and getting high. Not getting high, but having everybody think you're high. Getting high with your alcoholic mom and then killing her with a baseball bat. Whipping the old unit out for a spot urine and starting up and flames coming shooting out. Getting high and bursting into flames. Having a water spout shaped like an enormous tall one suck you up inside. A vehicle explodes in an enhanced bloom of sooty flame on the DEC viewer, its hood up like an old pop tab. Day's making a broad gesture out of checking his watch. Right around 0830, fella. Randy L.'s fine nostrils flare and whiten. He stares straight ahead, eyes narrowed, fingers on his wrist. Day purses his lips, leg joggling. Gately hangs his head over the arm of the sofa and regards Lens, upside down. That look on your map there mean anything, Randy? Are you, like, communicating something with that look? Does anybody maybe know <laughs> the time a little more exactly is what I'm wondering, Don, <laughs> since Day doesn't? Gately checks his own cheap digital, head still hung over the sofa's arm. I got O oh, eight thirty two fourteen fifteen. Sixteen, Randy. Thanks a lot, DG man. So, and now Day has that same flared look for Lentz. So we've been over this, friend. Amigo. Sport. You do this all the time with me. Again, I'll say it. I don't have a digital watch. This is a fine old antique watch. It points. A memento of far better days. <laughs> it's not a digital watch. It's not a cesium-based atomic clock. They points with hands. See, Sparrow Agno here has two little arms. They point, they suggest. It's not a sodding stopwatch for life. Lentz, get a watch, am I right? Why don't you just get a watch, Lentz? Three people I happen to know of for a fact have offered to get you a watch, and you can pay them back whenever you feel comfortable about poking your nose out and investigating the work world. Get a watch. Obtain a watch. A fine, digital, incredibly wide watch, about five times the width of your wrist, so you have to hold it like a falconer. And it treats time like pie. Easy does it, Charlotte Treat half-sings, 
not looking up from her needle and frame. Day looks around at her. I don't believe I was speaking to you in any way, shape, or form. Lenz stares at him. If you're trying to fuck with me, brother... <laughs> he shakes his fine, shiny head. Big mistake. Oh, I'm all a-tremble. I can barely hold my arm steady to read my watch. Big, 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 real big mistake. Peace on Earth. Goodwill toward men, says Gately. Back on his back, smiling at the dumb, cracked ceiling. He's the one who'd farted. They returned from Long Island bearing their shields rather than upon them, as they say. John Wayne and Hal and Condenza lost only five total games between them in singles. The A-doubles had resembled a spatter painting, and the B-teams, especially the distaffs, had surpassed themselves. The whole PWTA staff and squad had had to sing a really silly song. Coyle and Trolch didn't win, and Teddy Shocked had, incredibly, lost to his squat, spin doctory opponent in three sets, despite the kid's debilitating nerves at crucial junctures. The fact that Shocked wasn't all that upset got remarked on by staff. Shocked and a conspicuously energized Jim Trolch rallied for the big win in 18A number two dubs, though. Trolch's disconnected microphone mysteriously disappeared from his gear bag during post-double showers, to the rejoicing of all. Pemulus's storky, intense, two hands off both sides opponent had gotten weirdly lethargic and then disoriented in the second set after Pemulus had lost the first in a tiebreak. After the kid had delayed play for several minutes, claiming the tennis balls were too pretty to hit, PWTA trainers had conducted him gently from the court and the Peemster got VD, which is Junior Circuit Argot for a victory by default. The fact that Pemulus hadn't walked around with his chest out recounting the win for any ETA females got remarked on only by Hal and T. Axford. Shocked was in too much knee pain to remark on much of anything, and Stitt had ETA's Barry Loach inject the big purple knee with something that made Shocked's eyes roll up in his head. Then, during the post-meet mixer and dance, Pemulus's defaulted opponent ate from the hors d'oeuvres table without using utensils, or at one point even hands, did a disco number when there wasn't any music going, and was finally heard telling the Port Washington headmaster's wife that he'd always wanted to do her from behind. Pemulus spent a lot of time whistling and staring innocently up at the prefab ceiling. The buzz for all the 18's squads was warm, and there were little nozzles of light over your seat that you could either have on to do homework or shut off and sleep. Trolch, left eye ominously nystagmic, pretended to recap the day's match highlights for a subscription audience, speaking earnestly into his fist. The C-team's Stockhausen was pretending to sing opera. Hal and tall Paul Shaw were each reading an SAT prep guide. A good quarter of the bus was yellow highlighting copies of E.A. Abbott's inescapable at E.T.A. book Flatland for either Flotman or Chawath or Thorpe. An elongated darkness with assorted shapes melted by, plus long gauntlets near exits of tall interstatish lamps laying down cones of dirty-looking sodium light. The ghastly sodium lamplight made Mario and Condenza happy to be in his little cone of white inside light. Mario sat next to K.D. Coyle, who was kind of mentally slow, especially after a hard loss, and they played rock-paper-scissors for two hundred clicks or more, not saying anything, engrossed in trying to locate patterns in each other's rhythms of choices of shapes, which they both decided there weren't any. Two or three upperclassmen in Levy, Richardson, O'Brien, Chawoff's disciplinary lit were slumped over Goncharov's Oblomov, looking very unhappy indeed. Charles Tavis sat way in the back with John Wayne and beamed and spoke nonstop in hushed tones to Wayne as the Canadian stared out the window. DeLint was with the Sixteens one bus back. He'd been ragging Stice's and Cornspan's asses since their doubles, which it looked like they practically gave away. The bus was Stittless. Stitt always found a private, mysterious way back then appeared at dawn drills with DeLint 
and elaborate workups of everything that had gone wrong the day before. He was particularly shrill and insistent and negative after they'd won something. Shocked had listed to port and didn't respond when hands were waved in front of his face, and Axford and Struck started kibitzing Barry Loach about their knees were feeling punk as well. The luggage rack over everyone's heads bristled with grips and coverless strings, and liniment and tincture of benzoin had been handed out and liberally applied, so the warm air became complexly spiced. Everybody was tired, in a good way. The homeward ride's camaraderie was marred only by the fact that someone near the back of the bus started the passing around of a gothic fonted leaflet offering the kingdom of prehistoric England to the man who could pull Keith Freer out of Bernadette Longley. Freer had been discovered by prorector Mary Esther Thode, more or less exing poor Bernadette Longley under an Adidas blanket in the very back seat on the bus trip to the East Coast Clays in Providence in September. And it had been a nasty scene because there were some basic academy license rules that it was just unacceptable to flout under the nose of staff. Keith Freer was deeply asleep when the leaflet was getting passed around, but Bernadette Longley wasn't, and when the leaflet hit the front half where all the females now had to sit since September, she buried her face in her hands and flushed even on the back of her pretty neck, and her doubles partner came all the way back to where Jim Struck and Michael Pemulus were sitting and told them in no uncertain terms that somebody on this bus was so immature it was really sad. 92. Charles Tavis was irrepressible. He did a Pierre Trudeau impression no one except the driver was old enough to laugh at. And the whole mammoth traveling squad, three buses worth, got to stop and have the mega breakfast at Denny's, over next to Empire Waste at like 0030, when they got in. Hal's eldest brother, Oren Incandenza, got out of competitive tennis when Hal was nine and Mario nearly eleven. This was during the period of great pre-experialist upheaval and the emergence of the fringe CUSP of Johnny Gentle, famous crooner, and the tumescence of ONAN-ism. At late seventeen, Oren was ranked in the low seventies nationally. He was a senior. He was at that Awful age for a low 70s player where age 18 and the terminus of a junior career are looming. And either one, you're going to surrender your dreams of the show and go to college and play college tennis. Or two, you're going to get your full spectrum of gram negative and cholera and amoebic dysentery shots and try to eke out some kind of sad diasporic existence on a Eurasian satellite pro tour and try to hop those last few competitive plateaus up to show caliber as an adult. Or three, you don't know what you're going to do. And it's often an awful time. 93. ETA tries to dilute the awfulness a little by letting eight or nine postgraduates stay on for two years and serve in Delint's platoon of pro-rectors in exchange for room and board and travel expenses to small, sad satellite tourneys. 94. And Oren's being directly related to ETA administration obviously gave him kind of a lock on a pro-rector appointment, if he wanted it. But a pro-rector's job was only for maybe, at most, a few years, and was regarded as sad and purgatorial. And then, of course, what then? What are you going to do after that, etc.? Oren's decision to attend college pleased his parents a great deal, Though Mrs. Avril and Condenza, especially, had gone out of her way to make it clear that whatever Oren decided to do would please them because they stood squarely behind and in full support of him, Oren, and any decision his very best thinking yielded. But they were still in favor of college, privately, you could tell. Oren was clearly not ever going to be a professional caliber adult tennis player. His competitive peak had come at 13, when he'd gotten to the 14 and under quarterfinals of the National Clays in Indianapolis, Indiana, and in the quarters had taken the set off the second seed, but starting soon after that he'd suffered athletically from the same delayed puberty that had compromised his father when himself had been a junior player, and having boys he'd cleaned the clocks of at twelve and thirteen become now seemingly overnight mannish and deep-chested and hairy-legged and starting now to clean Oren's own clock at fourteen and fifteen, 
This had sucked some kind of competitive afflatus out of him, broken his tennis spirit, Oren, and his USTA ranking had nosedived through three years until it leveled off somewhere in the low 70s, which meant that by age 15, he wasn't even qualifying for the major event's main 64-man draw. When ETA opened, his ranking among boys' 18s hovered around 10, and he was relegated to a middle spot on the Academy's B-Squad, a mediocrity that sort of becalmed his verve even further. His style was essentially that of a baseliner, a counterpuncher, but without the return of serve or passing shots you need to stand much of a chance against a quality netman. The ETA rap on Oren was that he lobbed well, but too often. He did have a phenomenal lob. He could hug the curve of the dome of the lung and three times out of four nail a large-sized coin placed on the opposite baseline. He and Marlon Bain and two or three other marginal counterpunching boys at ETA all had phenomenal lobs, honed through spare PM devoted more and more to Eschaton, which by the most plausible account a Croatian refugee transfer had brought up from the Palmer Academy to Tampa. Orn was Eschaton's first game master at ETA, where in the first Eschaton generations it was mostly marginal and deaflatized upperclassmen who played. College was the comparatively obvious choice then for Oren, as the time of decision drew nigh. Oblique family pressures aside, as a low-ranked player at ETA, he'd had stiffer academic demands than did those for whom the real show had seemed like a viable goal. And the eschatonology helped a great deal with the math-slash-computer stuff ETA tended to be a bit weak in, both himself and Stitt being at that point, pretty anti-quantitative. His grades were solid. His board scores weren't going to embarrass anybody. Orn was basically academically sound, especially for a somebody with a top-level competitive sport on his secondary transcript. And you have to understand that mediocrity is relative in a sport like junior tennis. A national ranking of 74 in boys 18 and under singles, while mediocre by the standards of aspiring pros, it's enough to make most college coaches' chins shiny. Oren got a couple Pac-10 offers, Big Ten offers. University of New Mexico actually hired a mariachi band that established itself under his dorm room's window six nights running until Mrs. Incandenza got himself to authorize FDV hard to electrify the fences. Ohio State flew him out to Columbus for such a weekend of prospective orientation that when Oren got back, he had to stay in bed for three days, drinking Alka-Seltzer with an ice pack on his groin. Caltech offered him an ROTC waiver and AP standing in their elite strategic studies program after Decade Magazine had run a short interest piece on Oren and the Croat and Eschaton's applied use of C colon slash pink sub 2. 95. Oren shows B.U. Boston University. Not a tennis power. Not in Caltech's league, academically. Not the sort of place that hires bands or flies you out for Roman orgies of inducement. And only just about three clicks down the hill from Commonwealth Avenue from ETA, west of the Bay, around the intersection of Commonwealth and Beacon, Boston. It was kind of a joint Oren Incandenza, Avril Incandenza decision. Oren's moms privately thought it was important for Oren to be away from home, psychologically speaking, but still to be able to come home whenever he wished. She put everything to Oren in terms of worrying that her concern over what would be best for him psychologically might prompt her to overstep her maternal bounds and speak out of turn or give intrusive advice. According to all her lists and advantage-disadvantage charts, B.U., was, from every angle, far and away O's best choice. But to keep ever from overstepping or lobbying intrusively, the moms actually, for six weeks, would flee any room Oren entered. Both hands clapped over her mouth. Oren had this way his face would get when she'd beg him not to let her influence his choice. It was during this period that Oren had characterized the moms to Hal as a kind of contortionist with other people's bodies, 
which Hal's never been able to forget. Himself, from his own experience, probably thought it'd be better for Orrin to get the hell out of Dodge altogether, do something Midwest or pack, but he kept his own counsel. He never had to struggle not to overstep. He probably figured Orrin was a big boy. This was four years and thirty-some released entertainments before himself put his head in a microwave oven, fatally. Then it turned out Avril's adoptive-slash-half-brother, Charles Tavis, who at this time was back chairing ASA at Throppinghamshire, turned out to be old minor sport athletic administration network friends with Boston University's varsity tennis coach. 96. Tavis flew down special on Air Canada to set up a meeting between the four of them, Avril and Son and Tavis and the BU tennis coach. The BU tennis coach was a septuagenaric Ivy League guy, one of those emptily, craggily, handsome old patrician men whose profile looks like it ought to be on a coin, who liked his lads to wear all white and actually, literally, vault the net, win or lose, after matches. Boston University had only had a couple nationally ranked players like ever, and that had been in the A.D. 1960s, way before this fashion-conscious guy's tenure. And when the coach saw Oren play, he about fell over sideways. Recall how mediocrity is contextual. Boston University's players all hailed, literally, from New England country clubs, and wore ironed shorts and those faggy white tennis sweaters, with that blood-colored stripe across the chest, and talked without moving their jaw, and played the sort of stiff and patrician serve and volley game you play, if you've had lots of summer lessons and club round robins, but had never ever had to get out there and kill or die, psychically. Orrin wore cut-off jeans and deck sneakers without socks, and yawned compulsively as he beat Boston University's immaculately groomed number one singles man, two and zero, hitting something like 40 offensive lobs for winners. Then at the four-way meeting Tavis arranged, the old BU coach showed up in L.L. Bean chinos and a Lacoste polo shirt and got a look at the size of Oren's left arm, and then at Oren's mom's in a tight black skirt and levantine jacket with coal around her eyes and a moosed tower of hair and about fell back over sideways the other way. She had this effect on older men somehow. Orrin was in a position to dictate terms limited only by the parameters of BU's own sports budget marginality. 97. Orrin signed a letter of intent accepting a full ride at BU, plus books, and a Hitachi laptop with software and off-campus housing and living expenses, and a lucrative work-study job where his job was to turn on the sprinklers every morning at the BU football terrier's historic Nickerson Field, sprinklers that were already on automatic timers. The sprinkler job was BU's tennis team's one plum, recruitment-wise. Charles Tavis, who at Avril's urging, had failed to cash in his Canadian return ticket and stayed on as assistant headmaster to assist Oren's father's oversight of the academy. 98. In a progressively more and more total capacity, as both in and external travels took J.O. Incandenza away from Enfield more and more often, said three and a half years later that he never really expected a thank you from Oren anyway for liaisoning with the BU tennis apparatus, that he wasn't in this for the thank yous, that a person who did a service for somebody's gratitude was more like a 2D cutout image of a person than a bona fide person. At least that's what he thought, he said. He said, what did Avril and Hal and Mario think? Was he a genuine 3D person? Was he perhaps just rationalizing away some legitimate hurt? Did Oren maybe resent him for seeming to move in just as he, Oren, moved out? Though surely not for Tavis's assuming more and more total control of the ETA helm, as J. Owen Condenza spent increasingly long hiatai, either off with Mario on shoots or editing in his room off the tunnel, or in alcoholic, rehabilitative facilities. Thirteen of them over those final three years. Tavis has the Blue Cross statements right here. And even more surely not for the final fellow to say anyone with any kind of denial-free sensitivity could have predicted for the past three and a half years. But, C.T. opined, 
on the 4th of July, YDPAH, after Oren, who now had plenty of free summer time, declined his fifth straight invitation back to Enfield and his family's annual barbecue and Wimbledon finals interlay spontaneous dissemination watching. Oren might just be harboring a resentment over C.T., moving into the headmaster's office and changing the doors, Teo Chidere Pusant, before himself's microwaved head had even cooled, even if it was to take over a headmaster's job that had been positively keening to have someone sedulous and brisk take over. In Condenza himself, having eliminated his own map on the 1st of April of the year of the trial-sized dove bar, just as spring letters of intent were due from seniors who'd decided to slouch off to college tennis, just as invitations for the European Dirt Circuit Invitationals were pouring in all over lateral Alice Moore's paraboloid desk, just as ETA's tax-exempt status was coming up for review before the MDR exemption panel. 99. Just as the school was trying to readjust to new ONANTA accreditation procedures after years of USTA accreditation procedures. Just as litigations with Enfield Marine Public Health Hospital over alleged damage from ETA's initial hilltop flattening and with Empire Waste Displacement over the flight paths of concavity-bound displacement vehicles were reaching the appellate stage. Just as applications and fellowships for the fall term were in the final stages of review and response. Well, someone had had to come in and fill the void, and that person was going to have to be someone who could achieve total worry without becoming paralyzed by the worry or by the absence of minimal thank yous for inglorious duties discharged in the stead of a person whose replacement was naturally, naturally going to come in for some resentment, Tavis felt. Since, since you can't get mad at a dying man, much less at a dead man, who better to assume the stress of filling in as anger object than that dead man's thankless, inglorious, sedulous, untiring, 3D bureaucratic assistant and replacement, whose own upstairs room was right next to the headmaster's house's master bedroom, and who might, by some grieving parties, be viewed as some kind of interloping usurper. Tavis had been ready for all this stress and more, he told the assembled academy in preparatory remarks before last year's fall term convocation, speaking through amplification from the red and gray bunting draped crow's nest of Gerhard Stitt's transom down into the rows of folding chairs arranged all along the base and sidelines of ETA courts six through nine. He not only fully accepted the stress and resentment, he said he had worked hard and would continue in his dull, quiet, unromantic fashion to work hard to remain open to it, to this resentment and sense of loss and irreplaceability, even after four years, to let everyone who needed to get it out, get it out. The anger and resentment and possible contempt for their own psychological health, since Tavis acknowledged publicly that there was more than enough on every ETA's plate to begin with, as it was. The convocation assembly was outside, on the center courts that in winter are sheltered by the lung. It was the 31st of August in the year of dairy products from the American heartland, hot and muggy. Upperclassmen who'd heard these same basic remarks for the past four years made little razor to jugular and hangman's noose over imaginary crossbeam motions, listening. The sky overhead was glassy blue between clots and strings of clouds moving swiftly north. On courts 30 to 32, the applied music chorus guys kept up a background of Tenabri Facti Sunt, Sotto Voce. Everybody had had on the black armbands, everybody still wore for functions and assemblies, to keep from forgetting. And the cotton U.S. and crisp nylon O.N.A.N. flags flapped and clanked halfway down the driveway's poles in remembrance. The Sunstrand Plaza still, as of that fall, hadn't yet found a way to muffle its East Newton ATH SCME fans. And Tavis's voice, which even with the police bullhorn tended to sound distant and receding anyway, wove in and out of the sound of the fans and the whomp of the EWD catapults and locusts' electric screams 
and the exhaust-rich hot rush of the summer wind up off Commonwealth Avenue, and the car horns, and the green lines trundle and clang, and the clank of the flags, poles, and wires, and everybody but the staff and littlest kids up front missed most of Tavis's explanation that Salic Law had nothing to do with the fact that there was simply no way the late headmaster's beloved spouse and ETA dean of academic affairs and of females, Mrs. Avril Incondenza, could have become headmaster. How would headmistress have sounded? And she had the females and female prorectors and Hardy's custodians to oversee, and curricula and assignments and schedules, and complex new ONANTA accreditation to finalize the Kafkan application for, plus daily headmaster's house sterilization and personal ablution rituals, and the constant battle against anthracnos and dry climate blight in the dining room's green babies, plus, of course, ETA teaching duties on top of that, with the addition of untold sleepless nights with the militant grammarians of Massachusetts, the academic pack that watchdogged media syntax and invited florid, fish-lipped guys from the French Academy to come speak with trilled R's on prescriptive preservation, and held marathon multi-readings of, for example, Orwell's Politics and the English Language, and whose Avril-chaired Tactical Phalanx, MGM's, was then unsuccessfully, it turned out, court-fighting the new Gentle Administration's Title II G public-funded library phase-out fat-trimming initiative. Besides, of course, being practically laid out flat with grief and having to do all the emotional processing work attendant on working through that kind of personal trauma, on top of all of which assuming the administrative tiller of ETA itself would have been simply an insupportable burden, she's thanked CT effusively on more than one public occasion for leaving the plush sinecure of Throppinghamshire and coming down to undertake the stress-ridden tasks, not only a bureaucratic administration, and ensuring as smooth a transition as possible, but of being there for the Incandenza family itself, with or without thank yous, and for helping support not only Oren's career and institutional decision processes, but also for being there supportively for all involved when Oren made his seminal choice not to go ahead and play competitive college tennis after all, at Boston University. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.